thầy đưa rồi nhé không không Yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, welcome you all for uh, this conference on relativistic astrophysics. Uh, because of our constraints in uh, our accommodations, so it's not an open uh, conference, it's an invited conference, because we know what our limitations are. So, and uh, yesterday it was a hectic day for about 15 participants who got stuck in uh, in Delhi because their flights were cancelled and they made their way through some through taxi, some through uh, this train, this uh, Sambakranti train, which uh, brought uh, Goku <laughs> here at around 1.30 or 2.30, 2.30, okay, at night. And it's great that after reaching here at 2.30, he's up and he was the first one to enter the auditorium. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, all of you. So I would invite uh, our director, who is remote, to uh, say a few words and, uh, and uh, start the conference. Thank you, Indranil. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, yeah, yes. can you confirm in the okay? Yes, okay yes, thank yes. you. Yeah, uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, welcome to Aries uh, Nainital. Uh, at the onset, I must uh, apologize uh, for not being uh, able to be uh, physically there. I would have loved to, you know, participate uh, in this meeting and also meet uh, all of you. Uh, this is a, a very good uh, opportunity uh, for Aries also. Uh, you know, these days, uh, research is done in, uh, you know, in as a team uh, work, and it's very important to uh, have uh, active collaboration. 
and uh, no better time than you know uh, celebrating also professor amul rai chudri's uh, contribution into the field um i hope you know uh, naranda is in the audience and uh, i will try to uh, you know attend uh, one or two lectures uh, uh, particularly uh, you know those lectures of uh, this nature um yeah again you know looking forward for your uh, presence at aries and we have a very small group of uh, you know uh, relativistic astrophysicists uh, in aries uh, but we have good uh, active students now uh, and postdocs so it will be very beneficial uh, for for uh, them as well so please do interact uh, with the uh, students and uh, younger colleagues at uh, at aries um, I, i'm really uh, thankful to all of you for coming and taking uh, all the efforts i already see that you have uh, faced some challenges to reach here but uh, i'm sure uh, you know once you are there uh, next 3 days uh, will be exciting uh, not only in terms of science but the nature as well it's a beautiful place uh, please do enjoy uh, you know your stay again my apologies for not being here uh, because of some uh, unavoidable circumstances I'm now uh, heading isro headquarters but i have another commitment uh, tomorrow uh, we show in rangashankara those who know me uh, this is again a team work i couldn't say no to my team members because the show was suddenly uh, you know scheduled um, so please do enjoy uh, aries uh, and the workshop and uh, you, you know uh, uh, please continue interacting with our younger colleagues uh, particularly uh, it will be very helpful for them to uh, going forward and thank you again for coming uh, all the best uh, for the conference as well uh, thank you by uh, indranil uh, it's uh, now ball in your court uh so uh, since the director is not here so i would ask one of our senior uh, scientists head of the astronomy division to say one or two words and then we'll start our proceedings yeah and on uh, behalf of uh, my astronomy division at aries i would like to welcome all the participants and uh, particularly to this uh, beautiful place uh, nanital and uh, <clears throat> so this is a very small group uh, i mean uh, we are having about 18 uh, faculties in astronomy division and uh, uh, there is a small and small uh, uh, unit on theoretical astrophysics led by indrani and uh, i think there are students uh, uh, their activities as uh, so they uh, uh, complement the observational astronomy work which we do uh, here we have uh, uh, facilities at optical wave bands so i think this is uh, this is a very good uh, uh, platform where Uh, both uh, theoretical and observational aspects uh, <coughs> uh, are there, and this will uh, benefit uh, to the students and uh, other programs as well. So I welcome you. Okay, so we will formally start uh, now. So I invite uh, Professor Antoboto Dar to uh, chair this session. Good morning, all. so uh, this session we have all together uh, i guess nine uh, talks uh, duration is some talks are 30 minutes some are 20 minutes some are 15 so uh, 20 minutes talks will be uh, sorry 30 minutes talks will be 25 minutes talk and 5 minutes discussion and 20 minutes talk will be 17 minutes talk and 3 minutes discussion and 15 minutes will be for 12 minutes presentation and 3 minutes discussion so i will give you Uh, maybe a few minutes before the schedule time. So the first speaker is uh, Shamir Shamir Mandal from IIS Trivandrum. He will speak about accretion flows around black holes unveiling the cosmic uh, powerhouse. So Shamir. <clears throat> Hello, am I audible? Ah, okay. 
Uh, good morning. <clears throat> I thank the uh, organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about activation physics around Blackwood. So my talk will be a general one. I'll try to avoid uh, technical <coughs> stuff. For the end, there will be uh, observational related stuff. So uh, in general, I'm going to start with uh, this one. Yeah. An uh, overview of uh, acquisition process in general. So acquisition is something which is uh, is a very general phenomena. Is there everywhere in the universe? Essentially, it talks about accumulating matter, which allows things to grow. It happens across various systems in astrophysics. For example, if we yeah, if we look at this particular system, this is. Uh, young stellar object, it's actually a protostellar jet. And we see uh, this is an actually, I mean, uh, observational image using alpha millimeter wave. So we see the dusty torus, which is essentially the accretion torus here, and we see beautiful molecular jet. And not only that, this observation is so precise, you see the rotation as well as the knot of the jet. They are also rotating. Uh, so from protostellar jet, if we, for example, look at the other extreme, we have uh, agents where we do see these beautiful jets, and always jets are originated because of accretion. Uh, this is another example using HST where you see um, optical lines, and there's a clear uh, uh, Doppler shifted line, and from there, people have estimated the mass of the central object and other things. And of course, here we cannot have any image, extra binary systems. So this is an artistic impression where you see essentially a binary companion and it's accreting material. Uh, the, the, the compact object here at the center is accreting material and it forms a disk and as well as it, it will form a jet also. So I'll start with uh, some motivation. So there are a few open questions. There are plenty of such open questions. So these are essentially some of them over the last 30 years or 40 years, partially we could able to address. There are still uh, uh, open questions so which are yet to address. So these are the sort of uh, motivation towards the study around accretion around compact objects. When you say black hole, essentially it can ideally can be above three solar mass. So I put five solar mass just to be in the depth side. Okay, so it can be five solar mass or more or it can go super <coughs> somewhere around 10 to the power 10. Uh, spin, of course, is the, uh, the dimension of the spin parameter between 0 and 1. And the luminosity uh, typically is written in terms of some radiative efficiency factor. Uh, literature, people usually quote somewhere like 10%, but though this is a quantity which depends on the spin of the black hole. So, with this uh, uh, motivation, let me proceed. Now, if we look at the historical note, the first paper wrote on the topic is essentially by Weil and Wittenton. And they are trying to essentially understand that if through interstellar medium stars are moving, so how accretion will take place. But those solutions are not really a realistic solution because they didn't need to pressure. So the first paper, which actually takes care of the proper accretion solution in spherical uh, flow, and that is by Herman Bond in 1952. Uh, so this is a spherical flow, and your typical solution looks like this. So you, though this is a solution purely for a spherical accretion around the star, it doesn't really represent a black hole. But nevertheless, so these two branches, for example, represents your accretion. So accretion on the star is essentially this particular solution. And parallel, you have the wind solution, which Parker's use and essentially tries to explain the solar wind uh, dynamics and other thing using the wind solution. So in one hand, you have wind solution, other is an accretion solution. And around that time, of course, uh, uh, this is one observation where, I mean, uh, proud to be an Indian. So uh, basically, his first paper, which identifies the signals is essentially two radio low. And regarding <coughs> compact object, I believe uh, this is a sort of a observational breakthrough that Signus X1 is being discovered, the first black hole candidate. And the 1963, this particular quasars were discovered, and 
particularly the difficulty was locating the position of the quasar. And we would be able to do that using um, occultation uh, by moon. And immediately people identify the position, optical location of the source, and we would be able to estimate the typical luminosity comes around 47 arcs per second. So then uh, Solpeter, Linden, uh, Bale, and other people proposed that it may be a bondy accretion around uh, that time it was not like black hole, rather it's a called compact object or collapser. And the word black hole actually coined by John Wheeler in 1967. So they proposed that it can be bondy accretion or spherical accretion around uh, such kind of supermassive black hole. But the problem with the bondy flow is since this is a uh, purely spherical flow, so the radial velocity is too high. And therefore, the infall time is very, very, is very fast. And matter really doesn't have time to radiate energy. So therefore, this radiatively very... Okay, inefficient. So therefore, it actually cannot explain the observed luminosity. <coughs> and then, of course, the, the possible, the most, post, I mean, famous, Paper written on accretion in astrophysics is basically comes the standard accretion is Sakurian and Sunia. Though before Sakurian and Sunia, particularly Linden Bell, Pring Bell, Martin Reeves, they have actually contributed uh, developing the subject. But the biggest problem was viscosity. How to address that quantity? Because without the viscosity prescription, the structure equations are not close, and therefore you actually cannot define a solution. So Sakuri and Sunayev came with a beautiful prescription that forget about the origin of viscosity, whether <coughs> it's magnetic, whether it's turbulent, I don't care. What I can do is I can say that, okay, that viscous stress and is essentially thin disk. So therefore, only the R5 component exists. And, and therefore, I basically scale the viscous stress by a parameter for alpha and that essentially close the structure equation. Now, the beauty of this particular solution is it's purely analytical. So that you understand every bits of the, the, the structure of the disk and everything. And angular distrib momentum distribution is purely Keplerian through the, uh, the, the disk. But the problem is it, it cannot address in arrays because again, it's a Newtonian solution. And uh, uh, I mean, there is no restriction in Newtonian mechanics, but the problem is the moment you use general relativity, then the Keplerian disk doesn't exist beyond marginal regular width. So you have to basically forcefully chop that is there. And viscosity transport and angular momentum outward. And therefore, uh, other assumption is that the viscous heating, as the matter is essentially getting um, uh, different cell rotation the friction, and the viscous heating is essentially radiating instantly. And therefore, this is highly efficient, this uh, radiating uh, property wise. So uh, this disk is a cold disk. The typical temperature is somewhere around 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 7 degree Kelvin. And it's every alloy of the disk is actually a multicolor black body. Okay, and so essentially the radiation spectrum that you actually get is the uh, modified black body spectrum and coming from individually the different alloy of the disk. So this, this this was very successful, particularly to explain the uh, radiation spectrum of luminous agent. Sun and Malcolm and 1989 they sort of try to model almost like. Uh, 60 different agents and uh, quasars using this uh, black body spectra. And then uh, for black hole X-ray binaries, particularly in the thermal state, I will come to the various states of the black hole X-ray binaries. So, uh, Remiller, McClintock, and many other authors, they could able to successfully model the radiation spectra using a standard uh, disk or standard uh, calculation of this. So, that was a sort of a success in accretion disk theory. But <clears throat> Okay. Now, um, yeah. But then the uh, relativistic uh, uh, correction of the same because subfluorescence of this was essentially designed for Newtonian uh, for gravity. So Page and Thorne immediately, uh, uh, I mean, uh, basically prescribed the exactly the same disk under general relativity. And in fact, uh, Luminate and Mark, they could able to um, simulate the optical photograph of, of the, the matter around black hole. Now, the observation basically leads to, to basically move forward. And then this is what the observation we see, particularly after launch of Uru satellite. 
And they saw that Cygnus X1 is actually emitting radiation all the way up to 100 kg or more. Now, that was a problem because uh, Thorne and Price, 1975, they showed that a standard uh, disk cannot explain this high energy part of the radiation. This part, so the standard disk is essentially multicolor black body, so it essentially stop here. So this additional extra high energy component cannot be explained using standard Kepler and disk. Sapiro, um, I mean, uh, they basically proposed in 1957, 76, that um, if we consider uh, essentially a Kepler and disk and closer to because um, in standard disk radiation pressure was actually you know, it's essentially gas pressure supported. So if you include radiation pressure, it's close to the uh, the black hole, the disk may be a thick disk, and comptonization process uh, could able to explain. In fact. Uh, Sapiro at all, they, they could able to explain the high energy uh, radiation in the componentization also. But Pringle in uh, 1976 showed that this particular disk is thermally unstable. So that was a problem with a thick disk or the hot disk. So how to develop a, a hot disk which is uh, stable. And then uh, uh, Ichimaru essentially uh, in 1977 he proposed essentially two components are inside. That you will have a uh, uh, optically thin component, which is hot, as well as you have the optically thick Keplerian component. And this particular work actually largely ignored, uh, all, uh, I mean, till I would say around 1994 or so. People really did not pay attention on this particular work. And meanwhile, uh, Sunayev and uh, Trumper 1979, uh, they showed that the uh, spectrum, not only that, if the, the, the flow is actually uh, two components, the spectrum also has two distinct components. So possibly the, those, those two components are connected to different region of the, the accretion disk. And uh, 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 Bardin and Peterson 1975, they essentially uh, look at the general relativistic uh, modification and, and, and the frame region around the equatorial plane. Now, the 1980s, mostly people concentrated towards big accretion disk or uh, uh, say something like uh, say slim disk. So people like Abraham H. Katelsky and collaborator, they talked about uh, I mean, super the accretion rate. So the accretion rate is extremely high and therefore this disk actually close to the black hole will be like a thick puffed up disk and you will have a radiation channel. So this is like a polished donut. So uh, you'll have a uh, radiation channel here, and this part will be extremely bright. So this is a thick disk, and um, slim disk is essentially a modified version of the thing. So if you say that the uh, thick disk is essentially super Eddington accretion, then slim disk is essentially not highly super Eddington, but moderately super super Eddington accretion, and that makes basically disk the disk is like a modified is not a thin disk. Neither is the thick disk also is somewhere in the middle. Now, but none of these solutions actually talk about like a, a, a global solution. These are not global solutions. So Abramovich and collaborator basically started uh, 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 repairing the, the inner boundary condition of the black hole. I will come back to that. And introduce basically transformativity in the in the accretion flow, but with a limited uh, success because they, they, they found out a lot of unphysical solutions. And that work is being extended by Chen and Tam in 1999 uh, to find out, uh, I mean, uh, uh, solution which where viscous friction essentially uh, the hitting the the, the 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 material. And uh, okay, parallelly, so if if we talk about uh, accretion, then parallelly in the uh, radiative point of view, uh, for example, though uh, uh, Lightman and elderly they basically talk about componentization process to generate high energy radiation, but that work is actually, uh, uh, I mean, carry forward in much more detail for various geometry and taking care of real interaction between photon and electron and solving the um, the, the component equation essentially carried by Sunia Pitachi in 1980-85. And then uh, Barn successively shows that, that the, the disk can be uh, uh, magnetized and therefore the corona uh, will be like magnetically, magnetically active corona. And uh, uh, Kajanas and Wilson, they basically talked about, uh, I mean, salt in, in pair plasma. So the, 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 the modification in the accretion, the physics is basically slowly 
moving from model uh, to us uh, more uh, general uh, global transonic solution and people started to talk about soil in accretion process okay now if that is an, one part of the, uh, the 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 development there is another part parallelly it, it was uh, uh, ling and thompson 1980 they first proposed that oh, i mean uh, like bondi flow it, uh, there can be flow not necessarily be, be kepler lamp there is there is nothing like a sacrosanct that the disk has to be completely kepler lamp so they talk about a thin rotating plasma adiabatic flow uh, using patchen squeet potential which sort of reflect the gravitational a general realistic effect and they talk about solutions with multiple sonic points now this is something completely new in accretion physics because if you have multiple sonic points then the flow dynamics will be completely different in chakravarti 1989 uh, studied uh, similar kind of uh, solution using accretion and wind and basically found multiple sonic uh, sonic point and it basically um, span the parameter space where energy and angular momentum choice of energy and angular momentum such that you break essentially such solutions so these are all analytical calculation in 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 simulation point of view there are hydrodynamic simulations and in a series of hydrodynamic simulation people showed that shock do exist very close to the compact object okay and uh, uh, there, there are other groups uh, like gami as, as well as rifat and harold they uh, basically shows that the, the Kepler and disk uh, can have shock with shock or without shock. Both possible solutions in different parameter space they work out and uh, they, they basically show those solutions also. Okay. Now, when you talk about um, the black hole accretion, of course, the biggest difference between accretion into any other object and black hole is because of inner boundary condition. Because 1990 onwards, the major change in accretion physics is happening. People are talking about global solutions, and that can present some general uh, radiative process. So you take care of, uh, you, you enrich the radiative process to be much more, and you talk about general radiative uh, uh, transonic solutions. The boundary condition is that on the horizon, your flow velocity is close to light, speed of light actually. So the flow is supersonic. And if you look at the outer boundary, it's essentially subsonic flow. So somewhere in the middle, flow must cross the sonic point, and therefore black, uh, black hole solution by definition has to be transonic. And therefore, in, in close to the black hole, the angular momentum cannot be kepler -like. It has to be a subkepler. -like. So this any solution you talk about, it must satisfy this boundary condition. It has to be transonic, and close to the black hole solution has to be subkepler. -like. It cannot be a kepler. -like. <laughs> now with that. Everybody is solving essentially these set of equations because these are the governing equations. All the model developers they are solving this radial momentum equation where he is the speed, or he is the pressure, or he is the density, lambda is angular momentum, a specific angular momentum, the continuity equation, which is vertically integrated, entropy generation equation, where these terms are essentially talking about the cooling process and the heating process, whatever the cooling or heating you add, and then finally you have angular momentum modulation equation. So all model developers are solving these equations. But still, in literature, we'll see there are totally uh, different arguments about the solutions, and we'll see why they are different. Okay, so first I'll talk about some very sort of uh, <coughs> popular um, um, model in, in black hole astrophysics. It's called accretion dominated accretion flow, or in short, it's called ADAP. <coughs> now, the, the, the initial seed actually planted by Ichenor, as I said, 1977. And uh, Narayan and collaborator essentially rediscovered the, the same thing. So the 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 the, the, the bigger point, the, 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 the most important part here is this quantity called F, which is called the advex term. So in the in, in, in uh, either slim disk or if we talk about, for example, uh, standard disk, their radiative process is actually important. Now here the most of the, the matter is actually cooled, not by radiative cooling process, rather it's because of advection. So uh, you have significant amount of radial velocity and therefore whatever the heat is generated by the viscosity, the matter itself is actually dragged into the black hole. So therefore is the advection which is cooling the uh, the flow. So therefore this advection term here is actually um, almost reaching close to one. So Narayan collaborator, they propose a solution which is self-similar solution. It's good in one sense that you get analytical um, 
expression for various flow parameters. You try to understand the properties of the solutions uh, uh, with, with the clarity. For example, this solution is valid particularly for very low acquisition rate. It's a uh, relatively very, very inefficient acquisition. Temperature is very hot, almost reaching to the, uh, the virial temperature. And radial velocity, of course, much larger than the thin acquisition this radial velocity. Angular momentum is subcapillarian because we have a lot of pressure and that pressure is partially balancing the gravity and therefore the angular, angular velocity is subcapillarian and optically thin. Okay. Okay. So, um, but the self similar solution you have a problem and the problem is the self similar solution uh, cannot address the observation because observation demands a global solution and self similar solution is scale independent and therefore. The inner edge of the activation disk is actually emitting a lot of radiation that cannot be addressed by self similar solution. But they also produce global solution, and that could be able to explain, for example, sources like Sigma C star, which is low luminosity, Asians, and many other uh, object in question state. And this is there are various variants of the model depending on the activation rate. Now, one important parameter which is missing in this adapt solution is essentially the presence of salt. Because shock is something you cannot, uh, is not, is unavoidable because of competition between gravity and the centrifugal force. And therefore, you will have shock. Now, what are the consequences? Why we actually talk about shock? Why is it interesting? Because it has a lot of consequences. It gives you a natural uh, scale in the system. And therefore, it, it basically gives uh, the set of properties which you can vary, uh, which verify observations. Okay? Either you talk about outflow, either you talk about uh, time variability, you talk okay. about radiation spectrum, no, uh, particle oscillation, and a lot of other things. And this is what the typical solution. So you will have mul multiple sonic points, and in between you will have a soft transition. And so October 96, for example, showed various types of solution in in in, in a global solution. Now the question is, Chakravati solution and adapt solution, apparently there is a confusion because adapt solution doesn't contain any salt. Then it is a new solution. The, the, the difficulty is essentially the philosophy of finding out of choosing the, the, the method of solution. Jufulu uh, actually wrote very nicely here that the method that the Chakravati is actually followed, it does you won't miss any solution. Because here you treat angular momentum and its sonic point as your three parameter and therefore you are not going to miss in fact they show that if you take chakravati's method you could reproduce all that of solution you won't miss any single solution so apparently there is no confusion you are not actually looking at the proper parameters yes. that's the confusion and then there are recent updates where people not only talk about accretion they are talking about, about self-consistent accretion and ejection solution together People are uh, talking about, for example, uh, two temperature magnetized flow around uh, uh, with heating and cooling everything. And this uh, simulation part, I'm not going to talk about much. I'm just touching up there are sort of recent simulation and uh, people are mostly now understood that the origin of the viscosity, uh, origin of the transfer of angular momentum is essentially NRM. And therefore you need to have GRM in the simulation. And that, that is what the forefront and that is what the coming era, which will be uh, trying to possibly will try to address a lot of fundamental uh, physics problem. And so the general model will be something like this. You expect that you will have two component. One is the standard. Another is essentially your subcapillary flow. Your uh, central part will be like a path of radiation and uh, hot region. And uh, these are the uh, sort of different radiative process you should take, uh, take, take into account. And that is what contributing to your radiation spectrum. And so if I now look at from observational point of view, as in essentially observation tells you that there are three different tools. And you have to essentially tackle any problem in three different tools because they have their independent identity. Spectrum, timing, as well as polarization, which is basically the upcoming one. If you talk about spectrum, uh, the already, I mean, there are a lot of paper with spectrum and timing. Uh, so this is one uh, what we, we did actually long back uh, when we talk about M87 radiation spectrum for, for a wide range of energy. Um, okay, when you talk about spectral behavior, for example, the sources are being identified depend on their spectral state. Sometimes we, we talk about uh, hard state, we talk about soft state, intermediate state, and there are sources which shows this kind of spectral state. So your models would explain that how the spectral state are actually transmitting. <coughs> Timing very well. 
for example, GRS is on source possibly the most peculiar one showing all possible variabilities. So any model not only explain the spectra, should be able to explain all the spectra like timing variability also. You cannot, I mean, handle or you cannot develop a model which will only address spectra, only address timing, not together. That 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 is not a physical model. So any physical model you try to develop should be holding hand together and will be able to explain both together. Okay, so this is something I may skip. Uh, this is okay. Okay. And the signature of the connection of the jet and the disk. So this is something that if you get a jet signature and you see the signature in the accretion spectrum also. And possibly the most global one will be like this. Here people talk about observation in this branch, which is corresponds to this one here, and talk about low luminosity AGM, which corresponds to this. But there are sources which are actually transiting between the two branches. So there is no physical model which could actually talk about those transition. Why a particular source sometimes appear here in the high luminosity branch, sometimes appear in the low luminosity branch. So you need to have models. Uh, for example, here, the spectrum of the source appears very similar in two different spectral states. The moment you look at timing, they clearly show the signature that they are not same, they are different. So you need to have model to address this kind of observation. So this is the last slide. So conclusion is, Last few decades, we have seen tremendous amount of progress, of course, in accretion physics, enriching a lot of uh, uh, fundamental physics, but we need to actually move in the present time to develop more realistic first uh, um, models generating from the, the first principle. And of course, we need to have model which will combine all three together and, and, uh, and explain the physical process. Thank you. Uh, thanks to me for the review of uh, accretion physics. Now it's time for a question. Yeah. Just a minute, just a minute. Yeah, because you mentioned that ADAP. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, uh, ADAP is very inefficient. Correct. Can you? Just elaborate a yeah. bit more. So what happened when I say efficiency, it means how much amount of energy would convert into radius. Now here you have very large advection. Radial velocity is very high. So the before matter could emit significant amount of radiation is actually falling under that. So therefore matter doesn't have enough time to radiate. So <coughs> you said long controversy is uh, Ramesh Nanayan and this uh, right. Chakravarti were two and a half decades, but uh, can you, you said that uh, shock is unavailable, unavoidable, sure. and then you said that in some cases shock may not be there. So in two lines, can you summarize which one is correct and when? No, so so the, the your answer is lies here. Yeah. So you have this entire parameter space for solution. But it's not that the entire parameter space actually providing you shock solution. Only there are specific combination of energy, angular moment, and high going to get shock. So therefore, if you do not choose the right parameter, your solution will never give a shock solution. Your in, entire parameter only about very specific place. Why do I want to get a shock solution? So what Ramesh and, and group uh, consider are not realistic parameter values? No, or? both are parameters. See, because See, transonic solution does not mean that it has to have a solve. It may not have solve. A pure transonic flow can connect between inner edge and boundary. So those solutions are perfectly acceptable solution. So the parameter which you choose to get those solutions will never give you such solution. But you have specific energy and angular momentum. Why are you going to get a such solution in the middle? And that choice is very, very critical because the approach Romerson and, and group actually proved, they took that the angular momentum is actually an eigenvalue of the problem. So therefore, you have to calculate it self-consistently, which is extremely hard to find thing. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, can you talk about the origin of this subject print flow? I mean, in observationally, uh, some high return at like 0 0.01 or something. Is record like to in the torus region, right? uh -huh. so for hard state or something. Okay, so, so, where does this uh, huge amount of subterranean flow is produced? It is yeah. directly coming from the company or is, or is it produced? See, it's very, very difficult to create such a huge subterranean from the 
if you have an independent origin from the outer boundary, that makes your life much easier because you have a steady flow there. So it, it, it's not through loss flow, uh, it has to be. No, that is perfectly all right. There is no problem with the loss, loss flow. flow. Only thing is that the outer boundary, there is no guarantee that the entire amount of material has to be kept there. You may have a gap level flow, but on top of that, you may have a subcategory contribution also. Okay. So, uh, from all the observations and simulations, uh, do we know about any simple relation between the viscous parameter and some property of the disk? I mean, people sometimes do scaling between thickness of the disk and the viscous parameters. Correct. Is there something that we uh, sort of uh, clearly know about that? Not really. There, there are some uh, paper with some simulation, there are some scaling relationships, but really uh, there is nothing concrete here. Last question. Uh, so, uh, so you are talking about fucked up disk or uh, polystone at, uh, right. uh, that also has advection down the That that also had advection. So no, 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 no. That doesn't have any advection. No, so, it, it, it is just radiation pressure which is essentially lifting it up. Whatever, and radiation pressure, gas pressure. There, there is no radial velocity. So radial velocity is zero. Radiation so if you take if you take the fluid equation, get rid of only the advection terms. Then you okay. Then you what you get. Is a thing. Okay. It's very simple. If you take the equations, you drop a few terms, you get one solution. Drop another term, you get another solution. Take all the terms, you get another set of solutions. Okay. This is really last question. <laughs> last of the last. Can you expect an interaction between the Kevlin disk and the sub disk? Because we expect there should be Kevlin and so, so if you ask me that what is the the most sort of uh, difficult question to answer and not even attempted yet. There is only one simulation paper where I see uh, that they consider a vertical distribution of this viscosity and tries to create a uh, Kepler flow out of sub Kepler. -in. But physically, if you are talking about what is the interaction in the middle, no idea. I don't know. I have. <laughs> anyway, this is going. We can extend that one. Thank you. Uh, so this is a for, uh, follow up the, uh, those que uh, that question. So you, do you have, you know, uh, in numerical relativity for neutron star collision, we can some of us develop something called high resolution shock capturing schemes, which were adapted from somewhere else. You guys do that? And yeah, yeah, you yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I realize this. Uh, yeah. In very large. Yeah. Okay, no, uh, yeah, uh, we are in uh, uh, working with uh, a group in Illinois. Okay, so it's you? Uh, no, no, it's um, Antonio. So they are uh, sort of they are work, looking into this neutron solution, and the resulting gets and uh, yeah. So okay, that so will come later on. So <laughs> I have a, a one comment later. to your question is uh, uh, go back to the parameter space. Yeah, yeah. So go there. Just a moment. Yeah. yeah. So Ramachandran group did not consider solution which contains the outer solid point solution. They always consider inner solution. Inner so basically, if you go, go through this okay, maybe paper, we, 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 we yeah, can yeah, discuss paper. This is the outer uh, solution. Yeah. This is the outer solution. Okay. Because <laughs> so our next speaker is Upendra. Bupendo will speak about misaligned circumcingle this embedded region. No, it's because of my guy. You, you do not need Uh, will it be possible to bring these lines since you have okay. some animations? Yeah. Just to make them more uh, brighter. 
It will force your audience to go to sleep too. <laughs> I don't see it. <laughs> so, so people were th thinking about, I mean, your uh, Shanto was saying that we will see a film here. Yeah, we are going into the film stage. Everyone can hear me or? Yes. Can yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you to uh, organizers and especially Linda for all the uh, help, like travel plan from then. Yeah. I was not stranded in somewhere in the world. And so, in order to Start my journey towards astrophysics. Actually, I started my first projects with Santa Vita Sarekli, Masters. That's where my introduction to artificial this comes actually. And when I went for PhD, I asked my PhD advisor that I want to work on numerical simulations. And he's a pen paper calculation person, wrote a close me and uh, America Brahmovich. So they're like, that's a crazy idea. Don't follow it because nobody in this institute knows the numerical simulations. But after a year or two, I started to uh, learn simulations and uh, started collaborating with one of the code you mentioned in uh, Cosmos Plus. <laughs> so here's a list of my collaborators. And my main expertise is actually strongly magnetized radiative accretion probes uh, or thin accretion disks. But recently, I shifted my gears toward uh, gravitational wave sources and embedded objects within a large accretion So. My talk will be how you form misaligned. I should add randomly aligned uh, technician disk around black holes, which are embedded inside a large technician disk around the edge. Uh, so, <clears throat> so, you probably all heard about. Very first detections from the LIGO astronomy from the star merger. Now, as we started to observe more and more sources from gravitational wave detections, uh, in 1905 21, that's uh, 2021, we found a source that's uh, falling into a region which, which cannot be explained by the standard formation of black holes. So that's called like a, a mass gap. In. So each of these black holes here. Uh, so the top one here is 86 solar mass, and this is 55, so 66 solar mass. So if you know the, the stellar evolution, you cannot form a black hole directly like this at this particular mass range. So there, there was a growing interest that what could be a, a possibility that we can rapidly form such a large black holes. And one way is that they should have abundance of gas around them to agree or if they could be retained after a natal kick, if there's a binary system, and they don't get kicked out from the system, and we merge smaller black holes and make the formation of much heavier black holes, especially in this particular mass range. So this idea was floating since 2013, but people are not uh, focusing much on, until we found this kind of observation from life. So why are we interested in this kind of events? Uh, one other reason is that there could be one way to see the electromagnetic counter. But if the isolated black holes merge in a binary system, you wouldn't see any electromagnetic counter. So there is no efficient disk around these black holes. They simply merge and you see the rotational rate cycle. Now, right after this event, there was an electromagnetic counterpart observed from GP transient facility. And it was showing a luminosity of about 10 to the power 45 times per second. That, that's one thing. If it's an isolated binary system, which was standard way of seeing the uh, black hole merger in LIGO detections, you will see that there's a, a circular orbit. But here, what we are seeing a weak evidence of eccentric orbits, which is really important because 
uh, if you do a large number of numerical reactivity simulations for two black holes, you're finding that the eccentricity is greater than 0.5 to explain this kind of observation. <laughs> and the other thing is that there's anti-correlation between the black hole mass and the spectral spectrum. Most of the LIGO detection so far have a very small black hole effective, which is chi parameter. The final black hole spin is very small, 0.1 to 0.2. So based on this, Ravi, but just a quick yeah. it hasn't been resolved. What is the spin? I oh, yeah, no, it's not resolved. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by it's the way, it's, it's all speculation. Yeah. Yeah. There speculation. is no electromagnetic counterpart, so called. It's a coincidence. Yeah. And the uh, eccentricity argument is not even supported by LIGO with local collaborator. There are people who wrote things which we don't agree on that. And, uh, you know, and you don't. Yeah. So there are many things. Spin is a big deal. Spin yeah. and mass. <laughs> yeah, so this is all I did. It's all it's all speculation. Gearing up towards explaining how could this source yeah, sure. be there. Sure. And also the type of simulations I'm going to show are cutting is like in the front here, but they are not the final way to describe this. So yeah, uh, this all weak evidences, weak thinking says what could be happening. I mean, the biggest challenge is that HNS will be very bright. How are we going to observe a merger of two black holes with electromagnetic counterpart with a bright engine at the center? So that's another difficulty. Uh, how are we going to see such a radiation? The equation disk itself is optically thick. Black holes are embedded inside. How the radiation can escape? So there's another mechanism which is called uh, the breakout radiation. So that's another speculation. Now we have the source. So so to those, those who are uh, not familiar, with the, there are two large um, types of black hole binary merger formation channels. Uh, where it's a dynamical formation, where you have some sort of common envelope forming around one of the stars, and eventually uh, it engulfs both of them, and one of them uh, forms a black hole, and eventually they form a binary black hole system. The other could be that it's a stellar cluster where there's an interaction of many body, like there are three body here. You have a binary black hole and the exchange of environmental, and how a third body could uh, tighten the um, orbit and allow the merger. So these are two main ones. But we are uh, interested in the. Uh, yeah, so, aging channel. This is still a hierarchical merger. I wouldn't call it a, a completely new paradigm. So here also you have two black holes again, like taking 66 solar mass and 85 solar mass. Uh, it's a cartoon universe. You have an AGM here. So why AGM channel will be favoring this particular uh, LIGO observation? Because the AGM disks are ideal to retain the black holes even if they got a natal peak during the merger. So during the merger process, there's a chance that one of the black holes will get kicked. So agent disk will retain that. And uh, this also has abundance of gas around, which will be eventually accreting at super infinite accretion rates onto these small black holes. So why are we here? Uh, this will retain the black hole? So that's due to the... Gravity. So these, these are at 10,000 gravitational radii. But the... Uh, the disk itself has a torque exerting on these uh, black holes with the disk, which will retain these into the, the well of the central edge of this. So, initially, people started to do 2D simulation. This is, I think, one of the first uh, attempts to see a gravitating source inside a alpha disk model. But as you see that when you do a a 2D simulation, you often miss the, the physics which is required to resolve the 3D components. So this was a, an efficient disk where Yao Ping is a colleague of mine. He seeded uh, a binary system within this uh, agent disk and tried to understand what will happen to this orbit. Will it contract or will it expand? Like if you want to favor the LIGO observation, our bias will be that we want the orbit to be contract. Otherwise, we will not be able to have a merger. 
the two D models were showing that you have uh, expanding binary for prograde motion, which is kind of worrisome. And this is a two D simulation. When we did three D model, we found that this was not true. So we started to do the a 3D global, I wouldn't call them global search. So these are 3D models. You consider a, a patch of edge indication disk at 10,000, sorry, 1,000 gravitational radii here. And what we do is for local sharing box simulations. And this is the first time I started to do local sharing box simulations, which I always did global simulations. But this will be one of the only ways to resolve the binary separation here and keeping the MHD resolved. And so if you consider the GRMHD simulations, mostly we were doing it up to a few hundred gravitational radius. What we are doing is far away here and consider a cube from this Cajun disk and seed it with vertical magnetic it might sound simple that we see it with vertical magnetic field, but vertical magnetic fields uh, are very notorious in accretion disks. Uh, if you have a geo net flux, numerically it's easier, but if you put the vertical magnetic fields, what it tends to do is evacuate the numerical domain you have by the wind, it's driving the wind outflows, and it will start to evacuate your model and produce low density. And numerically, the code will crash because if you start to go to very low densities, uh, you go to smaller time steps and your code will crash. So, this was being very technical until uh, 2016 when one of the uh, colleagues started to do this kind of simulations. Uh, can I have a very dumb question? Do you think there's some sort of a, uh, in a pseudo Newtonian potential to kind of show the presence of uh, a supermassive black hole out there? This location, or you don't do that. So these are um, at two thousand gravitational radius from the agent. Yeah. So we are assuming the a purely Newtonian uh, uh, approach. The initialization of this shearing box is to stratify Shapiro Sinardis uh, to initialize the initial parameters. Of. So the disk aspect ratio here is zero point zero five, and that's where thin disks are very challenging to resolve, uh, especially in the global simulations. So, yeah, we are far from the age we to consider that. But that's a great question, but in the final stage, we want to add that. Yeah, uh, there, are, there are potentials like that. Right. Yeah. Right. So, this is the the stage is actually the simulation to also it. So first of all, we evolve uh, edge in this where MRI turbulence is growing. And we find some sort of uh, a saturated turbulence that uh, MRI has got in a saturated state. It's not going in magnetic field again. Then that's the tricky part here. So you have to go all the way to this binary separation, which is a quarter of the hill radius. And in order to resolve that, you have to add nine levels of static mesh refinement. That means we are enhancing the grid resolution by two to the power nine in the central part of this uh, cube I was showing to resolve the, the binary. And then we see the black holes once the turbulence has achieved. When I say black holes, these are point sources of gravity. They do not consider anything about GR effects here. Because if you had the GR effects, you have to take into account the, the very inner parts of the accretion disk, which we are avoiding at the moment. And then you evolve at stage three for a little bit so that you don't create any artifact of uh, instant mass loss due to the black hole. And then you turn on the equation by the black hole. When I say the equation, it means that you basically poke a hole in the static sharing box, the sharing box at the center, and the gas will start to uh, leak from that particular hole. 
keeping in mind that we are preserving the angular momentum by having a boundary condition where we put back whatever angular momentum has been lost. So if you start to move the mass into the sink, you will start to violate the angular momentum conservation. The very interesting aspect about when you see the accretion disk with vertical magnetic field. So here it's a, a paper by Greg Salveson that if you have a zero net vertical field, you do not produce a lot of magnetic flux. What I mean is that if you, I don't have a cable actually, but uh, I wanted to just it. So if you take a, a net vertical magnetic field in the disk and you have a, a shear Caplanian flow, you start to drag that magnetic field in the phi direction. Will you that, oh, so, <laughs> so, so if you consider the this magnetic field is turning the disk and you have a, a shear flow, you start to bend this magnetic field in the phi direction, and that's already producing the B phi and BR. And then you stretch it with the radial component of magnetic field and produce a large toroidal component. So if you keep um, winding that magnetic field, you end up with a very large toroidal magnetic field. And if you see here the simulations, uh, I followed up with the global simulations and we find the same, that if you have a magnetic beta parameter, which is the ratio of gas pressure to the magnetic pressure. Uh, if you start the beta of 10 here, it reaches a strongly magnetized force. It's really important that if you have a stronger magnetic field, your gas dynamics gets more clumpy. And that plays a crucial role in what I'm going to model uh, in terms of the embedded system in an edge radius. So here you see that this will be a, a weakly magnetized case. You see a nice turbulence, not very big blobs of gas density. You amplify the magnetic field, it gets big blobs of density. And now if you see the two black holes, I wanted to mention that we have four disks now. Uh, one is large scale agent disk in which the black holes are embedded. Uh, then there's a common disk called circumbinary disk. If you see it from, let's say a top view, the two black holes will be surrounded by a common disk called circumbinary disk. So that will be somewhat around this binary system. And then there's something called circumsingular disk, which is a around each object seated in this map, uh, in this agent grid. There was a, this interesting discussion, and thanks to Samir for giving a very nice overview of accretion disk. Actually, for the first time, we are seeing a formation of torus out of like turbulent flow. Uh, we analyzed its properties, uh, published in 2022. Actually, it forms a torus, Polish torus. But how do you know it is a Polish donor? Because Polish donors do not have advection. So if you plot the, uh, uh, the velocity vectors, that will tell you whether it's a thick disk with advection or it's a Polish donor. So, so we mainly analyze the angular momentum profile and the density contours. Okay. So for a given angular momentum profile and density contours, it was matching Polish donor. Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Actually, we cannot rely much on the, the flow dynamics here. That's what I was going to show here that you see the most of the equation here in this particular simulation, these are hydromods, 3D hydromods. The equation was happening from the polar polar region. And that's due to the dynamics of the age in this at large scale. And we find it the same in the MHD model. So the equation is not primarily happening through the the mid parts of the black hole seed and it's happening from the polarities. So these are hydro models. Uh, these are simpler, but yet very expensive because of a uh, large number of refinement levels required. But what you notice is that there's a spiral structure, not any turbulence. Life is much easier here. And what we find is that, so these are the, the plots of how the semi-major axis of this binary separation is changing with time. So, so this will be the, the separation of the binary in terms of field radius. If you start to increase this separation, uh, you 
we always have contraction. But beyond this, uh, here, we start to expand the binary. So you have to be in some sense to limit that where your binary system will always be contract. If you put it too far away, then it will start expanding. And the same is for eccentricity, that the, the largest separation has largest eccentricity change. Okay, the hydro models. Now, I started these turbulent uh, MRI simulations and then put the black hole. You have already seen that how the dif different magnetic field strength is changing your, so this is beta of 100, beta of 1000, beta of 10,000. What you are seeing is some sort of equatorial plane of the disk in the stop row. And this will be some sort of uh, edge on view. If you see, a, if you cut a piece of cake, you see the edge, edge on view. So that will be the edge on view. And you already see that the big clumps forming for the stronger magnetic field. Now let's uh, see what happens to the power simulation. So these are just to compare. Again, we are getting consistent results. Now I'm running short on time, so uh, let's play this. So if you have a single black hole, you see that the turbulent disk was given a small black hole, and then it started to form a disk around it. But what you notice is that it's nature versus nurture. So <coughs> the turbulent disk is supplying some sort of material. It brings some environment towards the black hole. Because it's a turbulent disk, it's having some random agglomerate. It falls into that black hole region, it forms a disk with some, uh, some particular uh, disk orientation. Here it's oriented in the x direction. And if you uh, see the uh, evolution, actually, over the time it has been uh, forming in the different direction, but eventually it forms uh, a disk along the LX direction in this model. If you see the black hole at a different time, some other type of momentum blob fell in and it formed this kind of uh, disk, which is pointing towards the G direction. So wherever you put the black hole in this turbulent agent disk, that will dis decide what should be the orientation of your uh, disk. Again, I'll skip this part, but uh, so this is to highlight that if you take the budget of angular momentum around this each object, you see that one particular component is dominating over the others. And here it's a LX was dominated. And also the disk is forming, which is on this right hand side here, it's accumulating more and more uh, matter, the disk is forming from inside out. So what we find is that, again, you pick different initial uh, turbulent MHD models at different uh, magnetic field strength, and you put the black holes at different time, you will find the different disk orientation. So, so that was a single black hole. Now we put two black holes here, and you, you see that both of them might have a different orientation of the disk around each black hole. And uh, they are not going to merge or anything because these are still in the Newtonian limit. And they will keep orbiting like this forever. So you take, um, again, this is like a bit of 10,000 case beta of 1,000 and beta of 100. And you see that beta of 10,000 case is a weakly magnetized case. So you most of the time find the disk forming aligned with the edge in this, but it's a weakly magnetized case. The initial point of the same. Yeah. Uh, Seeding point. Yeah, that's to compare the weakly magnetized case as the aligned disks. So, what I'm proposing here is that uh, if these disks are randomly oriented around each black hole, and we have a strong magnetic field, they will have a jet where the inner jet will be precessing, and the large scale disk around these mini black holes is randomly aligned. And that could produce some sort of lighthouse effect 
because the jet is hitting this large scale disk at large misaligned disk, and that could be one way to possibly see the breakout radiation as it interacts with the disk. And again, so our final goal is actually to uh, follow a step by step uh, method that now we are doing the Newtonian models. And after the stage from MRI simulations, we are going to put it into the post Newtonian approach, a uh, code called Phoebus, where you can uh, evolve a separation of few hundred gravitational radii and evolve them in post Newtonian approach. And then once they get even closer, you evolve into the Einstein toolkit, which is the relativity model. Uh, and the whole idea is to have as realistic as possible gas dynamics and the magnetic field to possibly see such a jet formation when the two black holes merge and each of them has its own uh, mini disk around. So I leave it with the, the very short summary that we are heading towards the uh, explaining the EM counterparts from the black hole merger. Thanks. Question. In all of the density controls of the mini disks, it doesn't appear to be having a continuous distribution of matter on the course. That it has concentric rings. Oh, so this is because of uh, the way the rendering is done. So if I had a color bar with a more like a uniform density distribution. That will show you that the density distribution is still uniform with the power law. The reason you are seeing them as a ring is because they have a, some sort of rendering effect that you can see the 3D effect. So if you want to see uh, something behind that opaque gas, that's why you are seeing this ring structure. But each ring is actually corresponding to a particular density contour. I don't know if you got that. This is a rendering effect. It's not hard to huh? It's not it's real. So if you plotted it actually density profile, it would look smooth. It's basically to show the 3D effects. A uh, very nice talk. Um, so a couple of questions. One was I saw that um, uh, in your plot the eccentricity was going up um, of the binary, if I'm not mistaken. So and that seems like uh, some sort of effort to the you know kind of phase. Cosi kind of an effect, but you are still in a place. I was kind of impressed by that, even though it's going on only up to point one, whereas the yeah. system you were talking about, I mean, very unlikely, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so actually we are following up with this with the misaligned binary or off uh, the plane. So that is, so uh, theoretically, this maybe is, looks like a, a Cosi effect, which yeah. kind of drives the eccentricity up right. that way. Yeah. Not much, but uh, yeah. so. Um, going to publicize it and kind of uh, popularize something else. You, whatever you are doing, this will be amazing from a personal timing array perspective. We are going to turn this around, have a black hole binary surrounded by a circum binary disk. And if you, you know, and how that evolution, this will be critical in the coming years. Okay, right. so we should keep in touch. Sure. <laughs> it's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, hi, nice talk. So, uh, target simulation depends on uh, aging activation rate. So, for example, if you go for uh, close to a super aging then the simulation is yeah. yeah. So, so we do take the the initial disk as one of the profiles for a given aging that has m dot. So, if we change yeah. the m dot, then the the disk will change. So, then the evolution might be different. But do you have relative cooling? No, no, these are the isothermal. Then it would not uh, take a much. So that's a second component we have to add. The, after magnetic field is the radiation. Uh, it's challenging to have the radiation with the adiabatic state because the disk will just evaporate. So, yeah. and, yeah. and the mass of AGN is just a nice thing that people do. And how do you put the emission, gravitational emission effect into this? So these ones don't tell anything. I know, I know. That's very clear. Yeah. So if I actually did the post-Newtonian models, then I will be able to explain. No, no that only for the, the disk and the black hole. I'm talking about the two binaries experiencing 
in a gravitational wave mission because that's yeah. what it is. Yeah, you have to have just an es estimate of the quadruple moment. Oh, we can compute that and put it in and all that. It's a radiation reaction. Maybe. Another effect will be very interesting. I don't know whether you have the resolution to see whether there is a small linear momentum kick of the binary. You know, and see, we can talk about that later. Yeah. Yeah. And this has a kick effect. Yeah, this is one year work, so I'm still a lot. Yeah. I had a question in continuation of the thing. So how you said that the disk will confine the binary system and the kick velocity will be affected. So did you um, check this part, how this uh, kick velocity will be affected by the disk of this binary system? So, yeah, so in one more paper uh, by, so that's tricky to do with a, a chain of plus plus code that I'm using. So that's more for MHD studies. But uh, if you take this, so they have been trying that actually how the, if you have already bind the system and you send another, it's more towards not resolving the gas dynamics, but a three body problem, so sorry, four body problem. So just a follow up of that. I'm sorry, I, I should keep following yeah. that. So if you eventually the binary merges and it kicked out and then the disk scenario and the, the potential of the system can bring it back. So when they say they said optical counterpart, they have in their danger in the sense that they have to see this uh, repeating happening at some time. And absolutely, they have no prediction for that. If something happens again, they can obviously correlate. Right. So that may be, yeah. So. Yeah, there's a, one other interesting scenario in the page in this context is that these are called embryos, stream mass ratio in spirals. You might have intermediate mass black hole embedded in the next and it's going to a, a spiral phase. That could be one way to, which is more towards Lisa, not in line. The last question. No, no, this is really a last question. So, uh, I'm a little confused with something that you were saying several times that if I have an accretion uh, flow and then I put a black hole there, some you know this single disk will form. So are you talking about? Um, usually we think the other way around that there is a black hole and accretion flow around it. Um, so in your uh, simulations, the the black hole spin and this that that, that is that affecting the di dynamics of the flow? Is, is there any any sort of you know both way effect? That's, uh... Yeah, so here these black holes are formed by some progenitor, right? So it, it, it watched some star. Uh, so these are called, so the disk profiles we are taking is called Thompson disk profile. Okay. So probably you're familiar with the thermal instability of uh, radiation pressure dominating this. Now, Thompson et al. model is saying that. If you have a stellar population at this particular radius, that would produce some sort of heating to, to balance the thermal collapse of the disk. So if we and if we agree with that model for AGM disks to stabilize, then there's a large population of stars at this particular radius. And those stars will eventually form black holes. And when it forms a black hole, um, it could either be a supernova or it could be a heavier mass, it could be tear instability, but the surrounding disk is still turbulent. So, whatever is falling in the very initial stages will still dictate the what should be the disk orientation, but eventually it will also affect the black hole spin because that angular momentum is eventually being deposited onto this black hole. So, over a long period of time, that would affect the spin of the black hole. I, I ask because in I mean in MHD simulations, the GR MHD simulations, there is a big deal about prograde and retrograde flow and, and and they have very different observational consequences. So I think this, these black holes are the kind of a point like objects within a GNDs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now I understand. Now. So if we take isolated black hole and do a GR MHD simulation, uh, that's a bit more smaller scale, right? Because these are still far away from the very inner part of the GR. Of course, if you took a, a isolated GRMHD black hole, it's small. 
then the things are very much correlated. What's the black hole spin? What should be the inner part of the disk? To increase the black hole spin, the disk starts to move towards the black hole. Um, the magnetic field amplification is also different. The, the luminosity also gets affected. So those are radiative models. Uh, I have recent, we have recently published a paper. I can share that. Well, we computed the spectra from such a model. Sure, thank you. Okay, then this thanks, uh, Bhupendra. So, we have our next speaker, uh, Bhubona. She will be speaking uh, about exploring the accretion disk dynamics in extra galactic plant with extra Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Buana. I am a research scholar in uh, Diana Sagar University, Bengaluru. And today I'll be talking about the work I've done in collaboration with Dr. Anishandi Akisu, that is uh, exploring the acquisition disk dynamics in extra collective black This is uh, the content of my talk. I'm just going to. Okay. Yeah, so I'll quickly introduce black hole X-ray binaries. Now we know, uh, as Tamil Sir explained, so black hole X-ray binaries are the system that consists of a stellar mass black hole along with a normal companion star. And uh, they are classified generally as uh, low, either as low mass X-ray binaries or as high mass X-ray binaries based on the mass of the companion. And they are also classified as either transient or persistent source based on the type of emission they give. Um, so coming to the topic of so my talk, which is extra galactic black hole X-ray binaries. So now, uh, while there are large number of uh, black hole, uh, stellar mass black hole X-ray binaries that are found in our galaxy, which are mostly transient, that is the one which undergoes output and few persistent sources. But when it, when it comes to extra galactic black hole X-ray binaries, a majority of them, the stellar mass black holes are found in a subclass of ultra luminous X-ray sources, which, is, which are the sources that gives uh, that has a luminosity above its ed emission limit. So yeah, majority of them are found in uh, ULXs. So we are we are not talking about that, but we wanted to find the one which are very similar to the galactic ones. That is the counterpart for the ga galactic black hole X-ray binaries, uh, which has a bit of luminosity and stellar mass black hole. So when we search for that, we could find there are only five such sources, which is, uh, they are LMC X1, LMC, LMC X3, M33 X7, NGC 300 X1, and IC10 X1. Mm, so yeah, uh, to introduce all five of these, we introduce all five of these sources. The one property that is common to all five of these sources is that all of them are persistent. None of them are transient, unlike the galactic ones. They are all persistent. They give, uh, they give X-ray emission all the time. And uh, except for LMC X3, all of them are uh, high mass X-ray binary, hence they accrete mass from stellar wind. Uh, so, but but then uh, LMC X3 is a low mass X-ray binary which accretes a mass mass through uh, roaster overflow. And again, except LMC X3, all of them uh, seem to host uh, massive black holes, especially the last three, that is M33 X7, X3, and IC10 X1. These are known to be some of the most massive stellar mass uh, black holes ever found. Uh, so in our work, we have studied all five of the sources by making use of the observational data, X-ray data from AstroSat, NICER, NewStar, and uh, Axiom Newton. So coming to the properties of LMC X1 that we observed, uh, so LMC X1 is known to be a very stable source that is a persistent, as I said, and uh, we can see from the light curve, long-term light curve that I've plotted here. This is plotted for over four to five years, and we can say that it is uh, it is almost stable uh, during all the time. And uh, we have studied this source using AstroSat, NICER, and uh, NewStar observations. And 
we saw that the spectrum is a very typical, uh, it's, it's like kind of a typical black hole. It has a standard accretion disk along with the complex component. And in all of our observations, we saw that the uh, contribution from thermal disk is dominant, which means it's in the soft spectral state during all the time. And it is pretty bright. We can see that it's, uh, its luminosity was uh, around uh, 0 0.07 to 0 0.34 times the entrance and luminosity. And uh, this is what the spectrum looks like in different observations and uh, in different, uh, taken from different instruments. Coming to LMC X3, uh, compared to LMC X1, this shows a lot of variability, which you can see from the light curve. And with the, with the components of the spectrum is similar, that is, it has a standard thermal disk along with a complex component. The contribution from the uh, thermal disk varies in different observations. Even though we see that it is in soft spectral state, the dominant uh, a contribution from the disk most of the time we do see it undergoing a transition to intermediate and hard state where its uh, contribution is less and uh, we see a large variation of luminosity that is in hard state it goes as low as 0 0.01 and in hard, ha uh, high soft state it goes as high as 0 0.42 times the um, luminosity this is how the spectrum looks like in different observations and in different spectral states and uh, coming to the spectrum of the other three extra galaxy black hole boundaries, we saw that it's not really the same as the other two. That is, it doesn't have a standard accretion disk with the complex component. So when we modeled with the simple disk BB and power law model, we saw that uh, the spectrum is, first of all, the spectrum is very steep. And but the contribution, the most of the contribution for the spectrum was coming from the non-thermal power law component in all of the observations in all three sources. So this does not belong to the property of typical hard state or uh, soft state, but rather it resembled the steep power loss state, which is generally seen in outbursting galactic sources in the peak of its outburst, where the luminosity is really high. So I'll show the spectrum. So this is how the spectrum looks like, the top uh, panel. Uh, all of them are very steep. and uh, but, but when we look at the residual of the spectral fit, when it is modeled just with a disk UV, that is disk model, thermal disk model, which is plotted here in orange, uh, we can see that there is a residual remaining in the soft band as well as in the high band. So when I add power law to it, it's not just fitting for the high energy band, which I intended to, because in order to take care of the compensation, but it is also extending towards a lower energy. So this is where the domination of the non-thermal component is coming from. But then the steep power law state, SPL state of the galactic binary is explained as it having a stronger corona and hence it is giving, uh, it's, uh, the more uh, uh, inverse compartmentalization is happening. That's where, uh, and hence uh, it has the high uh, non-thermal uh, contribution from non-thermal component. So clearly that is not the case here. So we cannot say that the spectral state that we are observing is similar to the galactic SPL state. So we have to try some other modeling. So the model, the, the next modeling we tried is that using disk PB and disk PBB. Okay. PB, I'll talk about disk PBB. Okay. So yeah, uh, so the next modeling we carried out is using disk PB and disk PBB and disk BB is the standard chapter of the disk model. And disk PBB on the other, other hand is used to uh, model slim accretion disk. So here in this PVB, the temperature, this temperature varies as uh, 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 radius to the power of minus P, and the P parameter is left P. So if it if this P parameter takes the value of 0.75, it is nothing but the standard accretion disk, which is this PV. But if it takes any value less than that, uh, that means it is representing the slim disk. So that is exactly what we saw in our modeling. Uh, so yeah, it, uh, it fitted very well with all of the spectrum for all three sources, and we saw that the thermal disk temperature that is from the disk BB was around 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 KV. And the, uh, the hot disk, which is disk PVB, we saw it around 1 to 2 KV. And uh, the P parameter, we saw uh, it was around 0 0.5 to 0 0.58, which means it is representing a slim disk. Okay, so yeah, this is how the spectrum looks like. Uh, so we can see that the disk B, okay, disk BB is fitting for the lower energy and disk PVB is fitting for the higher energy. Now, uh, one other property which is common to all three, the uh, the last three sources, N33, NGC, and IC10, is that all of them are eclipse, eclipsing sources, which means it's, it has a very high inclination angle. So every time it orbits, the companion is actually blocking the accretion disk, and some of the radiation is getting obscured. So that we can see here in the XMM Newton light curve that are plotted. So clearly, there is a dip in uh, all of the light curves. And uh, in the bottom panel, I've plotted the hardness ratio for this. Uh, 
uh, light curve and we can see that just during the eclipse the hardness ratio is showing an increasing pattern and going back to normal once it exits the uh, eclipse in all three of the sources. We also compared the spectrum of the eclipse one uh, with the non-eclipse spectrum and we saw that uh, while uh, eclipse non-eclipse spectrum can be modeled very well with discrete Gauss and power law. So the Gauss here is used to fit uh, uh, emission line that we uh, residual which we saw around 0.9 kV which is assumed to be coming from the stellar wind. Uh, and yeah, uh, so a non-thermal, non-eclipse spectrum, we could fit it with uh, discrete Gauss and power law, but spectra, uh, the eclipse one, we saw that the discrete and Gauss both are vanishing and we can fit it just with the power law model. Um, okay, now based on all of the spectral results, we kind of, uh, we wanted to draw a general picture of how the accretion depth is in this zone because it's it's not uh, all in the, the three sources, because it's not really uh, matching the standard accretion, uh, standard components that we see in a typical black hole experimentally. So um, first thing we saw is, as I said, we, we saw two thermal components in the spectrum, soft and hard. So the soft component, we assume that it is coming from a cool standard accretion disk, and the hard component is coming from a hot apocalyptic adversion dominated slim disk. Um, so this picture is very similar to this. These, are, these components are very, very similar to the ones you see in a typical black hole ULX. But uh, the explanation that is given for, or the inference that is given for the ULX is that uh, it has a puffed up disk, and uh, that is what is causing the uh, emission of the hot optically thick slim disk. Uh, whereas uh, the um, standard accretion disk is imitated by the disk wind. If, uh, the disk, uh, so the puffed up disk is actually giving out the outflow and in the form of disk wind, and it is scattering down some of the radiation from the disk, and that is actually we see it as a standard accretion disk in ULS. But that is not really applicable here because one thing we have we have not observed any signature of disk wind in these sources, and disk wind is sort of uh, thought to be a signature of a super heating accretion, right? So, but that is not really seen in our sources. So, but then. Uh, from the eclipse uh, observations, we saw that, uh, as I mentioned, whenever there is eclipse, there is the absence of uh, soft disk, soft standard accretion disk, which means um, it has the standard accretion disk has to be present in the outer accretion disk rather than coming from the wind. So that it, every time it eclipses, it has to get obscured. And uh, we also see non-zero flux during eclipse, which means whatever is emitting during eclipse, is must, it must be an extended source. And we also see an increased HR hardness ratio during the day, which means that this extended object must be the uh, the region which is emitting the hot or uh, the hard radiations. In our case, which is nothing but uh, the slim disk. So based on all of these things, we uh, the general uh, picture that we get is there is a slim disk present in the inner accretion disk, which is vertically extended, and it is surrounded by a standard cooler uh, standard accretion disk in the outer part of the uh, accretion disk. So, um, yeah, so then we also, yeah, okay. We also carried out continuum fitting of all three of these extragalactic black hole X-ray money in order to estimate its physical parameters. So, so continuum fitting is nothing but you use a relativistic accretion disk model in, to fit a, a soft state spectrum and then uh, estimate the physical parameter, which is spin and mass. So, uh, for LMC X1 and X3, we used the uh, model Kirby V uh, in order to do this and we estimated the spin of both of these black holes. In case of the other three sources, uh, now the parameter is actually very well uh, constrained. So we had to uh, we had we had taken a uh, range of values of for the spin and inclination angle, and uh, we use uh, instead of curve we here we use the uh, relativistic thin accretion disk model, which is NIMBYH, and uh, yeah, from this we were able to <laughs> estimate the range of mass for these uh, three black holes, which turned out to be around these values. Now to summarize uh, uh, the work that we have done, so uh, as I mentioned, the spectrum of LMC X1 and X2 can be very well defined using the standard accretion disk picture that it has a standard accretion disk and a confidence component, but we cannot really use that explanation for the other three sources, but rather we see two thermal components in these sources. Uh, so, but we did, uh, I did read, uh, there, are, there were some reports on LMC X1 behaving just like a steep power law. Uh, so, uh, but in any of our observation, we did not do it. So we, I did, a, a, so what I did is I obtained um, HMM Newton observation in which the luminosity was higher than what we have observed. That was around 0.28 times the luminosity. 
and when when I saw that, it was actually very similar to the spectrum of the other three sources. That it was like a steep power law, and when I modeled with the slim disk model, it was fitting very well with the peak parameter less than 0.75, which means LMC X1 is behaving like a standard efficient disk in the moderately high luminosity. But when the luminosity is further increasing, its its spectrum is getting broader, and it it can be uh, it is imitating just like uh, just like the other three sources, it's imitating the spectrum of the ULS. Uh, and yeah, and uh, we okay. So uh, to compare all of the five sources, LMC X three is very different from the other three sources because LMC because uh, it has Rosho uh, accretion and it, it is LMXP and it has hard state transition. All these properties are very different, which are not seen in the other three other four sources. And uh, this is rather similar to LMC X three is rather similar to the galactic black hole X X ray binaries. Especially its properties lies in between that of a transient and a uh, um, persistent ones. Um, other three, other four sources, on the other hand, they uh, have the property which are very similar to a dual let like I said. So clearly, we do not know much. We still need to study um, these sources. Probably with the uh, high resolution spectral instruments, we can resolve the one which I said that 0.9 emission uh, emission line, with, which I see, which we see in uh, especially in NGP and IC10. We do not know the origin of it right now. We assume that it is coming from the stellar wind. But probably the high resolution instrument, if you see that it is actually coming from the disk, then we can say that, okay, there is a disk wind in this system, then we can um, know more about these sources. Yeah. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Guru. Quick question. Sorry, very nice job. Um, so this is about M thirty three X seven. It's a you know it's sort of a very bright stellar companion, right? So you can actually follow it spectroscopically. Uh, so and that can give you an estimate for the black hole mass, assuming the nature of the star and all that. Is the estimate sort of consistent with that? Uh, are you talking about the companion? No, no, no. Yeah, I mean you can follow the spectral line of the companion to get an estimate for the you know, yes. the mass of the black hole. Yes, that has been done. Yes. Now, so your estimates from the X-ray yes, is consistent. It's consistent. Yes. I had the impression that it was much smaller error bar coming from the... Yeah, know, that is actually stand. very well constrained. That's what I thought. Study, yeah. yeah, but we got a very uh, large... Uh, okay. Um, hi, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I just was confused because you mentioned a couple of times 0.9 kV as the emission feature, and then you are associating it with a disk wind. So how should I mean how an emission feature is being associated with a disk wind in these systems? Wait, uh, I am saying that because it's usually seen in dual lenses, the 0.9 emission uh, line. Is it emission or absorption? Because just I think it's the, uh, both emission and uh, because it cannot be resolved, we cannot really say uh, what the emission line it is. There, there are papers that are saying it's a, uh, combi uh, it's a combination of different emission lines and even the absorption lines, which is I'm talking about so are there Chandra spectra and other observations with the high resolution spectra for these sources? Yeah, uh, or for ULX, where you're talking about like an emission feature. I think for ULX, it is there, but I'm not really broad. It's yeah, it's broad. broad. <coughs> for ULX, it is there, uh, but for these sources, it's not there. So they say that it's from the stellar winds for now, but uh, yeah. So, is it this twin? It's a twin. No, 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 Type of Means you said one is for low slope overflow, one is for uh, from wind, stellar yes. wind. So, how do you decide? The question is, how do you decide that this for is example, an overflow and this is a, a wind fed Okay. Uh, one thing is, uh, as I said, uh, is um, the type of uh, binary, right? Usually in the high mass X-ray binaries, it is stellar winds because it has the, the companion is huge and it's giving up the stellar winds. And uh, in in all of the LMXPs, it's usually the um, 
the smaller uh, companion sources. So it has to, that transmission is happening, it has happened through the Roche Bowl. So, and also, I think it's also related to luminosity and uh, accretion, how big the accretion disk is. In the Roche Bowl overflow, it is usually, uh, we see a bigger accretion disk. And in uh, stellar winds, whichever, is, uh, whichever the source has stellar winds, it, it must have a smaller uh, accretion disk. And one more question, can I ask one then you have to sacrifice IT. That's not Yeah, already already people are lining up. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a question. Yeah, yeah. So all five sources dynamical estimates are available? No, not for the last one. I see the next one. Other is there? But other four you have dynamical estimates available. Yeah. Uh, but the the bottom two one, the uh, one and those are more priority. Oh, fine. That's okay. So there is a lot of controversy where this uh, emission line is actually coming. No, I'm not talking about the emission line. Yeah. My question is, in general, in general, we see actually around 10 kg or 9 kg. Usually, there is a spectral pressure. Mm -hmm. You see the uh, uh, sort of uh, falling of the spectra around 9 kg. Yes. Most yeah. of the units. But none of your source actually shows that character. Does it have any relation with the high mass scale binary dualogs or black hole in dualogs? Because in the global population, you see that state pattern. Okay. Uh, so, uh, actually, the connection of magnetic relays is just based on the component that I'm seeing. Oh, okay. And even the luminosity is on the higher end, right? It's point, the highest I'm seeing is 0.76 and the LED side. So, which is closer to the LED side. So, that's how the I know. So, that's the connection. Okay. Let's thanks, Bhuvana. The last speaker before IT is Kriyas. He will speak about the effect on fluid composition on the bondy wild attrition flow. Hello, everyone. So, I will be talking about my work. This is the impact of the full composition on the polymer radiation group. So, the very first talk uh, of the system is talked about the polymer radiation equation. So, if there is a point mass which is moving to a gas cloud, so how it will going? It is going to accrete the material from its surrounding. So, this was the question which Bondi Hill and Peterson studied. So it was started by Hoyle and Peterson in 1939, where they, they studied the hydrodynamical equation of interstellar medium. And they didn't consider the self gravity of those clouds, and also they didn't consider the pressure effects in their model. And the underlying assumption was that if, if there is any heat generated in the system, that would be radiated away very rapidly. So that's why the temperature of the gas would be very low. And then in 1944, Bondi and Hoyle extended this work to include the pressure effect. And in 1952, Bondi studied the spherical equation for a stationary star. So there has been some numerical study of Bondi Hall equation, like in 1994 in a series of papers, Rupert studied the hydrodynamical equation equation for the Newtonian case, where they studied that how the mass equation is going to become if you consider the numerically the equator of different sizes and if you consider the equator you moving with different mass numbers or if you consider it to be stationary. And then there are some techniques like a relative speech of the HL equation in presence of some density gradient instead of the uniform uh, cloud and uh, some other like in presence of some small gradient bodies. And recently there was a paper by Carl Decker in 2023 where they and did the 3D DRV distribution and showed that there could be uh, launching outlet by equation with the black hole. So 
what we are studying is that what would be the effect of the composition on the nature efficient flow in the existing phase. So now the equations which we need to study we need to study for the execution flow, they basically require a closer relation because the number of equations are less than the number of variables. So this closer relation is known as the equation of the shape, which would be the relation between thermodynamic variables. And now in astrophysical scenario, the temperature can change by a few orders of magnitude. So that's why we need a equation of state which has which should have information of the temperature. So we are using a realistically correct CR equation of state which has the information of temperature in terms of theta. And also <coughs> whether a flow is anti-relativistic or not, it will depend on the temperature as well as for depending on the mass of the constraint particles. So the lower mass particle will become at lower temperature, but higher mass particle will become relativistic at higher temperature. So that's why computation is also important for the flow to become realistic or not. So we are using this equation of state, which is a realistically correct equation of state, and it has the both the information of temperature and the composition of the flow. So now this is the set, uh, our numerical setup. So we are using a theoretic principle to uh, in, and existing excellent coordinate system. And we are using geometric units in our analysis. So our domain is extended up to 1500 particle radius in the R direction, and it is covering 3000 particle radius in the Z direction, starting from the minus 700 in the at lower boundary. And uh, it, it is having a resolution of two particle radius. And also we ensured that the domain, domain was large enough that there are not any boundary effects coming from the coming into the system. And then we start from a, a numerical set, uh, domain, which is initially filled with low density medium. And then a, a super smooth is coming from the downstream energy into the domain with, with a velocity V star and Mach number M infinity. And there's the absorbing inner boundary condition, which is uh, like a scene by uh, placing, by putting the velocity to be zero and density and pressure to uh, value. So that is when uh, mimicking uh, absorbing boundary. So that means any material that's put inside this thing, it will not come out from there. And also there is a detector placed on the cells next to the thing, which will allow us to calculate the energy with the mass efficient rate. So now these are the results for three models, which are having same composition parameter, but three different mass numbers, 1.5, 2, and 6. And uh, upper panel is showing the movie of the density control, and the lower panel is showing the evolution of the corresponding you know, mass equation rates, which are normalized with respect to the highly dynamic equation rate for three different mass numbers. So we can see here that the in the if, when the flow is achieving the quasi steady state, then the equation rates are between approximately constant. This is the final snapshot of the uh, these three models. So we can see where the because of the supersonic flow. The soft current has been developed around the equator, and the, uh, the high mass number is corresponding to the Navier Macphone. And we have fixed the velocity of the star to be the velocity of the uh, flow to be same, and varied the Mach number. So the high mass number is corresponding to the lower sound rate, so that is leading to high equation rate. Now these are the results for three different models. Now we have kept the uh, Mach number to be same. And we have varied the composition parameters at three different values. Now here the white solid lines are showing the spin lines. So and the bottom panel is showing the evolution of the mass accretion rate. And here we can uh, observe that the mass accretion rate is low for the purely electronic flows, the equal to zero case compared to the other cases. This is the final uh, snapshot of this. Uh, three models. So we can see that some of the spin lines are going into the uh, entering into the equator and some of the streamlines are leaving the domain. So it will depend whether the impact parameter of those streamlines are less than the equation radius or greater than the equation radius. And also the equation radius is low for the purely electronic flows in particular purposes. This, this is the uh, mass accretion rate for uh, with many more composition parameters. So we can observe here that the uh, equation rate is low in all the three different mass numbers uh, in all three panels, and it is peaking for 0 0.0 to 0 0.5 in all three cases. Now, if we consider a typical example, uh, if we keep it to uh, 10 solar mass black hole, then this quasi steady state would be achieved in few seconds. 
and uh, if the density ambient density is around 10 to 5 atom per cc, then uh, if the if mass of the crater has to be increased by 10 percent, then it would require a much larger time, like around 10 to 10 degrees. What is the infinity here in the presence? The M infinity is the uh, mass number of the inflow which is coming into the room from the downside of it. Now, this is the mass equation that for all the models when the flow has assumed the quality series state. So, we can see that the for, uh, equation is speaking for some uh, intermediate value of Z between 0.5 to 0.7, and it is low for the electron proton flow also, and it is much lower for the electron proton flow. So, if you look at the uh, uh, variation of the dimensionless temperature, theta of the flow, which is Basically, the comp competition between the thermal energy plus the rest mass energy, then the higher value of theta here for the size of the zero case is showing that the thermal energy is more dominating in that region. So, which is uh, leading to lower mass equation rate for the thermal mm -hmm. These are the conclusions that we can introduce the basic morphology of the pH equation, where as the person flow would be captured. The peak which is the activation radius where X streamline impact parameter of the streamlines are less than the activation radius. And then we investigated this case for uh, strong gravity and the distribution correct equation of state. And we observed that the mass activation rate is depending on the composition of the flow, so that it is purely electronic or intermediate value of the Thank you for the Thanks, Pierre. Question. Question. Very nice talk, and I'm curious to just to know it's nothing like, uh, like uh, in what kind of situation we can expect such pure electronic flow or like the intermediate flow. What kind of physical scenario we can think of? So these uh, equation models could be used to study like if there is some uh, still wind supply from inner uh, mass X-ray binding and other companion is operating from that scenario. So if there is some, uh, if there could be some intermediate uh, values of, uh, means there could be mixture of electron proton flow and electron positron flow. There could be some pair plasma. And, uh, and then if you know, that one, uh, if one compact object is activating from the stellar wind of the other companion star. Yeah, I think uh, we can talk later. Any other question? I have another question. Open the other one. Three technical questions. So, did you have any alternate of quantifying this streamline interaction? Maybe just so streamlines are very not very accurate way to quantify something, but they are still integrated lines. So do you have any other method to quantify it, or do you find just the streamlines? The streamline changing the slide ten, slide ten, slide nine or ten nine. Thank you. That where the streamlines are changing their direction. No, we the, haven't quantified the equation radius for these models. We are only showing that some of the streamlines are going into the crater and some of them are leaving. So it will depend whether the impact parameter is less than the radius of the crater. So we are not quantifying those equation radius. Oh, okay. Show me. Yeah. Uh, so you can say that the activation rate depends on composition. So physically, how does it mean? I mean, you have different composition and they are activated I mean, differently. So, what physical quantity is actually playing the role of deciding the activation rate? So, uh, this type of model could be used to study the means if you talk about the growth of the black hole. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, I showed that what means uh, how the black hole, uh, in what time the, uh, the black hole will be increased by 10 percent. So, this equation rate could, means this growth will depend whether it is activated with higher value or not. And typically, if you particularly uh, talk about the boundary well activation, activation is pretty low. Yeah, in these cases, it is very low. So, what is the sort of relative change you expect in the change in the activation rate? Sir, 
sir, because depending on the composition, because we are uh, here, we are taking a much shorter flow in these cases, so that the replication rate is much lower. But if we take a colder flow, then in those cases, the replication rate would be much higher. But the colder flow to, means to handle those colder flows numerically, it is uh, slightly complete, uh, computationally expensive because the uh, equation radius would be much, much larger, yeah. much, much larger. So, so to and if I so, just can interject yeah, here. Yeah. So basically, this is uh, to answer your question. It is generally understood uh, in the community that it does not matter what kind of uh, gas you take uh, uh, until unless you put radiation there. Okay, what we are showing here, even if you don't take radiation, whether you take an electron positron flow or you take an some amount of variance, the flow structure changes. Okay, the flow structure will change dramatically if you actually do a proper accretion solution with subsonic injection and so on. Okay, so that's number one. And here, actually, in this particular thing, what we were interested in was to see, see, uh, what LIGO has told us, there are isolated black holes, right? We don't see it. So my question is, when can we see it? Okay, so if you have, you have created a black hole, isolated black hole, so it is moving through a medium. Okay, so then when can we see it? Okay, is there any situation where we can see it? So he has done few more things, which I don't know why he did not show it. So, so I just told him that let's say there is a there is a wind like this going on. Okay, some somewhere some wind is coming, and this black hole is going like this. So then there is a you are creating a sort of angular momentum already. Here it's taking zero angular momentum. So can you generate a disk-like structure or not? Okay, once you can uh, uh, generate disk-like structure need not be a very efficient uh, accretion disk. Then it can radiate and its radiation will be above the threshold of our detectors. Okay. As of now, he's not concluded his study, but as of now, it looks like he can't. If that is the case, then at least 5 to 10% of the dark matter problem can be explained by these you know, isolated black holes. But there may be strong lensing constraint, right? Isolated black holes. Uh, yeah, but even with this uh, lensing, lensing, you have not been able to uh, find these fifty solar mass black holes. That is just a bias, so, most likely, isn't it? I mean, they the lensing things are around eight solar mass, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, Hubble study. Yes, yes, yes. So what I'm trying to say is, even with this lensing, because lensing is electromagnetic lensing, right? We did not predict the, that there will be so many, you know, 30 solar mass black holes, 50 solar mass black holes. That's the very the fact that there, system. sorry, the very fact that is there. Okay. So my question is that if we have these, all these isolated black holes, is there a scenario? Because see, he injected with 10 to the power 5, uh, you know, protons, uh, ambient medium, which is very high. Okay. Even in this uh, relatively much denser environment, the the he did not also show the Bremsstrahlung emission he computed from uh, from this. The Bremsstrahlung emission is very very low. Okay, it's be below the detector level. Okay, so so again the the study is not completed, <laughs> but the I mean, can this these kind of studies confirm us? portion of the dark matter problem only. It will not, of course, be the entire uh, dark matter. What is that? So that's what the target is. Yes. Okay, so uh, I think the chairman has a privilege to ask the last question. <laughs> so I see that there is a point it's respecting uh, the streamlines are not following that point. What is this? Yeah, In all, that point, all so this point, why the streamlines are this? Uh, no, what happened? <laughs> Streamlines are avoiding this point. Uh, what is this point? Uh, the velocity would be very much low in that case. So the streamlines are calculated. No, what is the special about that point? No, that particular point where every snapshot you have that. Point. The streamlines are avoiding that point. So, is it a plotting error? No, no. It would be because the velocity is uh, very much low. And then okay. the uh, routines which are integrating, they, they are basically integrating the 
streamlined solution. So they are not going not there. Okay, by the time he has calculated, it's a very it is so slow the uh, the velocity, and these velocities are much higher. So by the time he's calculating, it has already completed that. It's still uh, no, I think it is not. You see, around this point, all the curves has a very uh, smooth higher gra gra uh, gradients. First derivative, second derivative, all are very smooth. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you won't get these smooth mm -hmm. curves. So if it is, if this this speed is actually slower here, the time in which he's computing it, it has not completed, had gone up to there. Okay. No, that is fine. But you see, if you zoom this region, all the curves are with very high. Which uh, one are uh, talking here or this one? No, no. This is this. Okay, point. okay, okay. So can you, can you zoom in? So yeah. this point, I mean, something That's is happening. Point. It is avoiding that point. Yeah. Oh, this is the cusp, right? This is the cusp. The cusps will be re the regions where you know it's 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 sort of a kind of a subtle point. Yeah, exactly. so they will exactly they will, <laughs> they will they will they will avoid it. Yeah, yeah. This is a subtle point. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now, I was thinking about this. No, 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 no. This is... Okay, so let's thank all the speakers for the first session. We have another session after IT. I think we come back in eleven thirty. What is going now? Can we make it out 11.30? Yes, I can. In 20, 20 minutes, I think we can come back.
Uh, in this session, we have five talks, and the first talk is uh, uh, Signature of Compact Objects on Accretion Flow and Emission Spectrum. Uh, Shilpa will speak about it. Yeah. So, hello everyone, I am Shilpa. So, could it be the Can we have the mic? Yes. So, I can speak loudly, maybe. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is because of here. But, uh, that, um, uh, this is because live, you know, live, 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 so I'm basically going to talk about on the imprint of yeah, imprint of the central object on the solution and emission spectra. <laughs> so uh, by central object, I'm basically going to talk about uh, compact objects only. So compact objects are white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. So, they are grouped together into this class of astrophysical objects called compact objects mainly because they share some basic common features. Firstly, they represent the end stages of the stellar evolution and second is their extreme small size. So, which is quantified using a ratio called the compactness ratio which is the mass of the star to the radius of the star. So, based on this compactness ratio, white dwarf is the least compact followed by neutron star and then black hole. So, because of this extreme compactness ratio, these objects exhibit a phenomena called accretion, which is actually the accumulation of matter from the surrounding medium due to the gravitational potential energy of this object. So, yeah. So, in the first half of my talk, I will be basically giving a brief overview or the brief observational differences between these three types of objects and then uh, in the second half of my talk, I will be basically discussing about the complex uh, spectral analysis of this system. So, that is the most sophisticated and complicated part. So, uh, let me start initially with the basic part, which uh, differentiates between these three types of objects. First is the compactness ratio, as I discussed. So, uh, these three objects have different compactness ratios. So, if a mass small m <coughs> falls onto a star of capital mass m and radius r star, then del E is the energy that is released due to accretion. So here you can see that the compactness ratio comes. So more the compactness ratio, more would be the efficiency with which the gravitational potential energy of the matter will be converted into radiation. So with increasing compactness ratio, it will be increasingly luminous. So this is a basic uh, differentiating factor between these three objects. So if we define L accretion as the accretion luminosity, which is obtained when all the kinetic energy of the infalling matter is given up at the radius r star. That is the radius of the object, the surface of the object. Then this is the accretion luminosity. So as an order of magnitude estimate, we can see for a white dwarf and neutron star, for typical values of the mass and the radius of the system, we can see that the neutron star is obviously more luminous because of the increase in the compactness ratio. But unfortunately, black hole doesn't have any hard surface. 
and uh, the matter that is admitted, it is uh, whether it is lost, whether it is made, nothing comes out of the black hole. So what happens there is that we limit the efficient luminosity by an efficiency factor, uh, which is eta. And if we manipulate this uh, equation, we get something like this, eta m dot c square. So an order of magnitude estimates, as we can see, is that for a failure mass black hole, that is for a, for a one solar mass black hole, uh, we have a 10 to the power 37 hours per second. Uh, luminosity, but since it is limited by an efficiency factor of eta, which uh, uh, as Shomi said, it could be like 10 percent. So we can see that it comes around 10 to the 36, which is actually similar to a neutron star. So it's actually difficult to differentiate observationally on the basis of luminosity whether it is a neutron star or black hole if the it is a scalar mass black hole. But as we increase the mass of the black hole to around 10 to the power 9. Uh, what we get is an AGM, means the luminosity has increased a lot. So, in terms of luminosity, so neutron star is uh, and black hole almost have the same luminosity, but with increase in black hole mass, the luminosity has increased. Further complexity arises when we have a spinning black hole. So, for a spinning black hole, which is one uh, has a spin parameter of A star, then what happens to the event horizon is that. With the increase in spin parameter, the event horizon is actually dragged to a region less than the Schwarzschild radius. Because of which, this accretion luminosity, which is an inverse of the radius, increases. So, lower the radius, more would be the luminosity. So, the most luminous would be a spinning black hole, and uh, obviously, I, I have a higher mass. So, apart from this compactness ratio, uh, things which complicate these uh, compact objects are magnetic fields because magnetic fields. If present, they will dictate the type of accretion flow topology around the system. So, in the presence of magnetic fields, like here we can see a dipolar magnetic field around this object. So, accretion takes place in the form of a disk up to a certain radius. Here we can see after which, what happens is that matter is strictly following the field line until it reaches the poles of the star. So, in case of a white dwarf, which is low, when the magnetic field is lower, you can see the magnetic spheric radius is here. Why? For a neutron star whose magnetic field is larger, so what happens is that for a higher magnetic field, the um, accretion is truncated at a higher radius, means it is halted well uh, outside. And uh, for black holes, it does, it does not have any uh, hard surface, defined hard surface, so we don't know how the magnetic field topology around the black hole would look like, but we know that there are magnetic fields around the black hole which will, which power jets and uh, things like that. So, since my talk is basically confined to accretion flows, I won't get into the jet physics. So, our motivation is that we need to solve the full set of conservation equations to get a, uh, to know uh, what are the differences between these types of objects. And we need to do spectral analysis of the flows. That is, we need to have a very good knowledge of the radiative processes. And if there are any distinct signatures of the central object on the emission spectrum. So this actually means that we need to solve these types of uh, equations. That is a time-dependent, multidimensional, relativistic, magnetic hydrodynamic equation, which is coupled with radiative transfer. And which actually sounds difficult and is difficult. But uh, so we uh, what we take uh, what we use is some approximations. With uh, in some cases we do not take the magnetic field, or in some cases we take magnetic field but do not uh, take the relativistic field. So these are all done mainly to get a complete uh, picture of the system. And uh, yeah, but uh, given the uh, advances in the numerical resources, computational resources, this type of uh, solving the whole equation is now getting possible. So <coughs> first I will cover the how the how to get a uh, how to solve the full set of conservation equations and get a uh, information of the accretion flow. So, so I won't go into the equations and I will just name them. So the basic equations that need to be solved to model an accretion flow is the continuity equation the momentum and the energy yeah. equation. And in the presence of magnetic field, we have an another equation, which is the induction equation. And all these 
is closed using an equation of state. Now, uh, equation of state is uh, tricky in the sense that uh, very far away, so this is a central object and this is a cross section of the accretion flow. So very far away, matter is assumed to be non relativistic because it is cold and everything, and near it is relativistic because matter has a higher thermal energy. So the adiabatic index will be 5 by 3 outside and nearer it is 4 by 3 inside. So uh, there won't be a sharp uh, change. Uh, to avoid this sharp change in this uh, adiabatic index, we, what we use is a relativistic equation of state uh, for transrelativistic flows, which was given by Dr. Badan in 2009, which actually pre-H discussed in this talk. So it has a variable adiabatic index. So there is a smooth continuous change from of the adiabatic index from 5 by 3 to 4 by 3. Also an important thing is that relativistic and non-relativistic actually means that the thermal energy should be greater than the rest mass energy if it is relativistic. So Kp by mc square is greater than 1. So not only the temperature but also, also the mass of the species is important to know whether the matter is relativistic or not. So Chattabhadan new equation of state has this information of uh, multi-species flow as well. So we have used this here equation of state. So what uh, a cross-section view of an accretion disk looks like is this, with the central uh, object, and the accretion takes place in this direction. So what we do is that at every radius r, we solve all these equations, this continuity, momentum, and everything. Assuming there are different radiative processes, pair production, as well as annihilation. Okay. So these are the typical solutions which we get, which uh, Shomi also showed. So in few cases, <laughs> we will get uh, solutions which passes through single sonic points. So this is a Mach number, which is the ratio of the velocity by some step, and this is the radius. So since we are solving the equations at each, each radius, we will get a value of the Mach number. So um, from wherever we start integrate. So uh, like few solutions we can see passes through outer sonic point, few through inner. So inner and outer is named because of its distance from the central object. So this is the inner sonic point, this is the outer sonic point. And few harbors shock as well. So it passes through the outer sonic point, uh, encounters a short transition and then again uh, becomes super smooth after passing through the inner sonic point. So in the case of a shock, the topology <laughs> looks something like this. So the matter is puffed up because of the increase in number density uh, here. So now coming to the uh, main part of the talk, which is the spectral analysis of the flows. So the spectral analysis, uh, before going to that, uh, so there should be some distinct differentiating factor, uh, which will help us in uh, selecting the type of uh, spectral analysis we are going to do. First, we need to know what are the type of surfaces. So like neutron star and black hole, it has a hard surface. While a black hole doesn't have any hard surface. So we should remember that. And the second is the temperature of the species. So the temperature of the species is important mainly because so temperature of the species is the uh, this fluid has uh, electrons and protons. Since hydrogen is the most abundant element and ionized plasma would consist of protons and electrons. So uh, these protons and electrons, so if uh, the time scales, so we need to compare the time scale. So in fault time scale is the time scale in which the matter <laughs> falls into the central object. So if that time scale is long, then the Coulomb coupling time scale. Coulomb coupling time scale is the time scale in which this electron and proton interact and settle down into a single temperature distribution. So if, so if protons and electrons are given sufficient time, that is the in fault time scales are large, what they will do is they will interact and settle down into a single temperature, like T. And if they are not, like uh, the system is not giving electrons and protons sufficient time to interact. What they will do is, they will follow their two different temperature distributions. Uh, also, uh, the reasons why a flow is of two temperatures, uh, and it is actually two temperature flows are actually generally to measure, mainly because the mass of the species are different, and uh, electrons are the main radiator. So it is expected that the electron temperature should be different from the protons. But uh, <laughs> as we can see that there is a problem of degeneracy which is present in two temperature flows. 
because as you I have uh, discussed the equations that the equation um, set of equations is same for one temperature as well as two temperature but we have an additional variable which is the temperature but we do not have any additional equation which can actually constrain this two temperature at any boundary uh, so more majority of the works that have been done uh, even in the uh, EHT, people have what they did is that uh, they parameterize the proton and electron temperature to certain constant values or have uh, assumed some relation between the proton and electron. And this degeneracy is irrespective of the type of central object. So whether be it neutron star or black hole, this degeneracy exists. And it is an intrinsic problem of the two temperature region. So uh, what we had proposed um, is an entropy accretion rate form which actually helped us remove this degeneracy. So out of all the solutions or out of all the degenerate solutions which we obtained for a given set of constants of motion, this entropy actually helped us to select a unique solution out of all the degenerate solutions because second law of thermodynamics states that nature prefers a solution with a maximum entropy. So we have validated this entropy accretion rate formula in neutron stars as well as black holes. Uh, so basically, uh, I will be uh, more focused on uh, discussing the work on black holes in both same temperature as well as two temperatures. So work has been done in one temperature mainly because there is a serious degeneracy problem which exists in two temperature region. Okay. So people, uh, so it is actually useful that uh, to get a brief overview of the type of solution, which is easy to actually get the solution. So, yeah, this is a given constant of motion and these are the different types of solutions which exist for the same constant of motion. And these are the different spectra. But we need to, like, select what is the unique solution, what is the unique spectrum given this uh, solar mass, uh, black hole mass and accretion rate. So, using the entropy accretion rate formula, uh, we actually constrain the degeneracy and for this given constant of motion, this is the solution and this is the spectrum. And these are the typical uh, 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 flow parameters, like this is the velocity, these are the two different temperatures. And since we have used uh, uh, the Chotobad and mu equation of state, we can see that the adiabatic indices are also different for the two different temperatures. The main, uh, two different species, mainly because uh, they, apart from depending on the temperature, it also depends on the masses. And viscosity, as we can see, this is angular momentum. Viscosity is efficiently transporting the angular momentum outwards. And this is the corresponding spectrum. So, um, now if I plot the change in spectrum with black hole mass so and accretion rate. So, the CDR, CDR and CSR. Uh, okay, so these are the compromised brainstorm and compromised synchrotron. Okay. So, this is a synchrotron, this is a brainstorm, and these are their uh, inverse means compromised portion. So this is a luminosity versus accretion rate plot and plotted for different black hole masses k tends to a six. So for a given accretion rate, if I change the black hole mass, we can see that the spectrum changes, that is the luminosity increases, but the spectral index, which is defined by this power law portion, uh, doesn't change much, but the bandwidth increases. So for a higher mass black hole, there is actually enough photons which we can get in the radio region. And for a given solar mass, if we change the accretion rate, we can see that the bandwidth doesn't increase much, but the spectral index changes mainly because of the increase in inverse compromisation, giving uh, rise to hard, uh, more hard photons. And if we plot the efficiency versus accretion rate, so efficiency, as I uh, said before, it is 10%, uh, but it is not necessarily 10%. And it can be with the accretion rate. Like for very low accretion rate, the efficiency is also lower. And, uh, but it doesn't change much with the change in black hole mass. <clears throat> and uh, uh, when I tried to see whether there is any signature of shock, uh, I couldn't find any actual signature of shock in this type of systems. Uh, so what I did is that, uh, I, I need uh, two more minutes. <laughs> there is a signature present. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we found it in curved black holes. So we extended uh, the work from Schwarzschild to curved black holes to check whether there is any signature because the event horizon is dragged inwards and more exotic processes actually happen near the event horizon. 
So here no dependence is present since we are doing the work in the one temperature regime. And uh, as we can see from Schwarzschild to uh, high spinning black holes, the topology of the accretion actually changes for the same set of constants for motion. And uh, yeah, if we see the cross-sectional view for a shock, there are jumps. So let me see. Yeah. So this is a signature. Uh, yeah. So for increasing, like uh, this is for uh, a Schwarzschild black hole, this 0, 0.0 spin. And as we increase the spin, the luminosity increases. So, so this blue one is for 0.99 and this dotted line is the annihilation line. So what happens is that uh, at every radius, I have emission like Bremsen and synchrotron and their compromised parts. These photons interact, produce pairs and these pairs again annihilate to give this annihilation line. So in far black holes, we can see there is a distinct annihilation line present and uh, when we actually investigated the number of pairs which is giving these annihilation lines, we can see that the number of pairs which is parameterized by xi, which is the number of proton to the number of electrons. So as we increase the number of pairs in the system, this electron number will increase and xi will decrease. So more decrease in xi, more number of pairs in the system. So most of the pairs are produced for very uh, high spinning black holes and even nearer to the black hole. So, uh, we want to uh, know what are the different, uh, from where the signature is coming. So, we actually divided uh, the solution into different regions and plotted the corresponding spectrum for a Schwarzschild and for a spinning black hole. And this box is for the annihilation line. So, very far away from 100 to 1000, since there is no pairs, the annihilation line is almost absent. But as we uh, move nearer to the black hole. In the red portion, we can see the animation line is coming. And as we move nearer and nearer, we can see that the for a Schwarzschild case, the animation line is not present. But for the spinning black hole, the animation line has come. And from very near to the black hole, the animation line is the maximum. So this black one is the uh, total spectrum. This is my last slide, which is, yeah, I got a uh, even shock signature uh, in this type of black hole. So, uh, if the solution actually uh, passed to the outer sonic point, is this red curve, and if it passed through a shock for the same constant of motion, we can see that there is a distinct change in the uh, luminosity, as well as there is a, uh, for a shock solution, there is a distinct annihilation line present. So, uh, this work is actually under progress, and uh, we need to investigate further. Uh, to properly conclude, but yeah, so these are the my conclusions that Schwarzschild uh, black holes, uh, as far as I've studied, it doesn't have any uh, specific signature, but we need to um, explore other radiative processes like fine production if it has any signature. And for black holes, yes, it has a distinct annihilation signature, and for very high spinning black holes, and even shock solutions also have a signature. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Edward. Very quick question, one question. Yeah. Okay. Silpa, you mentioned uh, that for neutron star, uh, you consider single temperature, and you said that some time scale issue is there. But for neutron star and black hole, the difference is that neutron star is uh, uh, neutron star radius is three social radius, black hole radius is just one social radius. So uh, how come this time scale? The, no, I, for I didn't tell anything. I, 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 I thought that you said uh, single temperature for neutron star and no, no, no. two temperature for... Yes, for both cases, we can work on single temperature as well as two temperature for any type of object. Okay, so for neutron star also two temperature solution possible? Yeah, and I, yeah, I published one paper with two okay. temperatures. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, Let's thank Sipan once again. Our next speaker is Hindu. Hindu is Hindu will uh, speak on high soft to low hard state transition in black hole at X-ray binaries with GMR uh, GR image simulations.
Hey everyone, uh, I'm Indu, and first of all, thank the organizers for organizing this conference when I am in India, <laughs> and and then uh, for inviting me uh, to present my recent work. So, yeah, this is. Um, the right one. Right. Yeah. So, no, no, no. I, I want just the pointer. The, the first one. Oh, the top one. one. You have to hold it. Oh. Okay. Thank you. So, <clears throat> okay. So, yeah. So, uh, this is okay. I The title, I think I changed a little bit, but I will be talking the same context uh, that I put in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, the same thing. So, I'm oh, sorry. So yeah, there are lots of discussion about the accretion process and everything. So probably there's no point going in detail of the accretion processes and viscosity and things. So let me go directly to the point that I want to talk about. There are like this uh, RXT E that uh, back in several uh, before several decades did some X-ray scan of the uh, uh, with all sky monitor and then. There for different sources they found these fused X-ray zones uh, like for these all different sources. So there was uh, this, uh, this, this, and you can see that they are in, mostly they are, they are like extra qu quiet, and then we have some extra zone. So we call it an outburst. So this uh, typically this extra binaries and there's so this kind of uh, signatures. <laughs> so uh, the, the theoretical understanding of this is that there are two uh, dominant uh, states. One is uh, this, yeah, I am holding it out. Oh, oh. Okay. Uh, see, there is this one here. The peak is near the softer side of the uh, X-ray, and otherwise the harder side of X-ray. This is the the soft state and hard state. So, how people try to understand this different state is like there is in the high so high state or the very high state, you have an accretion disk that is up to very close to the black hole. Then you have some. Uh, like low density matter, hot matter close to the black hole, then you get in 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 between these two state, and then as you like if the accretion disk that accretion disk, I mean the Keplerian uh, thick disk. That is, if it is very far and the density is very low close to the black hole, then we get a uh, like a this like a hard state. So uh, this is what the typical understanding is. So and they have the different signature of QPOs in different state. If we do a power density spectra of the X-ray light curve, then we get this different kind of uh, uh, peak. That is like there's something that is uh, modulating the X-ray that is coming uh, uh, close to the black holes. So this uh, these are very useful and sometimes easy to under study, but it's difficult to un understand from what kind of processes these things are coming up. So uh, to understand this, all the problem, uh, we devise a simple, uh, a simple, uh, simple like setup uh, that uh, that have I have some thin accretion disk that is the Keplerian disk close to the black hole. If this I follow the Novikov and Thorn the relativistic uh, uh, thin disk model, and we put thin disk up to some place here, and then I drop the density so that I get a smooth. Uh, like distribution, then I inject some uh, subcaplerian matter. Like here, I put uh, this F naught is uh, like if I, I put zero point four or so, so that the the it is coming with some subcaplerian velocity, and I uh, and I put some radiative relevant radiative cooling processes like Bram Stirling, a proton, and the black body the radiative black body uh, cooling that is uh, required because we have a, a optically thick uh, disk here. And we injected some matter from the outside. This is the radial profile. You can see this part is a standard Keplerian disk up to here. Then I exponentially decrease. And this is the density that I'm injecting around up at 400 source cell radius or so. But I, 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 I want to remind that this is a kind of pilot project. This is not a real scale project that is happening in real life. And we put some magnetic field with this uh, loop magnetic field uh, from the outside because we thought that that at the uh, soft state we do not see any dead and things that's why we put this uh, only a hydrostatic <coughs> disk 
and we injected the uh, magnetic field from the outside with the matter. So now we'd like to see, uh, oh, okay. Now, before going to the detail uh, like of the results, let's see what happened if we have only the thin disk and if I evolve it with, so uh, evolve this flow with the GRMSD equations. Like uh, uh, we evolve with, uh, solve the, all the GRMSD equations. Is magnetic field there? Uh, in the thin disk. Yeah, I mean, when you're evolving. Oh, right now I don't have, I'm just trying to show what happened to the initial condition. So it is now HD condition, hydro condition. Hydro condition now. So with hydro condition, if you see, if I uh, do the simulation up to like 50,000 uh, gravitational <laughs> time, the thin disk is kind of more or less thin disk what I did. Just slightly restructured and we get the thin disk. But what happened in the, what I injected from the outside, uh, subcapillarian matter uh, that create a torus shape around the black hole. Of course, this shape of the torus it will depend on the angular momentum with what I am injecting the matter. So we get this kind of hydrostatic torus uh, around the black hole. Now we, we want uh, them to interact. Now I I inject this matter with some magnetic field and ask to interact with the inner thin disk. Now you we see that initially you had the thin disk, then the subcapillarian matter interacted with it, and here are the density profile, and then you can, uh, here are some lines. So this uh, white line is uh, like Bernoulli parameter equal to one, that is giving the unbound solution, and this other line, it shows uh, the flow with higher velocity, like Lorentz factor greater than 1.1 or so. So you see, in this part, we see some reason with relativistic velocity. Of course, in a letter slide, I will show the Lorentz factor and how the change. So the interesting part is that you see a thin disk here with some uh, capillary and angular momentum matter, and then you have some subcapillary matter and which is hot. This is the temperature profile, and that gives like a the two temperature flow, uh, no two component flow that what uh, people talk about. And then with time, they become a, like a, the, the capillarian matter, it diffuses around and some part goes out and again comes back if it is in the Z, in this unbound region, they go out from the system. And then eventually after, uh, like quite after here, I did the simulation up to 49 seconds or so. And, and then we get the, we get the kind of torus kind of situation with very low density. Initially, the, you can see the maximum density is of the order of 10 to the minus 3 or so. This is the normalized density. Initially, it was of the order of 1 or so. So we can uh, say that this was, of course, we started from a soft state thin uh, disk. And then it got to this. We can, because people have this kind of two component <laughs> flow can be uh, attributed to the soft intermediate flow, then we can say this, this uh, we, can, we have not, of course, done the radiative calculation exactly, but this we can say that it's probably the hard intermediate step, then eventually we have very low density hot matter that we can call a hard, uh, like a hard in a hard state. So we can see this condition. And then if we want to see what happened to the accretion rate, so we have, like this different models uh, we fix because uh, how I want to, be, uh, when I'm injecting the matter, I want to reduce the matter that is coming from outside. So it decay with some time scale. So we set different time scale. This is the way angular momentum is decreasing. We decrease the angular momentum as well as the density. If in for one model, it is the same for other model, the density, uh, density time scale is larger, like it, density is dropping slowly. So what we see, uh, this is uh, uh, the this is the accretion rate at five spatial radius. This is with very high resolution. This is uh, low resolution because uh, depend this time scales uh, of the simulation require uh, uh, very high computational cost. That's why I put uh, some low resolution so that I can still work with the system and get some relevant physics. And we see for if uh, this density. Uh, decaying time scale is larger, then we see the accretion rate is increasing uh, in the with time. That means that is not a real signature that we see uh, from the observation of a, a decaying phase of an outburst where the the system is going from the soft state to hard 
hard state. So at the accretion rate or the luminosity drops with the time. So <laughs> we can say that if uh, this two must be equal or maybe the other way around, not this kind of flow can uh, explain this kind of uh, transitions. And for the uh, for the higher resolution runs also, we see quite similar feature of the accretion uh, accre uh, accretion rate profile. So we say that you can say that this is not really resolution is not making much difference to this problem. Then we saw the Lorentz factor uh, where I define at z if Lorentz factor is greater than one point one or z velocity zero point four c. And then here I plot the Lorentz factor. You see. Initially, these are the, all the low resolution run. And it says the Lorentz factor increases and then decreases and do some oscillation. Because then if I increase the resolution, what happens with the resolution? I can resolve uh, the MRI better. So we can have more magnetic flux accumulating around the black hole. <clears throat> accumulated, and then we get a uh, very strong Z here. Yeah, I, I, I'm not following. What is this 200 you're writing? R equals to 200. Uh, I, uh, okay, just tell me. Uh, okay. Forget okay, about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here I am calculating the Lorentz factor in different radius. Okay. <coughs> R equals to 50. Yeah, R equals to 50, R equals to 100, R equals to 200, and R I equal to 200 to compare with the high resolution and low resolution. Here, I, this is, I calculated some Z radius, vague Z radius, like where I can get this kind of Lorentz factor. And we see for some cases, this case, this is going out because if you have more flux, then the Z is, of course, wider. But uh, this, of course, we need to do in a more realistic simulation, uh, probably with 3D or other, uh, with some uh, dynamo processor and things then only we get the more realistic picture. But the idea was that we, with this kind of simplistic idea, we can show that the system can transfer for, from soft to hard state. Uh, and with uh, ZRMSD, we can also capture this uh, the behavior of the Lorentz factor. This is typically, we see that in the hard intermediate state. So this here, we see the strongest that, and then it's dropping. <coughs> So no, no, that's various radius. Yes, yeah. And then uh, we wanted to see if there is any this kind of QPO signature. This QPO signature uh, to do that we need of course the calculate the X uh, X-ray light curve. But here we but we calculate the accretion rate. That means what is going in and what is going out at different radius. This is at radius five. This is twenty and forty and fifty. So. <laughs> that means is every radius there is some oscillation going on. Some part is going in, some part is going out. That is giving us some like QP peaks. At here it is around like 200 or so, but if you go out, then it is giving around 10 or so. But this is the in initial phase. You can see the time is kind of 2 to 2.5 seconds. So that time, what is happening? Like in this is kind of if the flow is moving in a uh, Keplerian motion. So different radius has different azimuthal velocity, and that's why we are having different QP of frequency. So, no, mine was in it. From Zoom, from Zoom. Okay. Oh, from Zoom. Okay. Oh, yes. Mute. Okay. Okay. So now the point is in such scenario. What would be the observed QPO if this kind of oscillation is giving a QPO signal? Then, depending on the dominated region of the radiation, we, uh, the, uh, the X ray will choose a uh, QPO frequency. But what happens with if I vary the time, uh, like a different time, 1 to 1.5 second and then 40 to 40 second, we see that eventually the QPO we get kind of high frequency QPO, it is around 200. And at this time, I set the QPO frequency at different radius, and I get the more or less same value. That means the system is getting uh, really in the same frequency. And we calculate this is uh, this is the density maximum radius is around five spatial radius at this step. So this is it's more or less equal to the Keplerian rotation time of that radius. So this is what we observe, and. Yeah, so yeah, in summary, like with this simple model, we demonstrated the spectral state 
uh, from soft to the hard state over a uh, transit from soft to hard state over time and uh, we saw that uh, we have shown that the, the decaying time scale should be at least equal uh, or the mass decaying time scale should not be longer if uh, we want to see the the typical behavior of the uh, transition of the of the decaying stage in commonly observed uh, outburst and and we see that that also appears in our model in this uh, transition uh, from the soft to soft intermediate state and Lorentz factor decreases with time. And also we observe this cubic frequencies in both the ranges, low and high. So uh, yeah, so this is, this as I mentioned, this is kind of pilot project. So we need to investigate. In reality, we need to push more numerical resources, lots of numerical resources to get more realistic and large scale picture. And yeah, this was in 2015, we were here. So thanks for inviting again. But this was how we he were here in the <laughs> Okay, thank you. Questions, uh, Rajiv has so many questions. So we have time to take three questions. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, you're right. Do you believe the complex SRA binary start from crystal uh, state above anticlockwise? Yeah. So why you think that you should start from the soft state and then go back? Oh yeah, this is a very good question. I uh, missed to uh, mention it. So if I want to start from uh, like question state or the hard state, then I need to do really a long simulation. But then I thought, okay, let's first like divide this part which I can manage with short numerical times. That's why I start from a soft state and try to go. But from the other, uh, from the other direction, if I want to come, of course I want to come with more numerical distance. <laughs> yeah. So I have three questions. So commenting on that, actually, one uh, colleague of mine already did that at the other way around. I think it's published. We can talk about it. The other question was, so you start with Navico third list, right. which will thin this in your 2D right. GRM. Right. So what do you do for cooling? Because once the magnetic field comes in, it will create dissipation and start to heat up. So how do you cool down? Because in hydro, it's fine, but if you are turn on magnetic field. Uh, here we put some repetitive cooling processes. We put some energy loss term in the equation. Basically, they can they, they just no, no, they, they have the theta at every point, right? Uh -huh. So, what they calculate is the uh, the uh, shear rate, right? Uh -huh. Energy. Oh, that is that is, uh, just so uh, yeah. now we put the this cooling, uh, like I if you I I can show you the equations where uh, in in the real scenario we need to do the radiation treatment, right? Radiated DRMSD, but that is here I try to like simplify the system so then my simulation speed increases so that's why i just put some radiative cooling in a like a more uh <coughs> ad hoc way so, taking, so, two more questions. so in a uh, low density torus structure you develop at your time did you check the mass flux from outer boundary and it could be that you're moving mass from outer boundary rather than completion okay so but, that happens into the anomalous with part of torus it tends to have outflows. Yeah, you are talking about this part. No, no, in the latest stage. Oh, that okay. Um, yeah, right corner. upper right corner. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, did you check how much you are losing from outer boundary instead of it? Uh, yeah. So here, what mm -hmm. how we tackle it? We injected matter not from the outside or, or the edge of the disk. Mm -hmm. We injected from in between because there's some technical uh, difficulties to because of the boundaries <coughs> so that's why when we injected from some like 400 but our the boundary is around 1000 so that's why this that kind of problem we are talking about that will not reflect here okay but you might want to double check with it your boundary is not too far from the no. Also, it would have outflowed yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, it, it, of course, it, that's not difficult to calculate. If you just calculate the sound speed around this region and the total distance is traveling and the total yeah. simulation time you are comparing, it is easy to check. Right. So okay. What he's saying is that you, whatever it is, injecting from inside, right? Mm -hmm. Some subcaprian matter with magnetic field. It's going out. And this is the boundary. Mm -hmm. And this is the inner boundary, the black hole. 
So what he is trying to ask is that how much matter is going from here? You can see this, uh, this uh, the Bernoulli parameter line from that what happened? When these things goes outside, but that, it eventually that's, comes that's back. That's fine. I'm saying that the simulation domain is limited. So even if you have an unbound flow, if it's not a PRD boundary, it wouldn't be coming back. So if you have outflow boundary, I don't know. No, it, it has outflow boundary. Yeah, so you lost that matter. Uh, yeah. yeah, but in this case, we have said that the, this really not, okay. so it's not going outside. Yeah. We should talk about, so this is last one. <laughs> So in the QPOs, yeah. uh, he mentioned, so that's just the ideal thing. We, if you still have the data, we can do the ray tracing of that and extract more. Right. <coughs> I have, have the data that. that you can ray trace. Only the problem is the uh, containerization process. Because if one to do ray tracing for extra binary situation, and you know the problem of the scattering in the inverse. Yeah, so we have done that. Yeah, yeah there, there are uh, this QPO <coughs> have. Uh, Done that, yeah, but the code is not available for us. No, I, I have uh, you have it, but it's not publicly hey, available. Maybe <laughs> so, uh, uh, oh, yeah, you have it. So, your initial thin disk is unmagnetized, right. then you inject the battery, which is magnetized. Right. So, why go everything is not magnetized? Because there is an interaction between magnetized matter and unmagnetized ones. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Means, of course, you can put ideally, there is no if you this is a trap. Viscosity generated because of the magnetization inside the disk. Anyway, so um, yes, why not different? And what, what is the magnetic field structure and magnitude that you consider for the second level that you inject? Yeah, I will answer you like questions. Uh, the first question is why I do not start with some magnetic field here. I can have some magnetic field, but very weak. Which can, if I do a very high resolution run, that will provide me the required viscosity to sustain this Keplerian accretion rate. That, but you know that's not possible to do uh, with numerical. So, uh, and that's why. Secondly, second point is. Uh, I want to start from the soft set that do not have a depth. So I I do not need to put a magnetic field there. Uh, we have, people have seen wind from very far from the black uh, the, uh, the black holes. So that's why I started with a hydrostatic disk. And then I injected the magnetic matter. That is, I injected kind of loop, single loop magnetic field because what I injected is kind of in a from a spherical. Uh, uh, like geometry, small sphere, sphere kind of thing I have injected. So that's why I put some like loop magnetic field. Okay. okay. So um, when you say that the jet appears, what do you really mean? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I really mean that uh, uh, like I have a jet which has uh, like a high you mean in the Lorentz factor like a perpendicular direction to yeah. the to the flow yeah what i can <clears throat> say that this is black hole and this is accretion disk so when the jet is launched so you can track the the Lorentz factor or the velocity of the the outgoing matter if it i calculated the Lorentz factor like that and i say you can see the Lorentz factor here it's initially there was no z then eventually the Lorentz factor increases and we see some highest value. And for XRB, what we see is of the order of 1.8 or 2 kind of Lorentz factor, and we also see, but of course, depending on the how much magnetic field you are infusing inside, that you can see the different kind of that. Uh, also, the time scale uh, with which the magnetic field can be like enhanced and that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a simple answer, right? You, if you look at the matter that is going out, yeah, that's that's what that's what it's some, uh, you know, value like J, uh, yeah, J right. equals to point four. That is uh, J. Yeah. Hindu, the time evolution that you show, the property or like for outrust is okay. But let's say when you look at persistence, right? yeah. this stays over a very, very long time, yeah. almost doesn't evolve, mm -hmm. but they are both. Mm -hmm. So, is it, how do you create such kind of scary scenario here? Uh, yeah. That's why it's a pilot project. I have a comment no, no, no. a hard time bringing that back to a Keplerian disk yeah. scenario. Yeah. Because if you have a this scattered matter all 
everywhere, yeah. okay, it's easy to have a very ordered Keplerian disk and dis I mean dis disrupt it. But to bring that thing back again, I don't know whether anybody has done it. Or uh, anybody can yes, do it. That, that is a challenge we are working on for the next. Because, of course, uh, when we did that, the next step is we want to test the full cycle. This is kind of half of the cycle, the lower cycle. So that possibly we will discuss in the next AREA. Yeah, if you hit by this. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, maybe we can discuss during lunch time. So let's thank Sintu once again. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Camellia Jana. Uh, she will speak about mass loss from relativistic magnetized accretion disk around the <laughs> Huh? Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. So Sonjit will speak about oscillating shocks in the transonic discus variable gamma accretion to around that. It's really too small. <laughs> So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Sanjeev Devnath, and uh, I'm now I'm going to talk about oscillating shock from the transverse. Discuss variable gamma emission for our own black hole. Yeah, uh, from uh, the previous talk and our other talk, we all already know that accretion is very important in order to power in the extra binary semi-agents and other black hole candidates. And uh, uh, many black hole candidates like uh, extra binary semi-agents shows PPOs in, uh, in extra studies. Uh, here I have shown some uh, one PC of Cygnus X1 black uh, X2 binaries and uh, viscosity plays a uh, vital role in accretion physics in order to transport angular momentum in our uh, direction. Now, there are many papers by previous authors uh, that show that viscosity can trigger the shock oscillation in the accretion days, and this shock oscillation can explain the Q, uh, low frequency PPOs uh, seen in the uh, black hole candidate. Here is some result from previous authors. Uh, this is the shock oscillation they have found in their result. And uh, the uh, power density spectrum also shown some uh, QPOs in their result. Now, uh, but all this previous uh, uh, work, they have uh, injected the matter at outer boundary supersonically, but uh, outer boundary at outer boundary matter has, has to be subsonic and they shows that with viscosity shock goes in outward direction but in some <clears throat> analytic study we uh, they uh, they found that uh, viscosity can move sh uh, shock in inward direction also so our goal is to uh, how this accretion solution actually depends on the viscosity parameter and if there is any shock uh, oscillation then how it can be you know, different parameter of shock oscillation uh, how can be related to the viscosity so for this purpose, we uh, consider Petzen's field of potential to mimic the black hole uh, uh, gravity, and we solve <coughs> 1D uh, conserved fluid equation, hydrodynamic equation uh, in spherical geometry. And here is the <coughs> conserved quantities, and W is the uh, primitive variables, and corresponding fluxes in all the direction is so, uh, written here by A for term, and the source term S contains the information of the gravity and the viscosity. The contribution of the viscosity will be in the uh, phi angular momentum uh, equation and the energy equation. 
<laughs> and from the previous, uh, from the uh, talk of Piyush and Silpa, we all know that uh, this CRE equation state has a uh, uh, dependency on temperature, so it can handle the uh, gamma variation uh, throughout the flow. And our code is uh, based on TVD scheme, and it is a uh, finite difference scheme, and second order accurate both in space and time. And as we are uh, discussing about the viscous flow, so uh, we uh, changes the primitive variable from azimuthal variable to angular momentum, so that we can exactly conserve the angular momentum uh, in the flow. So uh, first, we start with the inrigid flow without viscosity, and lambda is the specific angular momentum, and uh, uh, SL is the specific energy in the flow. And uh, if we analytically we found Analytically, we found uh, this parameter space of, uh, I mean, lambda versus epsilon. And in this parameter space, this red uh, region bounded by this red, red line shows uh, the three sonic point region. And within this three sonic point region, we have a shock uh, a region uh, for where we can have shock solution. And in this sonic, in this parameter space, we select four point A, B, C, D, and uh, Corresponding uh, analytic solution are shown here. And from the previous talk, we already know that this uh, solution topology is that means sol first one is solution passing to an outer sonic point, second one is a shock solution passing through inner sonic point, then a shock transition, and then sorry, passing through outer sonic point, and then a shock transition, and then uh, passing through in, uh, inner sonic point and falling uh, to the black hole. And third one is a <coughs> alpha type solution, but it Physically passing to inner sonic point. And fourth one is a hot accretion solution passing to an uh, inner sonic point, that means the adapt solution. Now, uh, with our 1D simulation code, we uh, verified all these solution and uh, red open circle uh, represent the simulation re result from simulation code uh, after steady state. And from this plot, it is clear that our uh, codes are able to handle this type of flows. And also, if they're in shock or shock, then shock, they shock also, uh, our code also captured the shock. Uh, then we consider the uh, viscous flow. And uh, for viscous flow, we consider viscosity parameter to be uh, 0 0.01. And lambda 0 is the specific angular momentum at horizon. And then due to the viscosity, angular momentum is increasing. I mean, uh, angular momentum is decreasing towards horizon, and it has a value lambda zero at uh, the horizon. And similarly, the parameter space uh, in this particular viscosity in viscous case, we also have this three sonic point region and the shock shock region. And uh, in this uh, here also consider four point A B C D and the <coughs> corresponding solution are shown here, and the solution topology uh, even exa uh, exactly same. But uh, different uh, values of constant of motion. We also simulate this uh, viscous flow through our code, code and uh, after steady state, this solution matches, uh, solution from our simulation code matches with the analytic one. And as we are considering the viscous flow, so one has to check that uh, the code is able to handle the angular momentum also. So, uh, we also check the angular momentum uh, uh, by our code. Black one is the uh, uh, analytic result, and red open circle is the uh, result from the simulation. And uh, our code able to handle this type of uh, viscous flow also. Very, uh, very <laughs> now, as we increase the uh, viscosity, uh, viscosity then uh, the Outward uh, uh, centrifugal force and the inward pressure and gravity will balance uh, after in steady state. But if we increase further viscosity, then they, uh, then uh, the, this balance can uh, may may not be possible, and the shock front can overshoot in equilibrium condition and start to oscillate. And uh, this is a movie of this uh, one type of oscillation. This is uh, velocity, Mach number, and angular momentum. And as the angular momentum is actually oscillating, that's why the shock in the accretion disk uh, is. Uh, oscillating. Now, in order to study this shock oscillation throughout the, uh, the disk, we consider two different scenarios. First, we uh, fix the epsilon at uh, outer boundary and we choose different 
angular moment down at the outer one outer boundary and uh, denoted as model l1 l2 l3 and uh, angular momentum is uh, actually increasing in this three model and then we uh, fix the angular momentum at the outer boundary and uh, vary a specific energy in uh, outer boundary and it is uh, increasing according and named as u1 eq and c model and the uh, uh, value of this uh, uh, i think injection value at the outer one is that means velocity temperature and angular momentum are taken from the analytic solution and we inject the matter from uh, hundreds uh, thousands of radius that is uh, of course a sub solution yeah i've shown uh, two shock oscillation for model l3 and u1 and in, in L3, it's uh, clear that when the uh, viscosity is lower, I mean, alpha is 0 0.01, the shock goes out, and after some point, uh, the, the stabilized, I mean, the equilibrium is, first, is uh, there, and the shock takes at some uh, position. And But if we further increase the alpha to 0 0.015, the uh, previous shock, uh, I mean, the steady shock started to oscillate, uh, and, it, 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 and it goes on. And as, uh, as we increase further, the shock oscillation also increases. And this uh, E1 model also, <clears throat> the shock has alpha equals to 0 0.01, shock almost uh, <coughs> steady. And if <clears throat> we increase the, uh, I mean, the um, uh, viscosity parameter, this value, then the shock oscillation just started. So it is clear that the shock oscillation depends on the outer boundary condition. That means the Outer boundary uh, for these two models are different. So the oscillation triggering for triggering the shock oscillation, uh, the viscosity is different for these two different yeah. models. <clears throat> now this is some uh, considering ten social uh, ten mass, solar mass uh, for different model and different alpha value. We uh, I, mean, I, I listed here the uh, oscillation amplitude, oscillation frequencies, and the mean position of this uh, shock oscillation and uh, we got a wide range of uh, frequencies for this oscillation. Now here I've shown a snapshot of uh, um, Mach number and angular momentum for uh, three different <coughs> time steps. Yeah. And this black one represents the invisible uh, phase when there is no uh, viscosity, so angular momentum is just even exactly uh, constant. And just after, uh, as we add viscosity in the system, the uh, we have a secondary shock in the accretion disk, and as we go on, the, sh uh, the secondary shock vanishes, and the vanishes, and this primary <coughs> shock start to oscillate, and uh, it goes in, uh, shock goes inward and start to oscillate. Now this is the <coughs> here I have shown the the shock different uh, oscillation uh, oscillation uh, I mean the oscillation amplitude frequencies and uh, mean position. A variation with viscosity for uh, for model L1, N2, and L3, assuming the black hole must be 10 uh, solar mass. And uh, as we, uh, it is clear that uh, for different, I mean the for different model, I mean the for uh, higher viscous, higher uh, angular momentum, the <coughs> sorry, the for lower angular momentum, the triggering alpha for oscillation is higher. And uh, it is it, it is decreasing as the angular momentum at the outer one is increasing, and the shock goes uh, outward in uh, as viscosity is increasing, and this trends uh, similar for uh, three models. And as the shock goes out and amplitude in increasing, so the frequency started to decrease uh, with alpha. And for model same thing for model <coughs> e1 into e3. The similar trends is uh, yeah. remain same for model E1 and E2, but as the at outer boundary for model E3 is energy is higher. So in this case, for the particular angular momentum, the uh, with uh, increasing alpha uh, shock is going in, in inward, and as it is going inward, the frequency uh, instead of uh, decreasing, so frequency started to increase uh, with alpha. Now we also estimate the posterior the net radiative output taking brain cell and synchrotron cooling and computerization. This is the uh, emissivity and the net out uh, and we call, consider mass action rate to be 0 0.1 Eddington uh, rate and, and, and magnetic beta to be 0 0.01. And we, uh, we also shown and this is the uh, shock oscillation for model 
uh, E1 and uh, with alpha 0.0125, and the uh, we shown here for you know, 10 second uh, time, and the shock oscillation is shown here, and the total yeah. the luminosity coming from this uh, luminosity calculated also oscillating like this, and uh, if we uh, get the power density spectrum of this uh, variation of the luminosity, we get a peak, prominent peak at uh, 0 0.784 hertz and it was running <laughs> and for model e 3 with alpha 0 0.01 the uh, oscillation frequency is, is uh, high and this is the oscillation of shock and this is the uh, <clears throat> luminosity oscillation of the luminosity and the uh, power density spectrum shows the uh, fundamental frequency of about 7.15 hertz so the conclusion is like uh, add the viscosity uh, parameter uh, process a critical value. The previous steady state state solution without viscosity, viscosity can uh, uh, I mean, start to oscillate. But the uh, uh, this critical viscosity, uh, sorry, uh, viscosity, viscosity for oscillation depends on the injection angular momentum and the specific energy. And the net output, uh, radiative output also oscillate with that frequency. And this uh, characteristics is frequency of that in numerous. Thanks, Sanjeev. Uh, one quick question. I want to basically understand. But initially, we have a shock which is permitting an outward, then it starts oscillating. Yes, yes. What we, what typically leads to this kind of oscillation? And second, why it comes to uh, high viscosity? Yeah, it's actually uh, when uh, as we add viscosity in the system, the angle of momentum. Sorry. Back. Uh, yeah, this. this one. This one. So uh, the thing is, angular momentum is when the. No. Okay. <coughs> this one is wrong. Right. Yeah, that is back, 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 back. Keep on this. Oh, the book is coming. It's okay. That's back of slide. Okay, just start. The thing is, when we add viscosity, then the point is uh, the uh, if the as we add viscosity, there will be a centrifugal force in in flow. There is centrifugal force and the gravity and the pressure. And this thing is a uh, balance. Uh, then the shock. As we add viscosity, then the uh, the angular momentum just of the shock goes up, and due to this extra uh, uh, angular momentum, there will be an extra push due to the centrifugal force, and that will uh, push the matter in uh, outward direction. And at some point, there will be balance uh, between this outward and inward push, and then the shock will balance for lower viscosity. And if we increase the viscosity then higher value, then this this uh, I mean this jump will be high, and is in such a manner that this uh, Extra centrifugal force will push in such a manner, then there will be no equilibrium, and it, uh, I mean, the shock will start to oscillate. Okay, then let's thank Sanjeev once again. Okay, the next speaker is Camelia Jana. She will speak about mass loss from relativistic magnetized electrodynamics around the world. No, it's not this one. Yes.
first of all, thank you for inviting me. Myself, Tavilia Jana. I'm working with Professor Chandrabhadra Das. The title of my talk is Mass Loss from Relativistic Magnetized Appalachian Disk Around Rotating Black Holes. So these are the quick outlines of my talk. I'll start from introduction. So a black hole, we often think black hole as the beast of the universe, which swallow everything, whichever passes by it, from dust to the entire star. But in reality, black hole doesn't eat its total meal, you can say. Uh, a fraction of the matter are actually thrown out from the system as the outflow or jets. So jets are basically highly collimated matter, which uh, comes out with a relativistic speed. And it is very commonly observed in attracting black hole system, like in AGN sex binaries. Now, in spite of the strong gravitational pull of black hole, how matter is coming out from the system, that pictures is still not clear. Now, we know that black hole doesn't have any hard boundary or anything intrinsic atmosphere which can eject mass. So, if jet originate, it has to originate from the accretion disk region. So, maybe in accretion disk, something is happening which is actually responsible for this kind of ejection process. So, So observation also confirms this kind of disk state relation. So we can see when the accretion disk is in the hard state, we get steady continuous kind of jet. And when it uh, the disk change from the hard to soft state, we get transient relativistic jet. And when the accretion disk is in the soft state, there is no set activity. So you can see that the jet activity does depend on the state of the accretion disk. That means on the accretion process itself. Now, there are many studies which actually says that uh, the corona eventually converted into the jet. So, we can say that possibly this corona and jets are connected. Now, we know that magnetic field is present everywhere in astrophysical object. So, we can think our accretion disk is also magnetized. Now, the question is, does this magnetic field of the accretion disk have any role in this ejection mechanism? So, there are many famous models. There are two uh, famous models, Glanford Jenny, Glanford Payne, and there are some simulations which shows that actually magnetic field can power the jet. So, motivating with this kind of study, we also wanted to study the role of the magnetic field on this accretion ejection process. So, let's quickly review the accretion. Uh, what is accretion? So, accretion means accumulation because of the strong gravitational pull of the black hole. Matter will try to fall on it. Now, as it has some angular momentum, so it will not directly fall on it, rather it will make a spiral motion around it, make a disk-like structure, so we, so we call as the accretion disk, and finally fall on the black hole. Now, <laughs> when matter will try to accretate in one, it has to lose angular momentum, and for that, viscosity will come into the picture, it will help in the angular momentum transport business. Now we know that at outer edge of the accretion disk, the flow is the flow speed is negligible, that means flow is subsonic there, and when it is crossing the event horizon, the flow speed is comparable to the speed of light, that means flow is supersonic there. So you can say any black hole solution has to be transonic in nature, and the point it is changing its uh, property from subsonic to supersonic, it is called the sonic point. Now the question is how this aggression process is throwing matter out, how this jet is originated from the system. So let's understand that. So during this aggression process, this rotating matter, this actually feels two kind of forces. One is the gravitational force, another is the centrifugal force. You can like consider like a tug of war between these two forces. Now, when you are at a very large distance from the black hole, or when you are very near to the black hole, gravity will always win. But in between these two, there will be a position where your centrifugal force will be comparable to the gravitational force. So there, uh, flow slows down. It will make a certain transition from the supersonic to subsonic branch, which is called as a soft transition. Now, as the flow slows down, so this excess kinetic energy, it will help to, uh, it will basically heat up the post region. So the post region becomes very heat, uh, very hot, uh, dense, and the disk also become uh, puffed up. So which actually behaves like a corona. So which we call as a post corona. And this excess thermal gradient force that uh, generates across this PSC, it actually ejects a uh, part of the infalling matter in the vertical direction as the bipolar outflow on the jet. So basically, we are fall, uh, basically we are following shock induced thermally driven accretion ejection mechanism. We are following <coughs> couple of equation for accretion and outflow and connecting them through the shock conditions. So we are we are using 
the DDMC effective potential, which can mimic the space time geometry very efficiently, even for a rapidly rotating uh, black hole case. We are, <laughs> the first one is the radial momentum equation. So here we are considering that our accretion disk is mainly threaded by the toroidal component of the magnetic field. We are defining the plasma meter parameter, which is the issue of the gas, gas pressure to the magnetic pressure. By controlling this uh, plasma meter parameter, we can actually control the magnetic activity in our system. Now, next is the mass conservation. And then uh, this is the angular momentum conservation equation. And then the entropy dimension equation. Now, as we are considering magnetic field in our system, so uh, we consider that synchrotron as the main cooling mechanism present in the system. So Q minus is basically the synchrotron cooling. And last one is the induction equation. So these are the five equations we are solving for the accretion part. For outflow, this is the first one is the energy conservation. And the second one is the mass conservation. So these are the total equations that we are solving. And as, as I said that we are connecting them through the shock conditions. So that condition. So this one is the induction equation. This is the symbol. Last one. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So these are the shock conditions, the energy conservation, the mass conservation, pressure balance, and the magnetic flux conservation. So uh, following this accretion ejection mechanism, we calculate the outflow rate, which is basically the ratio of the mass outflow flux by mass inflow flux in terms of the uh, input parameters like the accretion rate, viscosity parameter, plasma meter parameter, the inflow energy, angular momentum, and black hole speed. So we apply this into a uh, parameter at the inner critical point and solve for the rest. So for a particular set of input parameter, this is the complete picture of the infrared solution. So the red one shows the accretion solution, while the blue one shows the ejection uh, or the outflow solution. So we can see that for accretion, at the outer edge, the subsonic flow, it is gaining its radial velocity when it is uh, moving towards the black hole. And it crosses the outer sonic point and becomes supersonic. Now, this supersonic flow, when it uh, again uh, moving towards the black hole, it is experiences this shock transition, becomes subsonic. Again, the subsonic matter is picking up its radial velocity, crossing a sonic point, becomes supersonic, and finally falls on the black hole. And from this uh, post shock region, a fraction of the matter is going out as the outflow. Uh, in the right panel, I have shown the characteristics of this inflow outflow corresponding to this solution. And we can show that we can see that how this uh, how this flow uh, jump the flow speed abrupt jumps <laughs> across the shock and the post shock region becomes highly dense and hot. And from this highly dense and hot region, this matter is going out. So next uh, we calculate the RM dot in terms of the all info parameters. And we can see that in all cases, as we uh, decrease the value of the plasma meter parameter, or we can say as we are increasing the magnetic activity in our system, the outflow rate is increasing. So from that, so, so from this study, we can say that yes, the magnetic field is helping in more mass ejection. Now also we can say that, uh, see that the other info parameter is also uh, plays a role in this in determining this outflow rate. We can see the outflow rate is increasing as we are increasing the mass accretion rate, as we increase the flow angular momentum, as we increase the black hole speed, and it decreases as we increase the uh, flow viscosity. So next, uh, we have shown the variation of the maximum outflow rate uh, in terms of the plasma beta parameter. So here we basically uh, uh, freely varied the energy and angular momentum in the inner critical point, and we wanted to see what could be the maximum outflow rate we can generate for a particular plasma beta parameter. And we can see that uh, for both the cases, for black 
for the photospin parameter 0 and 0 0.99, as we are increasing the magnetic act uh, activity in our system, the maximum activity is increasing. Specifically, we found that when the plasma beta parameter at inner critical point is 30, for non-rotating uh, black hole case, we are getting almost 24% mass outflow rate, and for rapidly rotating case, we are getting 30% mass outflow rate. So once we get the maximum outflow rate, we can calculate the corresponding maximum jet kinetic power that we can get from this formalism by using this relation. So, So next, we wanted to connect this uh, theoretical formalism with the observation. So we have selected some sources which have uh, simultaneous X-ray uh, observation as well as the radio observation. We have collected the uh, X-ray observation and radio observation from the literature. So from X-ray luminosity, we calculate the mass accretion rate and supply it to our uh, theoretical formalism. And we calculate what would be the maximum outflow rate we can get from this formalism. And then we can calcu we calculate the corresponding jet kinetic power which we are getting from our model and we can then we compare it with the observation one and we can see that uh, these two are more or less uh, in good agreement so this way we are trying to explain the observed jet kinetic power <coughs> uh, so we summarize so basically we uh, consider that uh, this is created by the toroidal magnetic field and we find that the outflow rate is increasing as we increase the magnetic activity in our system and finally, we try to explain the observed jet kinetic power. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, Camilla. <laughs> Question? Yes. So, uh, when you are calculating, so the kinetic power you are getting from your model, then when you are comparing with observation, uh, are you comparing with the emission? Are you converting to kinetic power by some means, or uh, how, how are you com how are you con doing that conversion? Actually, there is a relation like the radio uh, the jet kinetic power will be uh, like proportional to the you know, of the power plus by fifty. So there is a relation. So we can calculate that. So by that we are converting the radio luminosity to the jet kinetic power and comparing it to this. Okay. <laughs> About this uh, outflow rate and the jet power, so did you also take the dependence of spin parameter on your position? Yes. Uh, here also you can see as you are increasing the black hole spin, the outflow rate is increasing. Okay, and about the uh, uh, jet kinetic power, so it is also Actually, there is a paper by Ramit Akbar in uh, 2015. You can see there. So, there they have uh, like compared the observed jet kinetic power by this theory. Okay, so, the reason why I'm asking is that in the standard, uh, this is the mechanism, like initially, there is the molecular coordinate plane. So, the jet power is like it goes something like this. Okay. And then you are studying the fluid jet. Which are like these are meta dominated ways. But is there a, some kind of a correlation? If I want to cross, yeah, so in blank foot, Zai, jet power goes like a squared, right? Yes, Something yes, like yes, a yes, squared. Yes. So he's asking what is the typical, yes. do you have a scaling factor on it? So in that paper, actually, we have to make. Uh, uh, that max jet kind of paper, paper. 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 You can, you can say from here. So, like. It, it, there is no direct correlation, like it is varying something uh, to the part with the spin. But yes, like uh, if you are in your, there is a direct correlation, like it, it will uh, depend on this black hole spin with some power. But we are getting like as we are increasing the spin, we are getting more amount of correlation. Can find out the possible relation? Yeah. So you no question. I have just oh. one suggestion, no, not suggestion, but anyway, like you have taken only toroidal magnetic field, right? Yes, yes, yes. But your accretion flow is advection dominated, so it will it is rotating less, falling in more, right? So the magnetic field it will generate will it should have a BR component as well. Yeah, like uh, maybe that can be our next project. We'll do that. 
Okay, right. let's thanks, Camelia. Uh, the last talk in this session is by Sheshadji Madhundar. Um, he will speak about the deeper insight into the existence theory of black hole dual access with XMM Newton. so hi all uh, myself Shishadji. so i will be talking about the autonomous extra sources uh, so the title is a deeper insight into the acquisition scenario of black hole air access with excellent newton so by black hole air access that i mean like the ulex sources which actually contains uh, black holes in the center core okay so by definition okay so by definition this ulex uh, so, uh, sources are of nuclear point like objects which has this uh, luminosity of this order that is 10 to a 39 to 41 hour per second. Now, if you co uh, compare with the Eddington luminosity of a uh, 10 solar mass black hole, so it, uh, uh, as compared to that, it is uh, much higher. So, there are several possibilities by which this much higher luminosity can be explained. I mean, can be explained. <laughs> so, the first one is that uh, the stellar mass black holes can activate in super Eddington accretion rate, and that can produce this much luminosity. The next one is that that more massive black hole can be present at, at the uh, central core, uh, and neutron star can also power these sources, uh, which can produce this much luminosity. And there are uh, papers which actually talks about that magnetic field in the accretion flow can actually explain this much luminosity also. So in this work, we mainly focused in these nine sources. So these are basically observed by XM Newton. So we uh, target those sources which uh, observed by XM multiple times. So we need multiple observations for spectral modeling and to study the long-term behavior. So total 62 observations we have for all these nine sources. Mm -hmm. So out of these nine sources, we find that these five sources actually shows the QPO features in this millihertz range. So the uh, QPO frequency varies uh, between uh, this range, 8 to 643 millihertz, and the RMS amplitude varies in this particular range. So these are the only five black hole ULXs that actually shows the QPO features. So these are basically some uh, a tool that we will use later on to predict the accretion scenarios of these objects. Okay, so next we have uh, the spectra from XM from 0.3 to 10 kV range. So first we attempt with this uh, model, which consists of two standard disks along with a uh, simple component that is basically a polar kind of uh, model, which actually explain the uh, observed spectra. So this is basically uh, the most common or well-studied uh, spectral morphology that people used for ULXS. So we move into more physical uh, scenario by replacing this second part with thermal component that is NTHCOM. So disk PV along with NTHCOM is well studied for black hole binaries. For the first time, we use it in case of ELX uh, systems. And we try to see that the spectral curvature at higher energy can be explained with uh, this model or not. We find that uh, this also can uh, explain the uh, whole spectra. So from there, we calculate the range of luminosities for each of these sources, which varies in these particular uh, ranges. So next, once we have the spectral results, so we try to correlate between the spectral parameters. So in the first figure, we have the inertix temperature in x-axis along uh, and uh, the disk luminosity in the y-axis. So we find that except NGC 5204 X1, all other sources shows a clear negative correlation in this particular temperature 
luminosity plane. And we fit this uh, 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 observed pattern in this empirical for power law. So here this alpha is the index <laughs> that we find in this particular range. And for index 5 to 0 port, so we have exactly LDs, here. You have just taken the thermal part, right? What? By the LDs. Yes, yes. You have just taken the thermal part. Yes, right. So, uh, so we fit it with this uh, power law. And this rho is basically the Pearson correlation coefficient. Sorry. Yes. So is, this rho is basically the Pearson correlation coefficient, which tells you how correlated. So as we know, like from standard disk theory, we know that the disk luminosity should be uh, proportional to t to the power 4. But here we observe a opposite one. So it is uh, clearly negatively correlated. So there is a uh, possibility of new physics here for UXS. So that we will uh, focus in next. So also uh, we have certain correlation between the gamma and keys, that is the photon index with the luminosity. And we find uh, that these are positively co uh, correlated. So as the luminosity increases, the spectrum becomes more softer. Okay. So now we have certain temporal results as well as spectral results. So we try to correlate them also. And we find that uh, for NGC 173X1 and NGC 693X1, we find an increasing trend in the uh, in the compromised flux that is in the first panel, the percentage of compromised flux with the RMS amplitude of, of the QPOs. But for NGC 5408, we see that uh, all the in all the panel, the spectral parameters are nearly constant. So it is it shows some kind of a constant spectral nature. Uh, and if we look at the gamma values, then you can see there exist two different uh, re uh, regions. One is more than two and one is just less than two. So these two sources can be like more softer regime and these other two sources can be towards the harder regime that you can see. Okay, now since we have uh, the external observations for about a decade or more than that for each of these sources, so we have the opportunity to study the long-term behavior, okay. So in each panel, we saw the certain spectral parameters that you obtain from the screening as well as from the uh, spectral estimation. And mainly we see that all the sources shows a very low disk temperature, okay. And that predicts that there can be massive black hole in the systems. Okay, now uh, for this two particular source, again, we find uh, disk dominated nature based on the flux and the gamma values. And for other three sources, we have compromised flux, I mean, compromised dominated spectral nature based on the flux as well as uh, the gamma values. Uh, so next we propose uh, uh, the model that deals with the relativistic steady viscous accretion flow. We explain these observations that we have. So mainly the QPO frequency as well as the luminosity. So these are the governing equation that you are already aware of. Uh, so Camellia and others already uh, talked about. So these are the four, uh, four equations. Along with the equation of state, you can actually model the accretion flow around a band. Okay, so also you know about the shock solutions. So uh, depending on the physical conditions, accretion flow can have a uh, shock transition. So the uh, uh, flow starts its journey from the outer edge and uh, passing through the outer critical point, it can uh, show shock transition, then again it follows to the black hole inner edge passing to the inner critical point. Now it was pointed out that this shock location can show non-steady behavior. And that can be correlated with the QPO frequency that we are seeing. Okay, so here in this cartoon diagram, this is basically your uh, the post-shock coronal region that matter basically puffed up there. And that oscillation of that region can actually create the QPOs. So what we have, we have this QPO frequency from our model that basically calculated from the infall time scale of matter. And also we have the luminosity there. So that we can calculate from the model. Now for uh, the set of uh, uh, flow parameters, that is the angular momentum and the energy of the flow, you can study all the shock solutions and you can match with the observations. So that means those shock solutions that actually uh, explains your QPO frequency as well as luminosity simultaneously for a given source. 
So this is the result. From there, you can get the correlation between the mass and the accretion rate. So that will tell you uh, the accretion states of these uh, sources. So in the top panel, we have IC source, then NGC 1313, then NGC 6946, and then NGC 5408. And we see uh, two cases for spin parameter zero and the maximally rotating cases. And you see that uh, for the first two sources, the, uh, uh, the, the accretion state is, I mean, that can be both super as well as sub based on the mass. But if we talk about last two sources, so for maximally rotating case, it is restricted to it can go sub as well as super region. And you fit this distribution with this with this uh, polynomial. Okay, so uh, these are the possible mass ranges that we have for each of these sources in this region that we can see that uh, the intermediate mass black hole can be present in these objects for both uh, non-rotating as well as uh, rotating black hole spin. I mean, maximally and non-rotating case. So these are the uh, conclusions that already I'm talked about. So I'll just keep it here. Thank you. Thanks, Vishapri. Questions? So basically, uh, so the shock oscillates because if some uh, infer time scale of matter, uh, that means the matter takes times to fall to the black hole from the shock location that roughly matches with the cooling time scale of that region. So that time scale actually you can connect with the uh, time scale of oscillation. Okay. So from there you can calculate exactly the actually that, that is that is what Chakravarti proposed in his nineteen ninety four yes. paper. That is generally not correct. Okay. So it is some kind of a hand waving argument he gave, but it is generally not correct because whatever he was doing or whatever we did or whatever everybody else did. If your frequency time scales have nothing to do with time scales. You can have a, generally speaking, if it is closer, it is higher frequency. If it is further, it is a lower frequency. Because if it is closer, it is easier to oscillate a smaller region than if you take a larger region, which is understandable. Okay. Other than that, this has nothing to do with infer time scale. So whatever you are doing, I've been telling this please. Uh, Infer time scale and the TPO time scale was match. It need not be match, but they will be comparable. No, it doesn't. Some fraction. It has to be. And then so everything has to be a fraction, not a fraction. It has to be a multiple of uh, infer time scale. Of course, infer time scale is the time scale. And if you multiply with anything, it will get. No, no, no. So in terms of the observation, the kind of TPO frequency we see for the galactic black hole sources, it ranges from let's say few millihertz to ranges ten, from let's say tens of, to, tens of, tens tens of hertz. Of. And if you calculate the uh, impulse time scale and the corresponding frequency time scale, frequency scales, uh, they are in that range. No, that we have checked. Yeah. Two questions. First, how do you know that these are black hole uh, ULXs? Okay, uh, so basically, uh, so these are the only sources which I mean uh, we follow literature and from all the aspects of uh, like spectral as well as temporal. So these are the sources that you could predict the mass of the sources in the uh, black hole regime. Okay, and uh, you can. Uh, like oh, also, if you talk about the neutron star ULXs, none of the neutron star ULXs actually shows uh, the TPO, as well as all of the, I mean, they basically show the pulsation. From there, they are identified as uh, ULXs with neutron star. So these are basically the sources which we can assume, like uh, the black hole. So it's essentially some kind of spectral modeling. And yes, uh, from all the no. By the way, I don't know about the neutral star ULXs, but neutral stars do show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? 
But also not cheap. No, but so, that will be very high frequency. I know. Yes. What I'm trying to say is they show the why in EVL X this is so you know, then if they show, then they will show pulsation as well. Not so necessarily. Pulsation is different. Right? Pulsation huh? is different. Yeah. 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 So it will be slightly problematic with the neutron star argument uh, because it no, there are no, nine. You are exactly as the same question what Shomir asked. Yeah. He should have he should have mentioned about the black hole candidates, not the stars. Okay. Um, <laughs> there is one result which actually I am bit um, I would say concerned, and that is that that this luminosity is inversely proportional to temperature. Yes. Now my suspect is is purely an artifact of the spectral modeling. The problem I will tell you. If you use black body and power law kind of power model, the power law can extend actually very low energy. Yes, right. And that will give you completely wrong result. What you actually expect from the disk. So if you want to clarify this, my suggestion will be use a power law model which has a lower cutoff. It doesn't contribute into the black body part. So that you genuinely see whether the black body is actually contributing and fitting your data or not. Yes. That Sort of, uh, no, I think that cost check was so, done. No? Yes, yeah, so also I, I mean, checked with the same simulation, and from there we can get the because, same. See, if you have a disk and yes. disk is inversely yeah. correlated with luminosity, that is something uh, unphysical. It you, means, no, you can say the new physics. Okay, no, because, because, I mean, I don't know. Unphysical. Okay, that is my first <laughs> comment. Uh, second thing is that if you say that you are, your aim is to study the spectral curvature. Why don't you look at new star? Okay, so new star. So <laughs> for this uh, so, uh, sources, we have few occasion in which new star and X-ray is simultaneous. No, not necessary. Required. Your aim is to study the spectral curvature. Yes. Any new star data of these sources is enough. And also, the yeah. ULX has hardly evolved. Yes, they hardly evolved. So any observation of new star is good enough for you. Uh, but also, I check like the new uh, the new star spectra only going. Up to 15 or uh, yeah, because here yeah. you are not getting anything, and you are interested to check this uh, luminosity because temperature relation. See, you don't need higher than 20 kb is enough for you to understand even 10 kb is good, yeah. and you have an additional advantage if you go up to this, then if you have any, for example, um, cyclotron line or any other contribution, that also you'll be able to check. Not need to get always the pulsation, you may not get pulsation. Mm. Yeah. The pulsation will depend on whether there is a misalignment. No, 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 I'm talking about new star case. I, neutron star. I, I understand. What I'm trying to say is a neutron star which is more or less aligned will show very weak pulsation huh. or maybe no pulsation okay. at all. Okay, so last one minute. So, did you check this IUBH observation uh, from new star, which was like a 400 solar mass black hole, which had uh, a 12 frequency peak? Uh, which one? I mean, it was in 2016. Uh, He's talking about one particular object. Yeah, it's a uh, mass black hole. Indirect measurement. Okay. Which one? The source name? I don't remember the source name. It's a new star. It's a nature paper. It's 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 okay, I think it is N31 or something. That is okay. Ulysses? Yes. Yeah, so okay, okay. 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 I think okay, maybe we can talk later. So that one, I think yes, twin, peak, twin peaks at three to two frequency ratio. Yes, yes, I like it. Do you think high frequency? Yes. Peak, you might want to check as well. Okay. Uh, I think we need a class black hole. Uh, M82 maybe one can get M82 X1. X1. Yeah. I think that's the source. Yeah. yeah, so M82 X1, we, we had that source here also. But the problem is, I mean, uh, some serious contamination is there. Okay. So M82 call. Contains, uh, I mean, that cannot be resolved with Excel. So that's why we need to so remove that. I mean, it, it's very difficult to say whether it's coming from X1 or X2. Yeah. So nearby. Is there resolved with later in the Machete paper or something? Yeah, so that is uh, from Chandra. But it's controversial. So yes. uh, uh, you are allowed us to do only the spectral part. Only the timing part. part. Huh? So only the timing part, part, we didn't allow us to spectral part. So with Excel, it can't be resolved actually. With Chandra, we can do. But during this time, we don't find any Chandra observation. Okay, it's the lunch time. Uh, the, these are, these are the last uh, talk, and we are late by 15 minutes. But in any case, we will come back by 2 o'clock, I guess. So we can, so, uh, before, so we can, we can extend it by 5 minutes. So before that, let's thank all the speakers in both the sessions. And uh, so, in any case, uh, uh, who is the target? 
He was talking about I mean five minutes, but he he has to. <laughs> Uh, so he has to come and also. Uh, can we leave the bag here or? Yes.
I mean, the light is the equation. Okay, welcome back for the post lunch session. Uh, we would be listening to a to something quite new, uh, new for Aries uh, uh, students and faculties. We don't do this stuff, right? Everything that we have been talking about, we talk about a single geodesic, right? One solution. And uh, this man, long time back, he thought about if you have a bunch of the uh, of all these trajectories, what we call geodesics, how do they behave? Okay, so that actually revolutionized uh, GR. So I think uh, Rupu, you're the chair. I thought you knew. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was kind of I'm sorry. Yeah. On the spot. Yeah. You're not on the spot. It's there in the. Uh, I didn't read. I didn't read. I'm sorry, I don't know. It's not at least visible. Yeah. No? I didn't. Take this one. Take this. It's black on the water. I see nothing. Don't worry. There is. It's a heat. 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 I'm color blind, getting old. Let's <laughs> Yeah, I, I have to introduce this to you. Sorry, I have not done any homework. I you know what happened. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is a very important session, especially to the youngsters who may not be aware of. Uh, the towering figure of uh, AKR, AKR Chaudhary, as, as so many of you know, um, who actually demonstrated, you know, the power of general relativity to ask, answer really fundamental questions about cosmology, which was later adapted by, you know, people you are familiar from the popular culture. Um, and to talk about that famous equation, about geodesics and the bundles and all that, we have another doyen of Indian uh, you know, the general relativity community in India, Professor Nar uh, Narayan Banerjee um, from uh, ISER Calcutta. We all, you know, uh, remember him as a student days from uh, 90s and very calm professor who kind of give beautiful lectures. And, uh, and uh, of course, I actually never really followed many of uh, uh, Professor Narayan Banerjee's efforts, but uh, we used to listen to many of these talks during ICGC and IAGRD, 
And after maybe 30 years or something, we met in, you know, last month, uh, last month. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure um, you know, catching up with him. And I'm sorry, I, uh, this is, uh, yeah. So without any further ado, and uh, I invite Professor Nara and Banerjee to talk about this fantastic equation, its genesis and significance, especially for, you know, astronomy and cosmology. Please, thank you. Thank you, Gopu, and uh, thank you, and all the organizers for more. Mic. Oh, sorry. I have to change the yeah. <laughs> So, uh, thank you, Gopu, and also thanks to the organizers, particularly to Ignorance, for asking me to come here for this occasion. So, uh, as he already said, that this is somewhat different from what people here are doing every day. So uh, I shall teach the lecture at a very general level. There will be general relativity equations, but yeah, uh, uh, I shall try to be more general and try to explain everything uh, as it goes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Can we go to the slide? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, Amal Kumar Rajyodhuri, as Gopo already said, um, popularly known as AKR, was, a, was among the donors of the Indian Relativity Community. Uh, along with Professor P.C. Boyddo, AKR formed a, I mean, a very strong culture of research in classical relativity in India. And as you well, although, I mean, most of the relativists from the eastern part of, the, of India Come from physics department, and most of the relativists in the northern side of the, of India come from mathematics department. Because PC Boydo belongs to mathematics department, and AKR belongs to the physics department. <coughs> yeah. So this uh, year, I and mean, in 14 September 22 to 13 September 23, has been his centenary year. So it's a, uh, I mean, right time to reevaluate his equation. I shall just talk about. I shall not talk about much of its application, but the genesis of the equation, why he landed up with this equation, how, and also about its significance uh, even, even today. So AKR in 1950s, uh, when he was a young physicist, his main concern was about the cosmological singularity. So his idea, his question was, is the cosmological singularity generic? Uh, or, and his work uh, in those days was mainly concerned with trying to find a singularity, singularity free cosmological solution. Uh, so I shall come to what do I mean by singularity now. So Hubble observed in 1929 that the galaxies are all moving away from each other. So if we look back in time, they were closer together. If we look further back, they were even closer together. And at some point of time, they must have been coming together at a single point. So it's easy to understand that they were they were not in the form of the matter that we see now, where it's some different from, where in the form of energy, but at a single point. And if we believe in the conservation of mass energy, if the total mass energy is conserved, then the density becomes infinite because Mass energy is finite divided by zero volume because everything was concentrated at a single space time part. So that is called singularity, cosmological singularity. Uh, so, yeah. So, what is the escape from this embarrassment? We know that we don't like physics, don't like the mathematicians also don't like singularity. What is the escape from this? Uh, what is the escape route from this embarrassment uh, of zero proper volume? 
One is perhaps the zero proper volume was reached at an infinite cost. Then we need not bother about it. Or if it is at a finite cost, then we have definitely to bother about it. Uh, even if it is several billion years ago, we have to bother mm -hmm. about it. The second way that we can escape from the singularity is that so if, if we go back in time, it, the volume decreases, that's fine. But if we go back in time, if it reaches a minimum, and then for further <coughs> back in time, it goes up, then there's a minimum of volume, and the notion of zero proper volume doesn't matter. So these two are the risk uh, way of escape. Okay. So, uh, so as from a Hubble's observation also, I mean, we, we realize that the universe is expanding, so we need to model it, right? You cannot ask the universe to evolve all over again, ask in the laboratory and check different initial conditions. So we have to model it, and to some, we have to predict certain things from the model and check whether they are fine or not. Okay, so to model the universe, the first, uh, so there are three basic assumptions. The first one is that, as we observe, the universe is homogeneous and isotopic in space. What do we mean by that? That if we say that there is a galaxy, if we can observe some at some point of time, we observe a galaxy, at some other point we have a galaxy, and in between there is almost nothing. So how we can call it a call it homogeneous? Because if we take a we have to think about the scale. Uh, we are talking at the present moment, we are talking about a scale of let's say maybe to about 10 light years. If we take a volume of which the radius is around 10 to 7 light years, then and have that sphere at various points, at various domains in the universe, we'll find the number of galaxies in the same. It's almost like the kinetic theory assumption uh, that the, uh, we talk about a uniform density gas, but uh, you know that the mean free path is much bigger than the size of the molecule, but why do we call it? Uniform again because of the scale. If you take one cubic centimeter of volume at various points or various locations of the volume, we shall get the number of same number of molecules. In this way, it was homogeneous and also isotropic, meaning it looks the same in all possible directions. Number two is that the what is the matter content in the universe? The galaxies are the building blocks, but the galaxies are distributed in the form of a fluid. So uh, the fluid is given by the stress energy tensor, where, where this equation, rho and p are the density and pressure of the fluid, and v mu is the velocity vector. We know that we are after the advent of special relativity. Uh, we we shall talk about space time dimension. Uh, we, we shall talk about space time rather than space. So we have a four velocity, four dimensional velocity. So v mu is the four velocity. And also, uh, to model the universe, uh, we need some interaction, right? And strong and weak force easily are ruled out because they are very, very small scale things. And electromagnetic interaction and gravity, they are the only thing which are long range. But electromagnetic interactions are, I mean, cannot, cannot lose the dynamics of the universe because the universe is found to be on the average electrical neutral. So gravity, although it's by far the weakest among the all interactions, is the force which governs the dynamics of the universe. So and so and general relativity is the direct theory of gravity that we shall assume. So I, we shall assume Einstein's equation g mu is equal to minus eight pi g g mu. Capital G is the uh, uh, Newtonian constant of gravity. G mu mu is called the Einstein tensor. Right. Which involves the second order derivative up to second order derivatives of the metric tensor complex. Okay. <clears throat> so let us look at it in a bit general way. Einstein's equations. Uh, we can uh, we can write down the Einstein's equations uh, with this assumption of homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, and the last equation is the basic Einstein equation. We shall get two equations like that. For this kind of a uh, distribution, and we can combine these two equations to get this kind of an object. A double dot by A is equal to minus 4 by G over 3 rho plus 3 
A is called the scale factor of the universe, which comes in the matrix that I wrote in the first line uh, in the previous page. So it gives you the scale of the universe, right? So, so a double dot, a dot will be a derivative with respect to the cosmic time. So a double dot by a is minus 4 pi g over 3, that is rho plus 3. Now you see rho plus 3p is indeed positive. Capital G is always positive. No question about 4 pi over 3. So this acceleration is always negative. So, right. Any For any matter distribution, this is the key equation. So a double dot is a negative definite uh, object indicating that there is no minimum of volume. If we talk about a minimum of volume, you know that, that the second derivative a dot has to be a dot as it gives the scale, a q will give the volume. So a dot will have to be zero at a minimum and a double dot has to be positive. But we know we see that the a double dot is negative definite. So there is no minimum. And you also find from our model that the universe uh, actually uh, was had a singularity at a finite parts around 10 to the power, around 13.7 billion years ago. So we have there is no escape from this singularity. Uh, so so before we go into more detail, I shall also make a comment which perhaps all of us know that. This theoretical model of the singularity or a double dot by a, whatever we are written, came in fact before Hubble's observation in 1922 through Friedman's uh, model. Right. But anyway, <coughs> now the question that is asked is is this singularity an artifact of the high degree of symmetry? We assume a homogeneity and cost, cost, uh, isotropy of the a special set for the space question. Is the singularity uh, an artifact of this high degree of symmetry. Uh, and uh, in what ways the departure from the high degree of symmetry can uh, appear for a general kind of a space time? If we, uh, so this is a theoretical problem, although observation tells us that the universe is homogeneous and high degree of Theoretically, we know uh, that, uh, so, uh, but so that is fine. But, but if even for, uh, and not so much of a degree of symmetry. If we have the singularity, then this is you know, this singularity has to be a very generic uh, drawback of generativity. That was the notion. So, does this departure from departure from symmetry have any role to play in avoiding the singularity? This was actually this question. So, uh, yeah. So. So how to find out in what ways we can depart from this uh, high degree of symmetry? So what we are interested in, what we already talked about, uh, a geodesic motion, the velocity vector of the part. So from the velocity vector, we can construct various scalars, which will give us the, this departure from uh, the or, or, or from the high degree of symmetry. All the so yeah, there are three routes in which we can depart from this high degree of symmetry constructed from this velocity vector and its derivatives. Derivatives, of course, in a tensorial way. Some technicalities, but anyway, that will not uh, be uh, thought about very seriously now. So there are. Four quantities I have defined. Actually, one is to given a star. So this is already there, even with this symmetry that is there, which is called the expansion scalar theta, which is the fractional rate of increase of the volume of the universe. Right. In the in the Friedman model that we have written, that comes out to be three a double dot. Sorry, three a dot by a. So that is that is the um, called the expansion scalar. So star would mean that that does not give you any departure from this high degree of symmetry. <laughs> the next one comes uh, if the covariant divergence of the acceleration vector are, arise from inhomogeneity, inhomogeneity or any non gravitational forces. So if there is any other force other than gravity, then the motion will not be geodesic. 
Right. For instance, if there is a pressure gradient, uh, then also the, the, the motion will not be reduced. So in this way, we can depart from, with inhomogeneity, we can depart from this uh, high degree of symmetry in one direction. And that is brought about by the axial divergence of the acceleration uh, in, in the equation. Right. Number two is the shear. If the universe expands uh, equally in all directions, then there is no shear. It's isotropic. If we have a departure from this isotropy, the universe expands in different way in different directions, then of course uh, there can be something which is called shear, which can also be constructed. Is the drawing? No. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, including all this, gradually we constructed this equation. Uh, theta, a, a comma will indicate a, an ordinary partial derivative, 
with respect to the coordinate, let's say, x mu. So theta is the expansion of scalar. It's derivative with respect to the coordinates and take the position along the time duration. Velocity vector is a time-like vector because we are dealing with <coughs> time-like particle, meaning a particle with a mass. Uh, plus the divergence of the acceleration term with the negative sign in front. Theta, how what the theta square theta is the expansion of scalar plus two sigma square minus omega square is equal to r mu v mu v mu. And v is the velocity vector as we already pointed out. And r mu nu is the, we call the Ricci tensor, which is formed out of the Ricci tensor component, small g mu, which in and r mu nu involves at most the second derivative of g mu. Right. This is the famous right in the equation. And the important point to note, this equation utilizes the equations of Riemannian and geometry. The relativity is not yet involved. So even given the geometry, whether the relativity or not, uh, we can arrive at this equation. We shall come to the geodesics a bit later, but anyway. So the omega is the vorticity. Omega is the vorticity. Yeah. Omega is the vorticity. Generativity is yet to be invoked. So, if you want to invoke it, you use the Einstein's equation and replace R mu. To do that, you will get. So, it's a, this is a bundle of uh, geodesics that's it's essentially what they are. Right, right. I shall come to that. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's not working. It's but that's not easy. I think that's. Uh, as I, I've been talking about. So where does generality come into the picture? If you want to replace uh, Ricci tensor from Einstein's equations, so you, this, then you will say that, well, I need this in general relativity, not in, not only, in, uh, not in general, in geometry in general, then you uh, invoke Einstein's equation through this argument. And the right-hand side of this right hand equation becomes uh, this, minus four pi g, Rho plus 3. What we have done, we have replaced this R mu nu with the Einstein's equation. G mu nu is equal to minus 8 by 2 mu. Then you will get this equation. Yeah. Uh, with a fluid like this, right to the equation takes the form theta naught plus 1 third theta square is equal to minus 4 pi g rho plus 3 p plus the divergence of the acceleration minus 2 sigma square minus 2 omega square. And the, this right hand side theta naught plus one third theta square will will make uh, three a double dot by a, which we arrived at before for the Friedman kind of a system. So here the scale factor is different, can be different in different directions. So three a double dot by a is the average, a is the average scale factor of the universe. So here also you can see that in order to Avoid the singularity of zero dimension, a minimum is required. A double dot should be positive at the extreme, which with valid with valid energy conditions, meaning that rho plus 3p should be positive. There can be contributions only from two quantities. One is omega square, the other is the acceleration, uh, divergence of the acceleration term. Because you can see that sigma square will contribute negatively. And rho plus 3p, uh, that term also contributes negatively. Uh, sigma square also does that. So only the only possibility is the divergence of acceleration and the omega square, which can contribute positively. If any one of them or both together can dominate over the others, we can have a singular solution. So this was the outcome of right Yeah. So the, the original of original version of right equation did not look like that. Original version of right equation was this: a double dot by a 
is equal to minus 4 pi g over k to rho minus sigma square plus 2 third omega square plus lambda by 3. Mind you, he considers lambda as well. The cosmological constant which was introduced by Einstein to have a static kind of a universe. Even if you can forget about it, you can see the absence of the divergence of the acceleration time and that of the pressure. So for the for the for the sake of simplicity, right, we did not consider pressure to start with. But rho and rho plus ct we uh, I will continue the similar way. The only important thing that he missed is the divergence of the acceleration curve. What? Rajudri was interested in geodesic motion, only gravity. And if there is only gravity and no other no other forces, the motion will be geodesic and the acceleration will be zero. That was his idea. The equation that we wrote in the previous page, this in this form or or yeah. So, or even, yeah. In this form was written by Jürgen Ehlers. So, so the, the right to the equation that we look at it now as we have written it before, uh, as we have already shown, was found out by Ehlers after writing the gave his equation. Uh, so Ehlers first published in a German in German language, and he refused to give an English translation because he said that the original uh, contribution from Raichudri is so great that he doesn't want to compete with that. So anyway, so later, I mean, it was... Uh, published in GRG as a golden oldie. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they worked on the in a journal club. They saw that paper, was so impressed. That's what they, yeah, that's right. It. So, that is a different story. Yes. Yeah, yes. so Ehlers was not uh, involved in that. Sachs was involved. Sachs was involved. Yeah. So, yeah, so, but uh, very recently I came to learn that. Uh, that Rajudri wrote a paper in 1957 where he did not include the divergence of acceleration term, but he gave an indication that if we start from Ehlers did the work in 1960, 61. Yeah. And if we start from the commuted, I mean, unlike the ordinary partial derivative, successive differentiations in the tensorial way do not commute. So actually indicated that if we start from the commutator of the covariant derivative of the velocity vector, we can still arrive at this equation, in which in which will include the inhomogeneities in the form of acceleration. But he did not work out that. So Ehlers did that in 1961. So so that is the final form of Rajudri equation. Yeah. So uh, so I shall give you two examples, which are very important uh, examples of similarity free cosmological solutions. Uh, but, uh, but they are not really very physical. The first solution is given by Godel in 1949, long before Raichi's solution. But it has its own problem. Uh, it has close time light lines. Close time lag lines meaning you can go back in time. So the causality will break down. So we don't like such kind of a universe because we shall not be able to do any physics. We shall lose all our profession. So uh, well, we can do time travel. We can do time travel. <laughs> That's more exciting. More exciting. <laughs> but, but as physics, we shall lose all our job. So, yeah. So this is unphysical. And yeah, Godel was not a physicist, he was a mathematician and good, philosopher. Mathematician and philosopher, right. So he yeah. saved his profession. <laughs> saved his profession. And the second example came in 1990, much later, by Jose Senovia, a Spanish mathematician. So uh, he gave a single DP solution. And there was a lot of um, human time with this solution because he did not 
it did not do any harm to the energy conditions. Low plus CP was very much positive. But still, it gave it, it, uh, had, had no similarities. The problem of the physical problem of this solution was that he assumed a cylindrical system. Our universe does not have an actual system. It's isotropic. So, but anyway, it, uh, academically, it was a great solution because it gives you uh, assimilated resolution. No cylindrical symmetry in the space. space Cyl part cylindrical space. symmetry in the space part. Right. So, but our universe is specially isotropic. Uh, can we imagine this at the later part, the earlier part, uh, if there is no transition? I shall come to, uh, not really your question, but I shall come to another word by Rajuli, okay. which will kind of answer your question. Yeah, that can be, that can be one of the possibilities. Because when, yeah, because one works with Bianchi cosmology, mm -hmm. which is an isotope. The idea is, at some point of time, that could have been, uh, we could have had an, an isotope universe, but it isotropized with time. Right. So this kind of things could have. Yeah. So the Sanovana uh, solution, I have not. I, I yeah. remember seeing this, but I never bothered. To. Yeah. So is yeah. It, it? It doesn't uh, violate the strong energy. Condition. No, it violates no energy condition. Mm -hmm. But so Rai wrote a paper in 1998 alone in PRL, very short. The, the average values of the scalars, meaning mm -hmm. the expansion scalar. The density, the pressure, everything will be zero. So it's otherwise an empty universe. You know, on the average, it's an empty universe. So Minkowski is quite well expected. So there is no question of any singularity. That's true. So that is the move, uh, I mean, the actual theoretical difficulty of the solution. Uh, yeah. And AK was in his uh, 780s or something. I don't know. Oh, he was 77. Okay. 70, yeah, close to 77. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we have dealt with the time-like uh, thing that is uh, velocity vector of a particle which has a mass. What happens to photons, a null particle? Sachs did it. Sachs arrived at the equation, the Rachel the equation for light rays in 1961. For light rays also, you can write down similar equation. And uh, uh, on the right hand side, we have R mu nu, N mu, N mu. N mu is the velocity vector of a null particle that of a photon, meaning that, uh, I mean, the, the modulus of that velocity vector will be zero. Uh, yeah. Uh, so N is a null vector. Um, so the acceleration will have to be defined in terms of that. So it's a bit different, but anyway, the equation is similar. Uh, and Sachs arrived at that. So, okay. So, I shall talk about the singularity in a bit more, a slightly more sophisticated way, and where your idea about the bunch of geodesics will come in. So, we talked about the singularity in terms of the zero proper volume. But in general relativity, is a geometric theory. So, how do we talk about the uh, singularity? So, if we talk about the geodesics, the motion of the particles, the trajectories of the particles, and not one of them, many of them, a lot of them, most of them, all of them, with different initial conditions, they will all focus at a single point. So, that is actually the definition of the singularity. Singularity in general relativity, that your at some point your geodesic motion will be inextendable, very much similar to the lines of force that we have for a point charge. Suppose you have a point charge, so lines of force will emanate from that, or if it is a positive and negative charge, lines of force will focus into that. Both of for both of them we have focusing, and at the site of the charge we have a singularity. The similar singularity will happen here as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And this, uh, so this focusing of this geodesics was the crucial thing for uh, a huge 
hugely <laughs> important uh, thing in linguistic astrophysics. Uh, yeah. The celebrated Hawking Pendle Singularity Theorem tells us that a geodesic incompleteness is unavoidable in classical general relativity. If the energy condition is satisfied, here it is rho plus p, not rho plus cp, because they consider the null particles, that is photons, for which it's correct, and there are no close time like lines. So the proof of the theorem actually starts from right to the equation. That, that is the basic building block here. Start from right to the equation and arrive at this equation. And for a detailed description, uh, one can go through the monograph by Hawking and it is. So I think I dropped that, but how much time do you have? About 10 minutes. About 10 minutes. Okay. So I think I shall uh, go through this first and then if we have time, I shall also tell you something more. So this is a kind of uh, uh, opinion of various people, various important people regarding the uh, importance of this uh, equation. George Ellis said that this is the, mind you, this is the fundamental equation of gravitational attractions. He doesn't say that Einstein's equations are the most fundamental equations for gravitational attraction. Rajudri equation is the most fundamental equation for the gravitational attractions. And Jürgen Ehlers, who actually extended Rajudri equation to include the acceleration terms, the paper reviewed here, paper meaning that uh, Rajudri's paper, Relativistic Cosmology 1, uh, is truly a, a landmark in cosmology. It showed how results are in principle observable and local variables can be obtained without imposition of isometries. It can be considered a forerunner in the program begun by Christian and Sachs and continued by George Ellis and his co-workers. Moreover, it paved the way to the famous penrose hawking energy theorems, singularity theorems. This was the assessment of George Julian Ehlers. And there is one more at least. Yeah. So this is uh, regarding some history of John Yerman, who was uh, a man of history of science. So he wrote this about the equation. The further evidence that is that of the sing that the singularity is unavoidable in classical general relativity. Uh, so he's saying is that further evidence was introduced in 1955 that in the cosmological context at least, singularities in general relativistic space times are not artifacts of symmetry assumption. The evidence came not from the heavens of general relativity in America or Europe, but from Calcutta. In 1953, Rajudri produced an analysis of cosmological singularities that was to have a profound effect on later developments, but, but because it ran into difficulties, the referee did not appear until 1955. So, uh, so as we have some time, I shall talk about uh, about the history of the uh, equation a bit. Uh, so, AKR had been working all along in those days. So now we talk about collaborations. Whenever we are in trouble, you can talk to people. AKR did not have that chance. Uh, he was working in the, as a lecturer in Ashton's College. Calcutta, where we first thought about this equation. Uh, 1953, he joined the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, Calcutta as a research officer. And his expectation was that he would have enough time for his work. In reality, he was asked by the director to work on solid state. And then he was also asked to work on quantum physics. Because they, uh, I, I shall not name the director, but the director said that, uh, you see, uh, this is his best of reality. These are useful things, you should do that. So, uh, both of them are actually nice, good, but they're definitely out of interest of CPR. But, but eventually he did both, quantum chemistry and some solid state physics. 
and he extended Poulson's work. Poulson, many of us have heard of him. The famous book called Balance is a, a compulsory for a chemistry student. Uh, he extended Poulson's work on three electron network approximation for pure metals. Poulson's idea was that it would not work for alloys. The actually showed that it would work for alloys as well. Wilson himself appreciated the work. And Wilson said that Lachelis note helped me a lot so I can still work with my patients. Not only is the compulsion doing something not of an interest, at the point of time, at some point of time, he was asked to sit in a small room which was used as a kitchen. So this is recorded, this is known. What is not known, that, uh, what is not recorded, that's why I did not write it. So one day in the evening, he was working in his office at ICS, and some students came <coughs> and said that, so you have to leave now because we shall have to cook for our lunch and dinner. So, but his interest in linguistic cosmology never ever did. We always talk about various problems that we face for our research, and his interest did not ever. A bit about the publication of the paper. Uh, the first version of the paper, which was which included some speculation as well, was sent to physical review as related to the editor. The title of the paper was Local Temporal Behavior of a Gravitating System in General Review. It was promptly rejected. The summary of the reference comments was that he could not understand where does the equation come from. And they can then remove the speculative part, named it as relativistic cosmology one and sent it to physical review as a regular paper in December 1952. There was no response from the journal in spite of repeated queries from the author. After about a year, the paper was sent to Zeitschrift for physics. But prompt came the rejection from the editor from Zeitschrift for physics, thankfully so, saying that there, saying that the, the results hardly had any impact. In February 1955, the editor of Physical Review wrote that he could finally recover the report from the who would recover his publication. So he had to fight a lot for the publication of the paper as well. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So actually sent to the German paper, uh, journal uh, without knowing what is the status of his... No, no, because after several Queries, several reminders, there was no response. Yeah, but so he, he, said, he did not formally withdraw. No, he did not formally withdraw. It, but I, I'm not sure, but perhaps it's like that. I don't think yeah, there are options it. like that, right? Yeah, I mean, this is a review, right? Surface yeah. names, not emails. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> no, you have to, yeah, you have to send a letter and send it by email. In fact, we did, we sent papers like that, you know, a beginning PhD grade. Uh, yeah. So okay. I think I shall stop here uh, before reading the last page. But uh, so if I have two three minutes, I shall yeah, yeah, please, please give some anecdotes. So after hearing such things, one may uh, one may assume that Ikr was a very absent-minded professor, but he was not. He was very careful. Uh, I give my uh, observation, but you can ask his daughters, Parangoma and uh, Madhukhara, they will also say that, that their father was, the, oh, he always wore dhoti and panjari, but they were always very careful about whether the dhoti is cleanly washed and ironed and things like that. But what I, we observed, not I, we, like many of the friends here, had their undergraduate days in Kolkata, and Kolkata is too new. So, in those days in Presidency College, we used some paper duster. So, Rajadri used to have the paper dust duster on his right hand, in his dhoti, and the kocha in his left hand. And he used to face his, uh, I mean, like his love is, uh, face with the dhoti, end, kocha, and the board with the Cloth duster. So waited for five years. We never saw the other way around. We never wiped his face 
The other thing is that once, uh, uh, so when he starts generating, that I use always when I start generating teaching my students. So what is the philosophy of generating? If you go to the Kartgodam railway station and ask a mathematician, can you give me the trajectory of the train car? The mathematician will say, of course, I can do that. Uh, you give me the force on the train car, the second order differential equation. So give me two initial conditions. So I shall, or in fact, six initial conditions, so three dimensional equation. And I shall solve the Newton's law. Force is equal to mass times acceleration and give you the trajectory. So we shall always be impressed that the mathematician knows so many things. But if you ask a porter, what will be the trajectory of the train car? He will say that, don't you see the rail lines are there? And that is the trajectory. <laughs> so the philosophy of generativity is to lay the rail lines, the geodesics. Now, so that was his first day of generativity. And I always use this uh, analogy for myself. And uh, for teaching as well, uh, he was always very humorous. I shall give one anecdote on that. In our class, he was talking about the Penrose process of extracting energy from black hole. For a Schwarzschild black hole, the event horizon and the static limit are the same surface. So there is no other surface, only one surface. For a spinning black hole, like a car black hole, there are two. The inside one is the event horizon through which nothing comes out. But the outer one is called the static limit, where nothing, you can not keep anything stationary. But you can bring something back from there. It's not an even value. So if you send a particle there, and if the particle breaks into two, when one part goes into the black hole, it is a bound system. So it will have negative energy. To conserve energy, the other part, which is still in the static unit, will have enhanced positive energy. It will come back with enhanced energy. So Penrose's idea was, I mean, uh, so in this way, we can solve two critical problems of the world today. One is that of energy and the other is that of garbage. If we can make an aircraft in such a way that in, inside the static limit it breaks into two parts and if our engineering is such that the garbage goes into the event horizon, the, uh, the clean part will come back with get rid of it. And once we stands up and say, sir, what if the garbage comes back? <laughs> so, right, you must prepare for this. Okay. In fact, he laid uh, in such a way that one asks this thing. Immediately said that I said that if our engineering is such, you are a very bad engineer. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I shall tell you uh, something about where I got this history, etc. History of the publication of the paper can be found in the exchange of letters between John Yearman and A. Carey in 1955. The reference was given in the previous page. The history of the days of uh, the relentless fight can be found from Ikea's diary. Both these are included in an anthology of various writings of Ikea, Atuji Gasha, edited by his younger daughter, Paul Wong. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Banerjee, for this is an amazing talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so I will take this opportunity for questions, especially from the younger audience. Please go ahead, ask. This is your chance. Not so young. Doesn't want to remind that he's not young. Compared to us. Yeah, so uh, the thing is that um, the actual equation uh, has nothing to do particularly with generativity. Yeah, to start with, to start with, you can impose generativity. Yeah, it's it's only right. one application. Right. There could be other applications. Who know? Absolutely. No, no, many people know. It's being applied to many various things. So, uh, for the application part, Shahan would have been a better person than me. Uh, in low, in where Shahan as well, he could not come. In uh, wherever you have memory, you can apply that in in any kind of journey. Yes, but you, need a, you need a basically a, a, a membrane. 
Yeah. So, uh, so it came from Riemannian geometry. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of, it's not a really a question, but I was just curious that uh, Riemann and then later people did many things about using the geometry. Nobody particularly worked on this or this. No, 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 no. I don't know why, no. because uh, perhaps, no. I, I don't know, but perhaps they did not have any motivation. Rajendri had a motivation. He wanted to find a singularity free solution of geometry. And, and, I shall you, you say, I shall give you two comments. One is that your first question is right. So, Rajudri equation is essentially a, is an identity in general. In reality, it has nothing to do with it to, to start with. Secondly, but the important thing is that Rai himself was interested in physics, not in even in geometry that much. So he started with uh, one of the Einstein situations, in fact, the zero zero component of uh, 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 Einstein equation. And that's why he did not write down the acceleration that I went for the acceleration part. But he was not interested in non geodesic motions as well. But he indicated later that that can be derived from a human geometry configuration completely. But uh, by the commutator of the covariant derivative of the velocity vector. But his initial uh, take on it was from the general degree. Because his interest was to find a non simulation. Okay. Because Einstein's equation totally rests on human geometry. Yes. In the beginning of the equations, you said that the only gravity is important when you look at the evolution of the cosmos and not the electromagnetic in the forces, etc. Right, right. But when we go back to the singularity, it's very small scales. Everything should become important. Right, right, right. At small scale. You know, at the large scale, only gravity is important. The non gravitational forces can arise from, not from these interactions, but let's say from the pressure radio. From the homogeneity other things. But if you go to small, small scales, very small scales, then not definitely. I mean, to start with, uh, all the interactions will be important. You can go through any, uh, I mean, thermal history of the, of the universe. In the very beginning, up to, let's say, one second or even a few minutes, other interactions also will be there. Okay. As you said, the universe is uh, homogeneous all around. Homogeneous and in the beginning, fashion, it, fashion. Fashion. in the beginning, it may not be. May be it may not be. Uh, there, there is speculation, but also, uh, I mean, uh, perhaps in the beginning also it was homogeneous. Uh, there are indications like that. I can quote an observation from plant satellite data. You can see that the, the temperature and isotropy is there, and the temperature and isotropy is how much? Tell me how much. It's 10 to minus 5. Scale. 10 to the minus, absolutely, you're right. 10 to the minus 5. But that's later. To uh, so, yeah, and that is required for the structure formation. Yeah. And that is required at a smaller scale. At smaller scale, you have galaxies. You have structure. Yeah. For the for the, for the the formation of the galaxies, that much of an isotope is required. Right. Yeah. So it's not, a, it's a 10 to the minus 5. 1 in 10 to the minus 5. It's very small. So, uh, uh, as we know that uh, Raichudha himself was not a believer of uh, the modern cosmology, the Big Bang cosmology. No, no, actually it's, it's not like that. Uh, he, he, well, then he believed it. Yeah. So, no, what, what I was just, uh, because Raichudha's equation is very general, you know, for any Riemannian uh, kind of a surface, it can be applied. And, uh, has there been any work done? I mean, of course, it has been done, I guess. But where you don't impose the generativistic, uh, I mean, conditions, and then see how in, it in gravity, in, in gravity, no, in gravity, you have to, you have to do gravity. No, no, I, I believe that. I don't. I'm not saying that. Has it been done? Like, I mean, you just don't impose the. Uh, not in gravity, but you know, I, as you said, I mean, for membranes, yeah. even if there is no gravity, that you can. In some water waves as well, 
Yeah, you can uh, so no generalities. Yeah. You are working with Newtonian generalities, but you can employ a generalization. Of course. Maybe uh, I have some astrophysical kind of inclination. So what he meant by maybe other theories of gravity. Yeah. That's what other you were, theories. Yeah, other, other scale up fields. Okay, 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 okay. How it varies. I think that's right, what he was saying. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. Now it's no yeah, in that case, the Isaac equation will have to be deeply modified. Okay. But that's it, because we are still working with the equation in this, but there will be other terms. More terms. Let's say in FR gravity or in Brown's D kind of scalar tensor theory, yeah. you can apply the equation. And uh, I have a question if I. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious about uh, uh, in in a slide where you showed that uh, to go into the GR you uh, uh, introduce the Einstein tensor. Right, right, right. So to go in before, I mean before, uh, is there a step uh, in in that it it involves the GPU also? Uh, human is already, already no. Human is always there. So what? Paul, Paul what Paul metric is, is that? Uh, I mean, right, 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 right. So which which in, right. involves Ricky right. tensor and Ricky scalar? It's a good question. The Isaac equation, as I wrote down for the first time, and which was finally written by Taylor, does not talk about any specific metric or all kinds of metrics. No symmetry assumption. Nothing. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if you have other questions, maybe I will ask them. Uh, so everything is great. Um, so I always wondered why AKR put that lambda in this equation. No, yeah, at that time, yeah, I don't know. I never asked him. But this is something I always wondered. Oh, I didn't yeah, have the courage yeah. to ask him. Uh, yeah. I bet it you know, in our PhD. Because I mean, I think I think the equation. Uh, no, no, but at that time, you were new. Uh, yeah, was, but he did not give any importance to that. Yes, that's but right. He, uh, maybe or, next, uh, as a matter of generalization, uh, he's good. The yes. sake of completeness. Right? sake of completeness. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or maybe get an additional contribution that he may be interested. Yeah, maybe that's. Uh, so, one thing I usually wants to say that um, his paper was published in. 1955. Okay. The year I'd say Oh, that's true. So we didn't have a chance to have his opinion on this particular. That was really great. Yeah, in that connection, I, I know I had some very nice uh, interaction with uh, Professor Ailes. Uh, I was in Germany for many, many years. So you know, he used to come over and you know, check. So the, and he would tell out the stories about his. That the contribution even give me a copy of that paper if I'm not mistaken. Uh, like some, but uh, I think uh, all this happened, and I think he came to India and then went back. And I think he died within a month or something like that. Is he only considered coming to India as a yes, spiritual? He came many times. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I'm sure that you know him much yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. He was considered as the you know father figure of relativity in Germany. But of course, it's different, but modern definitely. Anyway, so. So, so uh, about uh, in those question, I mean, as you said that he perhaps did not believe in the standard feedback cosmology. It's not like that because Jan Marligar once gave one of his books to AKR as a presentation. So he wrote, although you have standard, standard ideas, I think you will like it. <laughs> standard ideas meaning standard big bang. <laughs> we have one more question. So I have a quick comment since Professor Vanity uh, has listed some of the resources. Uh, I think in the early 2000s, three of uh, AKR students, including Professor Vanity, they did an extensive uh, interview of him uh, on video on his uh, life and work and that video is uh freely available on youtube and it's a, it's an excellent resource and the, it is in bengali but there are english uh, subtitles and also professor pc interviews yeah yeah, yeah. there are two so there's a few company i forgot the name they filmed both of them in the same year 
2005. So, yeah, so one on the Kyat, the other one on the Kyat. Yeah, I remember. Both of them were released in Pune. So the shooting took place in March. And the, uh, that was, um, they were released in Pune in 2000, in July. And EKR passed away in June. Yeah, okay. just said me. So, in fact, I recall that I took his wife, Mashima, to, you know, for the release of the picture. I think those comments, uh, let's stand over speaker again and whatever. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's break for tea. We we'll come back. Okay. We come back at three thirty five. Finally, you came. Where is the Banjan? He's just sleeping. <laughs> So you, you came by train? Yes. Uh, don't ask me. <laughs> so where is the connector for the HDMI? Can we have Zoom participant here? I can log into someone and then do it. What thing is? Is there a cable warp here? See, my hair. No, then I will log into someone and share my screen. Oh, they will log into the I know that. The thing is, if I play some movies, then the movies in over Zoom become very choppy. Let me try it out. Yeah, I'll take it. Let me put some time in front. Uh, nine three five three. Has the Zoom details been sent out over email? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how are you? How are you logging into Zoom? Uh, Zoom has been uh, given the ID. He is giving the ID. Yes. 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 Yeah, yes. Yeah, just change one with Okay, so tomorrow. Ah, the console is shared. So, here uh, the console, I think, is it or is it? It's both the same. So, maybe the third one. Manora. Make sure you get the microphone. Hi, it's Amma Manish. Hi, Amma Manish.
Oh, yes. I was constantly guiding me. <laughs> and then I was changing my plan. <laughs> it was total chaos. So, if the flight uh, was means got cancelled today, he would have written to me. Uh, yeah, the, the flight would have been cancelled. As I told you, I had planned to just give a Zoom talk from Delhi airport and go back. I'll <laughs> use <laughs> the hotspot. <laughs> I actually got lucky. No, they didn't do that for us. So they cancel our ticket, say that you get reimbursement. That's all. So I said, can we book it next? No. And that's another thing. And then they, what they did was, uh, they waited the others till 5 o'clock so to, to tell that's cancelled. No, for me it was different because apparently I could I arrived when the flight was still yeah, on. Your connection, uh, yeah. no, no, your connection. Yes, ah. so I missed the connection, so it was their fault for yeah. me missing the connection. You were lucky that you got hotel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and on time. <laughs> no, I, I would have told you to wait till 5.30. I cancelled the train from Pune Airport. Oh, like before boarding the flight, I cancelled the train because this guy promised me that I would be able to catch the other flight. Okay. So this guy first told me that that, that flight is cancelled. Then he said, no, no, that flight is okay. But it's then then it eventually got cancelled. Yeah. <laughs> How was the flight today? Flight was absolutely perfect. So are they going back?
Sudhir Gorai. And the uh, title of his talk is General Relativistic Hydrodynamic Sim Simulations Around Equating Blankets. so what is it? okay um uh, i'm sudip karai uh, uh, i work at uh, isa kolkata i'm actually to bps and cc um uh, so in today's presentation, we will um, uh, present our uh, ongoing effort of developing the multi-system software um, at our lab. Uh, so this work that uh, so it's an ongoing work. It will take some time to reach to its goal. I mean, it will be never ending. So uh, so for the work that we are going to um, to present today, this is part of. Uh, Pranajit's MS thesis. So he was uh, worked with me for a year. And um, so I actually started teaching at IPA for the first time. So the entire year I was busy, first time teaching. So it's uh, busy with teaching. So most of the work Pranajit actually did. So, um, so is this on? Okay. So the uh, motivation for generativistic solution is for, uh, especially for accreditating black holes is very obvious, uh, close to the black hole. I mean, in, in strong gravity, we need to, to simulate the fluid dynamic motion correctly. Uh, we need to include the generativistic effects. Um, and for us, uh, the, the additional motivation is that we want to learn the technicalities of this GR hydro uh, codes uh, so that we can include the algorithmic developments that we are doing uh, into uh, this and bring those to this GR hydro community. Uh, so we are at the very beginning stage, we are just <laughs> learning the technicalities, uh, incorporating the simple standard algorithms, developing our subroutines. And once this basic subroutines are developed, then we will start improving. So, First, uh, so in this talk, we will show very uh, some initial results. So not not too many uh, details have been developed so far. So I'll start with some uh, mathematics. So in uh, GR hydro, uh, we basically solve uh, two conservation equations. One is the mass, uh, matter uh, current density, and another is the stress energy. So those are represented by this two covariant derivative equal to zero. And we define this enthalpy with this, and we also need uh, equation of state closure relationship uh, in density and pressure. And these equations, these two equations are further uh, algebraically manipulated to obtain the uh, equations which we can numerically solve. So uh, for, uh, for our current work, we basically followed this manuals at all paper and many other papers who have been followed a similar technique for uh, manipulating these equations, putting them into a solver form on computer, etc. So uh, most of the GR hydro uh, GR image decomposition they do in three plus one formalism where they break this four uh, dimensional space time into one time plus three space called sigma is equal to constant uh, t. Uh, hypersurface, and then they write the metric into that format. Uh, in, in that form, they get lap C and write the conservation equation uh, into uh, that, uh, uh, that that metric form. Okay, um, so for our case, we uh, use a fixed background metric uh, written uh, in VL coordinate. PR theorem phi, and we do not evolve the metric. So we are not doing any uh, numerical relativity. Uh, and uh, the equations that I wrote in the previous slide, so those can be written 
in the form of well-known uh, fluid dynamic equation, but this uh, is analogous to the continuity equation in hydro. This is the momentum conservation equation. And this is uh, the last one is the uh, energy conservation equation. And this uh, is so these equations. Uh, we uh, have some common um, uh, structure. So that common structure is apparent here. So we basically write uh, some time derivative of some conserved quantity plus divergence of some flux is equal to some source. So um, uh, where this conserved quantities are this D, S, J, uh, this is momentum and the energy density. And um, so we uh, we define some variables uh, we call which we call fluidity variables. Those are basically the density, velocity, and pressure. And the conserved variables are uh, the momentum, energy density, and this density. Density times the Lorentz factor. So this primitives and conserved. So we write the equation in terms of conserved variable. Evolve the uh, conserved quantities in time to get the updated conserved variables. And then when you try to see the, uh, so usually when you talk about density, velocity, pressure, then you need to get those from these quantities. Okay, that's the way we, uh, uh, so these we call just the primitive variables. And we define the Lorentz factor here as usual one minus this square and this gamma ij is the spatial part of the matrix. So g mu nu is broken into three plus one. So that three space, that metric is uh, this gamma i metric. Okay. And here we have the fluxes. So those are also written again from that equation that we showed previously. And then on the right hand side, because of the uh, space time metric, we get some source term, some uh, the 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 space energy tensor shifts a derivative of metric and all these things uh, shifts on the uh, right hand side. So these equations, this differential equation, so this uh, we call differential form, this differential equation is further uh, written in the integral form. Yeah. So you have some constraint equations there, right? In the three plus one combination, you have constraints and evolution. This evolution along with the, so uh, did I miss something? Uh, uh, what what constraint? These, these the are the constraint equation for the you know uh, the the three metric. Uh, the metric is not about metric is space. We would not. We... Yeah, yeah, but it satisfies certain you know. So it's like the the three plus one combination. The right, right. It, it's yeah. a constraint and the evolution. So the constraint still needs to be solved to get value for you know what you call as the. <laughs> I don't know. No, 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 it's a fixed matrix, stationary matrix. Oh, so matrix, matrix, matrix. matrix. Yes, yeah, oh, matrix. Yeah, matrix. Either shield yeah, or car shield. Fixed background matrix. Okay, so fixed background matrix. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Because I saw okay. only, he saw only the coordinates. So I thought, why yeah. happened? Okay. Sure. He got misled by you by your utterance of the word numerical relativity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I wrote one, yeah. one part that uh, fixed pattern might be okay. Now, again, this thing started. What's the end? What's the name? No, even we know. Just my name, not something. Yeah. Just... yeah. That's the top. Okay. This. No, okay, that the first. <laughs> and then some.
So this one I I'll stop here. Okay. 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 Stop it. Okay. But it will stop in the I mean, so let's move from this. there. <clears throat> so I will. Okay. Uh, how can I go back? Back, back. Last one. Hello, one. This one. Okay, I'm present. So this one is forward. This one is backward. So this is down one. Up and up. Up. This is forward. Oh, what's it? This one there. And this is back. Oh, okay. so this is forward and this one back. Okay. And the top one is pointer point. Okay. Yeah. So we choose a fixed background matrix. So Mac metric is uh we do not evolve the matrix at all. We choose it and then keep it. Um okay. So we further um uh, Okay, so these equations uh, are further written uh, in integral form and then we solve it using a uh, finite value method. So, in finite value method, what you do is that we choose a computational domain. Um, we discretize the uh, space, space as well as the time uh, uh, of the computation domain, and uh, in each volume, we basically initialize the conserved quantity. So it's a volume average quantity, conserved quantity that we start with, and we calculate the fluxes, and then using uh, you know divergence theorem, the fluxes are written as closed surface integral uh, flux dot ds, and that uh, how we evolve. Uh, this conserved quantity. So, uh, so for the present work that I'm going to present today, we use a source child metric. The curve metric is not yet done. And since we are beginning, we hard code all the geometric quantities, the metric, the crystal ball connections, everything. So these quantities are required for calculating the source terms. So we uh, uh, ideally, uh, this would be uh, calculated through some numerical scheme also to make it so consistent, but we just starting with the hard coding and this thing on this level. So in general domestic uh, hydrodynamics code, we found, uh, we we know that uh, one uh, uh, technical difficulty is the conversion of conserved to primitive quantities. So I just showed that conserved quantities are certain quantities and we need to know the density, velocity, temperature, Pressure, temperature, etc. So that conversion is actually nonlinear. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, so I found that there are uh, for hydro, uh, there are two ways we can uh, do this con conversion. So we can either so we can do some algebraic manipulation, write the correct equation between the conserved quantity and primitive quantity. Do some algebraic manipulation. You can either solve for velocity, actually v squared. This is written, for example, in Delzano's uh, work. Or we can solve for pressure, uh, as per, uh, I mean, uh, one example is in Minoni Mino, Mino, Mino and Boro. Uh, so we can solve either for velocity and pressure, uh, solve certain nonlinear equations through numerical uh, techniques, uh, and then uh, we get either the V squared, and then from there, we can uh, calculate back pressure, the velocity components, and density. Alternatively, one can solve for pressure, and then from that pressure, one can solve for one can calculate the velocity and density. So this is a tricky part, and many uh, GR hydro code uh, face problem uh, in this. I mean, uh, code clash actually happens in uh, this step when uh, the code in different grid points fail to do a convergence. Uh, uh, for, for 
so these are done either using neutron reaction or you know uh, so i i for example use the rt safe routine in uh, uh, the numerical recipe so so these are basically some uh, so neutron reaction for example iterative method so if the iteration doesn't converge uh, score so this is uh, th even for hydro life is simple for mhg uh, is is pathetic. So people use lots of protection to uh, for their code. So if if the convergence fails, people try to use the previous step solution or the solution using the surrounding zones, or they just set it floor. So different type of protection people use for this particular step. Uh, so for hydro, so we, we faced this kind of problem, and we also had to use uh, some sort of protection for us as well. So what was your choice of protection? So previous time step solution uh, is uh, and then reconstruction is uh, another thing uh, that uh, gives us the desired level of accuracy in the code. So when you solve differential equation, you want certain level of accuracy. So accuracy comes from the time integration accuracy as well as the spatial accuracy. Um, so as I told that we, we are starting with the volume average quantity. So we have a domain and we have volume average quantity to start with. But then we need point-wise values. So the fluxes are calculated at the phases. So from the volume average quantity, we need to calculate the flux. So what we do is that we give a polynomial representation of the volume average of the of the quantities of uh, interest. Like for example, in this code, we uh, we do the reconstruction in primitive variables. So we have to start with volume average density, volume average velocity, volume average pressure, but then I need the density value, pressure value, and the velocity value at the boundary. So what we do is we just give a polynomial representation of this density, velocity, pressure, and then if I need it at the boundary, I just give the location coordinate of that boundary into that polynomial, that gives me back the pointwise value. So that is, what is the reconstruction? So we did the reconstruction of the primitive variables with slight change. So we did not do exactly rho, vj, and p. Instead, we did rho, Lorentz factor times vj, and pressure. So this Lorentz factor times vj actually ensures subluminal reconstruction. So when we do reconstruction, so from the volume average quantity, if you want to get the point wave value, sometimes it happens that the velocity, the reconstructed, the polynomial velocity becomes more than c squared. And then that can cause code crash. In general activity, if something is uh, unphysical, code crash is the inevitable thing. So uh, we use this WBSJ square, and this gives, this ensures subluminal reconstruction. This has been shown uh, in uh, many papers from Mr. Ravan. So this is in Basra and Kim. Is you have taken? Is it the, where you are measuring this BJ? Who, which observer is measuring this BJ? So these are Eulerian observers. So in 3 plus 1 formalism, um, uh, there is a um, uh, unit vector perpendicular time like unit vector perpendicular to sigma is in a T constant surface. So if our observer is moving with that velocity, so along the along this uh, this so sigma t to the sigma sigma t so start you, whether it's in the local Lorentzian or it it is like uh, for example as far as I remember in Bengal's they uh, they did not exactly take the lo uh, local Lorentzian. It's, it's not local. Lorentzian. So they say that uh, they say that uh, if our observer is moving with the velocity along this uh, perpendicular in the in in uh, along this uh, this direction, then those are the Eulerian observer, and those Eulerian observer are measuring some velocity. So that velocity is it's, it's, life is easy if it's short shield, but if it is car, mm. then life is not that easy because. You have one more observer, right? LNRF. Uh, yeah. So, so, so you then, split uh, it up. Okay. Yeah. So then we have to see. I mean, the, those things are also done. I mean, uh, C plus one formalism in GR MSD is very common. So definitely, we have to see how how these are, uh, this can be done. So what I mean to say is that in general, if it is a local Lorentzian uh, observer who is measuring the three velocity, uh, local, then the transformation, this primitive variable, variable reconstruction is not a big deal. Okay. But in GR, in the Banuel's formalism, mm -hmm. it's not that trivial. It, it has mm -hmm. some complication. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, go ahead, okay. please. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have implemented so far, uh, the, the, we are basically doing the second order schemes, the min mod, MC, and value type scheme. 
And we also need the fluxes to evolve the volume average quantities. We have implemented HLL and NLF type driven solvers for completing the fluxes and time integration we are doing to start with uh, uh, the strong stability preserving uh, range of type integration. So we have uh, some initial results uh, for the source field. The first one is uh, the uh, error convergence test. For any code that we develop, we first do the error convergence test, whether it is getting the second order, so desired order of accuracy. If we want second order, whether in space and time, we are getting second order accuracy test or not. So for this kind of test problem, what we do is that we take a equilibrium solution of the underlying differential equation. So for our, our case, the underlying differential equation of the hydrodynamic equation and the steady state solution is obtained by throwing out the delta T part. That will give us a steady state solution analytically. Uh, static torus type solution, the torus is hiding here. So torus type solution, static uh, one can obtain. So this is basically balanced. So you can physically think of this as the, uh, uh, the balance between the inward gravity along with the pressure gradient and the centrifugal force. So if, if something matter is rotating like this, then the gravity is pulling it, and then the pressure gradient is acting outward, and the centrifugal force is acting outward. So the balance is basically what gives us the torus. So in general gravity also that kind of torus uh, uh, formation is possible. So we took the solution from this font and dynamic paper for this torus. And for our 1D test, we basically take just a uh, equi along the equatorial plane, whatever solution of this torus we will get, that solution we are initializing for our code. And we want to see if we evolve in time, whether that solution is getting maintained or not. And if it is maintained, then we just calculate the errors. So initial time solution is the uh, the uh, actual solution. And then we calculate the, we take the difference between the initial time solution and final time solution. Then we calculate the error. That error, we, what we, see, we want to see if it is giving us the desired convergence or not. And uh, there are some numbers. So in, the errors has to be usually, if we, Think of Taylor series errors for <laughs> second order are uh, of the order of h square. So that h square actually, um, if we do uh, certain uh, mathematical, uh, you know, manipulation, then the, that two will uh, can be extracted. So we should be able to get uh, a number uh, by analyzing those errors. We should be able to recover that two factor. So we see that uh, the the asymptotically we are achieving that second order accuracy for this code. So uh, this is a, a convergence test that we um, have done for our code. Uh, then we uh, wanted to see uh, some uh, spherical symmetry bond deaccretion is another analytical solution that we know of. We wanted to see if our code can simulate that. So for that, uh, we, uh, we compared the uh, analytical solutions with the numerical solutions. So we plotted the Mach number uh, of the bonding flow here. So radius versus the Mach number matches pretty well. So this simulation has been done uh, for the flow having specific energy of this much. And we use 256 ratio grid. Uh, the ratio, common ratio of the ratio grid is 1.02. And the simulation domain is between 2.2 GM by C squared to 100 GM by C squared. And uh, we ran the simulation up to uh, 10,000 uh, GM by CQ unit. And mm -hmm. then we see that it matches pretty well up to this 2.2 GM by C squared. Uh, uh, the analytical numerical solution that matches very well. We also additionally plotted the uh, density. So density we are, uh, uh, this is normalized density. So we get the density to be one at the outer boundary and we see that the density increases pretty well. And we see for this flow at 2.2, the Lorentz factor is around three. So that's what we are uh, finding. Um, so this is again, again, a benchmarking. And then we also test the shock capturing. Shock capturing is very essential uh, for this fluid dynamic solver. This should be able to uh, resolve the shock, the contact discontinuities, et cetera. So uh, the, for shock capturing also, we are basically comparing the analytical solution Chakravarti uh, type shock, Chakravarti type shock in subcalculated actuation flow. So we are basically comparing the analytical and numerical simulation. So for analytical, uh, so for this particular uh, parameter, so the shock uh, says in the morning, 
uh, many people talk about the shock uh, forms within certain parameter space. So for this given uh, flow energy and angular momentum, this uh, simulation produced shock around 27 seven or something. So we also basically injected matter from the outer boundary uh, with this specific energy and angular momentum. And then we find that the code can capture the shock exactly at the predicted location with uh, one single grid point in between. And we use some 300 uh, ratio grid for this uh, simulation within the same 2.2 to 100 GMS squared. And we ran the simulation up to 20,000 uh, GMS CPU. So this also shows uh, one benchmarking that the code can resolve shock the expected location. And there's the density profile, there's the shock location. And again, for this case also, we see we can see at 2.2, the Lorentz factor is around three. Uh, and then for this, uh, the invisible code, uh, it is expected that the angular momentum and energy has to be remain conserved for this. Plus. So we just uh, showed here that how uh, our code is conserving this point, uh, this uh, energy and angular momentum. So for this uh, uh, simulation, the energy was 1.007, and we see that it's pretty well conserved. Uh, this variation is not very high. Uh, and also for angular momentum, the angular momentum is 3.4. Outer boundary for us is a uh, uh, we we do not take care of, take care of it. Actually, the outer boundary conditions are applied on the ghost zones. And in the ghost zones, I, instead of putting the angular momentum constant, I just put the V5, same constant V5, as a result of which the angular momentum are different in two different ghost zones. <coughs> That's a mistake that I have made, but this is correct. Okay, so if I do that, then this angular momentum conservation will simply extend. But this is not too much error, 3.4 and 3.416. Okay, so it's uh, roughly 3.4, is uh maintained one but you did not take uh, uh use of phi as the uh, i mean the primitive variable yeah so so in our code we maintain the primitive variables in the ghost zones okay. yeah, that's fine now I'm going this uh, what i'm saying is what the equation are solving mm -hmm. so are you solving the use of phi equation use of phi equation no uh, for, for what so so for, for the angular momentum part for the angular momentum part we calculated the the density is one, then all the three velocity components I calculated is Vj that I showed that Vj's I calculated from the analytical solution. And those Vj's are uh, put in here. So the Vj's at 100 Schwarzschild radius, I put at the host zone. Host zones are beyond 100 Schwarzschild radius. Okay, so that's why there was a little bit mismatch. Okay, anyway, so, uh, and uh, then another benchmarking is this, uh, the maintaining of, maintaining of equilibrium to us. Sure. So uh, in this case also, this a two D torus is a uh, the torus is a static solution. So if we start with this torus, it should be maintained. So we just wanted to see that in two D, uh, if the torus can be maintained or not. In uh, principle, one can do the accuracy analysis for this case for uh, this case also, and uh, we'll do it in future. So for this simulation, we just uh, did the simulation in four to forty radial direction, zero to point theta direction with this much missile, and we see that structure is maintained in 2D also. And finally, we did some uh, simulation of the subcapillary and accretion flow. Uh, two simulations have been just did for uh, this conference purpose. So uh, so here we are showing the density color map of the uh, uh, evolution, time evolution. So this is at uh, very initial time. So we are injecting matter through this outer boundary and the black hole is sitting here. So matter is expected to go towards this black hole and it goes towards the black hole. And after some time, it forms a shock and the steady state torus, which is maintained up to a long time. So here I just included the density contour just to show that uh, we are recovering the torus, uh, post-shock torus, uh, um, which is the thickness, um, actually. Uh, so um, two simulations we have conducted. So in one for, uh, 3.5 angular momentum and another for 3.56. So as we increase the angular momentum, the torus side is expected to be larger, which we are uh, seeing. And the qualitatively, the solutions matches very well with our previous simulation that we did using the Python filter. So this gives us confirmation that uh, this code is working well uh, so far. 
And for this case, also we did the checking of angular momentum conservation. So for this code, we had angular momentum around 3.5, and we see it is pretty well uh, well maintained, uh, except some redistribution in the uh, redistribution. This redistribution is expected if there is turbulence. Turbulence is um, uh, well known to redistribute angular momentum. So some sort of angular momentum redistribution is occurring for this case as well as for this case. But uh, those are accidental. Is it accidental calculations? Yes, it's why there is no symmetry? Where? About why? Up and down. Mm -hmm. So that, that symmetry is expected to break break if there is some. I mean, we see that the shock do these vertical oscillations also. Okay. Okay, so the, the symmetry is, is broken. So equatorial symmetry is and uh, this codes are can also be parallelized. So uh, we have a good uh, domain decomposition framework using MPI uh, three non-blocking one-sided MPI communication, which we did while doing this uh, pure hydrodynamic simulation code. Uh, and the, for this, we have parallel I/O handled with parallel HDF, and we tested this framework scalability uh, on the South Korean TST supercomputer using up to two thousand four. And this framework is pretty well scalable. So if we have any code written in cylindrical spherical polar coordinate. That code can just be put into this framework and it will automatically uh, just scale up. So that's it. So more testing for this code is going on and we're also working for the parametric implementation. And for the inner region, what I experienced is this, we may need to implement better uh, than second order spatial reconstruction. In the inner region, the flow, is, flow feature is very steep. So we need lots of grids. Instead of lots of grids, we can, if we do better spatial reconstruction, it will be good. And then our final goal is to do GRMHD and use some sort of isotopic missing. We have to show a uh, the spherical polar mesh and all these things. I experienced that the spherical molar polar coordinate mesh uh, reduce the time step by a factor of 10 if I go from cylindrical to spherical. So uh, if we in India we have a problem with number of getting number of cores. So I, I for example get maximum thousand cores in Stayuka, but uh, if, if we want to stay with this spherical, uh, this uh, cylindrical, uh, this uh, spherical polar mesh, then we may need 100,000 cores to do realistic 3D simulation. Uh, but if we use somewhat isotropic mesh, this this number of core re re requirement can be reduced significantly. So that's one goal for us. Okay, thank you. Very quick question. Thanks for the nice talk. I had a question regarding the torus. I mean, you mentioned about the uh, torus formation with respect to angular momentum. So I was just wondering the evolution of the torus. Uh, this one. Term. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so this. Yeah. Uh, the evolution of the torus. I mean, uh, whether it is uh, with the change in angular momentum, is it changing over time? Sure, sure, sure. These torus are uh, dynamical. And what would be the observational features of the so if the signatures of that information? Right. So if uh, if we uh, uh, consider radiation from this type of accretion base, and the radiations will mainly be produced from the post -work. So this is very hot, hot and high density region. So lots of radiation are expected to be produced from this region. And now if the region itself oscillates. So the, uh, the that signature is going to be reflected in the outgoing, uh, uh, you know, uh, spectral as well as in timing properties. And we have done this kind of simulation, uh, coupling the hydro with the MHD. But those were done is uh, by coupling by uh, when we when we use the packing screw potential. So we couple the packing screw hydro solver with the Monte Carlo based radiative transfer solution. And we included inverse compromisation into that simulation, and we simulated light curves, and we uh, simulated some cases of PPOs, synthetic light from those synthetic light curves. We did PDS, and we saw the signature of PPOs. Spectrum, spectral properties also studied. So those those can be done definitely from this. And uh, do you expect to have a different signatures in different wave bands, like uh, having uh, like the synthetic light curves showing different structures in different bands? Uh, uh, yes, that 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 is uh, we are seeing, and actually, with Orco, we are trying to uh, uh, do.
this time lag analysis. So for time lag, they calculate uh, the different band. <laughs> so we are basically trying to do some time lag an uh, analysis with, with Orco uh, for that that couple hydrodynamic simulation code. So that work is going on. We see, we do see. If we are running late, okay. you hold your question and ask later. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Can I just one line? No, 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 one line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next speaker is uh, let's thank again. Uh, so, next speaker is Rajiv, and he would be talking about. The study of accretion disks around black holes with two types of gas inflows. you can start uh uh first i would like to thank the uh Organizers and Danisa for giving the opportunity to uh, bring my work here. So, I will discuss the uh, uh, relative disk between two types of inflow bases. Yes, this is the plan of that. In the uh, interface, I introduce my object and some other two properties, and we discuss the possible autobound condition of those objects, and then we introduce my object. And then I uh, will uh, discuss briefly about model equations and evidences, then solution techniques for solve the model, those model equations, and then uh, results and finally I can So innovative is in this picture today. So this is the say binary. So my interest is here that uh, these binaries have different states. So typically they have uh, soft state and hard state. And if you are present in the hardest it is a diagram this would be So they have absolutely So uh key point is that they uh, these two spectral nature come from the different type of gas. So uh, so so it's so the, at least there are two types of gas. They can uh, generate this thing. So that's why the people uh, think that uh, predicted the uh, model which has two types of gas. So they will give uh, Model is the uh, linear multi matter single matter is uh, ruled by the Umran, I can see the NSN at all. So, this is the simple uh, typical picture. This is the then disk and the hot flow. So, this hot flow gives the hard radiation, and this soft discovery and disk are uh, surprising. I just this is the soft one, and there is a linear multi matter. So this is the basis, and uh, so in this. Same is here, the inner part is hot flow with the hot flow and the purple in this case. And this is so basic difference between these two one is that this has single probes, this has two parallel probes, subcopulary and capillary. This has now so uh so as we know that uh black holes is a singularity is connoted by the horizon. So matter they are created from the disk. So sometimes they have jet and then this has been. So, uh, since we believe that this uh, black hole has no own atmosphere, so uh, what are they created from the exercise? So, we believe that this uh, very structural state we observe, which uh, can be drawn by the outer bound, which can change, affect the 
uh, local action physics and they can generate a uh, different type of in this jet or some uh, different type of predictions. So, so here I after one introduction we have uh, the OBC. So this OBC includes qualitative and quantitative nature of the analysis uh, at the other one location means matter when the rotation rotation start and this size as well. And so here I have plotted the this uh, OBC plane. So uh, here uh, our OBC represents the outer boundary location of the rotation disk. Uh, and uh, this BOB is the uh, relativity boundary parameter or uh, local specific energy. So as you know that when matter starts to before that this uh, inflow velocity is zero. The angular momentum of right back could be the coupling or subcoupling is probably about me. And temperature may be uh, you assume that high speed may be to medium temperature or less than that. So from that, if you take the temperature less, very, very less than the medium temperature, when we calculate the this uh bob at the rob then this uh, as rob increases then bob is also increases in when the temperature is below when the temperature is around the middle or uh, some less than the middle temperature so then we have a difference so uh here so so here we have uh, bad two behavior so on the way side we have temporarily uh, first we have to uh, target cold modulus and cold modulus and so now uh, my objective is that I uh, so in this SD we have explored these these one and two region and these uh, th uh, solid line and this dotted line. So what can we use in out of body department something we get? So for that we have constructed the uh, model. So we have uh, assumed extra uh, patient is accessibility statistic and what has vertical hydrostatic ground thermal and these are the conjure group questions. So these are already his part one. So from that, but he has solved for the study at solution. So uh, using that assumptions, we had to uh, have the mass flux inclusive from this point, a conjure from the equation. And from volume and DDM, DDM, we have to generate the energy equation and energy equation. But my more impressive is here that so I have used the full R5 component, which comes from the first place, but so which like this form. So this first time is that this type of study I have used this uh, 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 discuss form. So now uh, and uh, as a closure equation, I use CR uh, equation at stage. Yeah, you already heard about this. Thing. And so we simplify all the equations, all the equations, then we get the three equations: uh, velocity gradient equation, temperature gradient equation, and a global equation. There are three different three equations. So because so we solved it. Yeah, because there is three different equations, so it's a difficult to solve that equation one directly. So we will make some numerical techniques then solve it. So for the first, uh, uh, going to uh, discuss about the numerical technique. So first, we have constructed the energy constant for the distribution flow. flow. So we have integrated out the R components in uh, component of numerous duplication. Then we we. Uh, so, So, uh, so we get uh, this type of equation. Then again, I do the definition of uh, H is the reciprocal enthalpy and energy is the reciprocal equation. Then we get this type of equation. Then again, we together use and uh, simplified. Then we get this uh, E. So this E H is the reciprocal enthalpy, gamma uh, V is the bulk loss factor, and the solute and this X is this. So this has a this first term and other terms. So we call it this grade is energy. And this is constant motion for the distribution. So now since uh uh, uh now uh, since uh, we want to initiate the critical point first, so for this we, we have first we wrote down this uh, critical point conditions which come from the DVD equation which then Putting the numerator and denominator like in taking the zero by zero function, we get these two values. But for the uh, so so my first goal is to find out these conditions. So these can be found two way. We, we can uh, solve from the look like or from the outer boundary condition from outer side outside. So we solve from outside basically we 
time taking things. So I choose to solve it from the inner bound. So we assume that R in is very close to the black hole. R is in the horizon, the location of the horizon, and then some zero point zero one right at that. And then we uh, we try to calculate the flow variables theta in B in uh, L in at R in. So for that we assume that very close to the black hole. Since uh, we are in that very close uh, distance, are very close to uh, the horizon is uh, is uh, uh, with uh, zero. So we use that E, that we say we call it grand specific energy, and B is the burden per energy equal. So from that we get one equation. We solve it, then we get quadratic equation. So from that we can solve L in or L not, depending on which we supply as a parameter. <laughs> and from B is equal to B, in, we get the theta in at the R. Then again. <laughs> So we supplied these parameters, this E, where is the energy, a link, a uh, very close to the horizon, and J is the composition parameter, A is the uh, car, uh, parameter, alpha is the specific parameter. So we use this thing, and uh, and we assume that we close to the black hole, matter will pre fall. So we use this expression, catch uh, and do the RS by S thing, and we introduce delta. So we, delta is less than it. For some delta, we when we get the uh, flow variable with R in, then we integrated uh, those equations from uh, uh, horizon towards uh, to outside. So we get these two types of branch. This is a dotted one and this one. So these two ones it's with some delta. So now, uh, uh, so uh, so. Yes. So we make the situation such that this can satisfy the zero by zero form. So this so these two branches should be converged. So they converge when they converge and satisfy this condition, then we get the CP point. If CP is the critical point, then we can get the solution. Mm -hmm. So and then again, uh, uh, so here again, uh, the next step we have in next situation we uh, initiate the adopt solution. So this uh, actually bound uh, since we have started from the inner point. So we from in this situation we try to uh, satisfy the uh, auto boundary conditions of the adopt solution. So in the, in this paper, the, and define this type of auto boundary. So we try to satisfy this. For that we again with the attribution condition here L is the attribution parameter. So for suppose this for this one, so this is angular momentum. Is this a, L is the angular momentum? Angular momentum is very low, and this one angular momentum is. Uh, uh, increases uh, in the super problem. And in, in this solution, problem is that uh, in the outer side, uh, boron parameter also increases. That is uh, sort of uh, not physical. So we have created as such that we satisfy this one. Then if we satisfy, then we get the adapt solution. This one, blue one. And then again, so in third iteration, we used uh, uh, we, this is we find the soft location. So for the soft, uh, for the soft, first we need to under the alpha type topology. So for that, <coughs> we have uh, supplies, if this is map numbers of some conditions to find this type of solution. When we find this type of solution, then we uh, switch on these uh, soft conditions. And from that, you can the supersonic uh, flow variables. Again, we get that in these two types of solution, dotted and as one. And we, again, we uh, need to convert this and satisfy the uh, control condition, then get the outer points, then you can get the whole solution. So now, uh, when we get, uh, we uh, then with these iterations, then we have uh, uh, scanned this uh, OBC plan. So for this is the first one, and this part alpha is equal to zero p zero one, and this mapped in the PS parameter space plan. So the first one is represented to this one, which is a b zero uh, below one, and this one second one in top. Uh, so, uh, so in this region we get with multiple solutions. In this region we get double CP or single CP solution. So here, uh, point is that uh, in India, uh, Chakrasthi group and, and we mostly explore this line, this dotted line. And but in Narayan group, they explore this one. They rely on this line, this outer one. So from this one. In, if we represent the parameters, this gives only adopt solution. But this line, that's why we know uh, I have written that unit boundary condition. This only gives the adapt solution. And this boundary gives this all type of solution, which we have seen. Mm -hmm.
Dogs. So uh, here, this adapter can be met here. It's the, the, the uh, here. So this one with the adapter. And here you can get same person. So here we I will not discuss this body type, uh, W type adapter solution, right? Because already uh, uh, the previous talks we already seen that so, so I will just talk about that these are So uh here yeah, so for, for, the, for the comparison we have uh here so essentially taking the uh, bound uh, is less than one value. Yes, yes. Uh, and this solution only after when it, it, the viscosity is not zero. So here <coughs> I have compared the three uh, solutions: adapt dotted one, adapt thick, or also called a snip solution, and uh, this a W type solution, long S and soft solution. You can see here what have been the change the temperature, or you can see the temperature uh, change the uh, uh, local energy at uh, boundary location. Then we get as if temperature is low, the angular momentum transportation is complete, is not that much as with the temperature high. As temperature increases, you can see that at the outer region temperature, uh, out angular momentum efficiently uh, more efficient to transport out there. So that's why the angular momentum become in last uh, lower and lower. So when uh, angular momentum uh, becomes such that, then chromatic uh, angular becomes supersonic or from the black hole, then they can have soft as well. So that's why we plotted this cells with the here is the uh, bulk velocity, here is the temperature ratio, the energy ratio. So this one, and uh, so we found that hot mod uh, solution which is defined that we, uh, we are much more efficient uh, for air transportation than the point solutions. And uh, so, and uh, this cutoff solutions uh, support has high stem momentum, and soft solution has low stem momentum, which you can see here. And, uh, uh, and but uh, uh, soft solution in the post soft region has higher temperature than the others. So here again, I plotted the uh, surface density. So we have seen that if we see these two stream solutions, the dark solution dotted one, red dot, and this uh, dotted and dashed soft solutions, you can see all, in this region you can see almost uh, what are much difference in surface density. So this will uh, this because surface density can change the, uh, the this means optical depth is different. So they can exchange in cities. So uh, key point is that, so temperature can be also used as a parameter uh, <coughs> when people model the uh, uh, sources as they use mass accelerator. Another thing that temperature can also change the uh, uh, time scales of variability as well by changing the suppose stock look and are uh, in fall time scale like that. So this one. And again, yes, uh, we have already discussed the two-zone model. In two-zone model, uh, uh, typically, this outer part of the disk, and this, uh, there is a transition region. This here, I don't know the R, uh, TR. So this transition this changes, then uh, people explain the disk what Q, uh, Q diagram, or <laughs> density diagram. So here, we have changed the, uh, we have plotted the capillarian uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Specific energy for the couple, uh, couple of index, and then we have choose three locations or transition radius. Then we have from that location we have, have generated the adaptation. Okay. So you can see that the outer point uh, energy of the adaptation solution and couple is matched, and the angular momentum is also couple uh, at the outer boundary. You can see temperature is very low. So if you can see that, so this low, <laughs> the, there are possibility that the couple of index can make the adapt like this. And, uh, and other variables, you can see that also uh, tendencies have tendency to match with the capillary and uh, structure. You can see this height and this here. So one thing, and then again, I have for different uh, outer boundary conditions, uh, 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 size of the adapt, we have plotted these two solutions. So we can see for the same accretion rate. So here plotted the Thomson optical depth. For the same accretion rate, when suppose uh, here is RT uh, uh, transition, uh, 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 this outer bound, uh, boundary is more than 10 to the 4, and it's, uh, it's around uh, uh, 100. You can see optical depth is changes as uh, transition uh, radius moves towards the black hole. So, this even if you keep the same accretion rate, so this will also can uh, change the in nature. 
So, and, and other thing, here we have uh, plotted the different uh, this structures uh, because uh, we have seen that temperature and the uh, movement can affect the this structure. So, since single temperature and single agglomerate is not possible, so it's very difficult to form capillary and this. So here you assume that maybe the two parallel poles, the capillary and the subcapillary poles. So that's why you do the two parallel poles, they can be like this. And this kind of structure is also we have seen in earlier in my 2D study. So this here you have found the adaptive uh, uh, variation. So here is the adaptive, right? Here you have the soft location, you can say this. Like, <laughs> like, this Certain different the soft uh, surface. This is super solid and this is super weak. And uh, then the total pin is the adaptive surface. So now this, and then uh, again we have simulated the uh, from this OBC uh, plane. We have choose the four per uh, value. And one is uh, this one is from the adaptive solution means in this uh, on this line, and this one is from this line. We get the adaptive type solution, the adaptive solution, <laughs> and the, if you choose the some subcapillary uh, flow, in hot flow, we can get strong shocks and like, uh, like this. So, means if you change the outer boundary condition, this is actually also changed. And this I also have seen in the theoretical as well. So, now they are finally, uh, these are the mechanical agents. I have already uh, spoke about these things. So, overall conclusion is that this is the favors two parallel flow state of one flow because of. Uh, temperature and low metabolism and the one the metabolism. Okay, let's thank the speaker. I can allow one question. So, in the last slide, in the, the last slide, I'm not closing the video. Now, why do you separate out the cold mode flow and hot mode flow? Yeah. Yes. So in the left side, there is a blue red green. So how do you define those lines, these curves? Uh, this one. Yeah. What yeah. determines these curves? Okay. This uh, actually. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, here, since here I have taken this in this temperature is moving, so this will not affect BV. So BV mostly dominated by the mm -hmm. yeah, qualitative understanding. I, I is absolutely clear to me. But when you are drawing this separation, okay. it must follow some equation. <laughs> yeah, yes. which which equation it is following? The yeah, blue this... one, red one. Which equation you are solving to get this? Here I solved the uh, this uh, BOV is equal to minus H U sub T. Just this. Uh, I just, just you determine just, ROB. It's a ROB, ROB is the absolute free parameter. Yeah, ROB I have supplied. And then I miscalculated. And we have given but in the, that equation, angular momentum information is missing. H U sub T has the angular momentum. U sub T has angular momentum. U sub T has some U sub T has And then how temperature this, comes into the picture? In actually, the it's the enthalpy. Specific enthalpy. Yes. So basically, this picture is nothing but to look about the parameter space that you talk, talk about, it's in different dimensions. It's different dimensions. I just represent this. Uh, because they, uh, they in their use. Because I am getting this confused when you are separate out the adapt solutions yeah. and other solutions. Ah, but yeah, yeah. basically, so, it, uh, it, it's absolutely the same thing you are talking about, but in a slightly di different set of parameters. Yes. Redefining the set of parameters. Yes, yeah, this one. And uh, this since I. Uh, uh, because in Czechos, mostly talk about these. No, no, that is absolutely yeah. fine. That I understood clearly, but there is nothing like an yeah. adapt solution. Yeah. Yeah. But this it's, is the choice of the solution, yeah. Why, yeah. which we will pick up, this which will not whole pick up. Of this, if we solve these kind of questions. And uh, can, I think I this, 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 I did the Actually, the I the problem I have with this is that you are defining with the H minus H U sub T, right? Which is the uh, uh, the Bernoulli parameter for inviscid flow. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, this is either local. I know. Yeah. No, uh, what I'm saying is it, it is Bernoulli parameter for local, uh, yeah. sorry, invisible flow. Yes. Minus H of C, yes. U sub T. Yeah. 
you have other terms if you have viscosity, cooling, blah, 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 right? Yes. So from so, that, we can also so, mix, give the same kind. I know. Already what, have what, done this also. Now, what I'm trying to say is, yes. if you take all of them, then this so-called boundary brand, parameter brand. will be constant, right? Yeah. You are taking one part of it, and then you are saying that it is less than one. Okay, with the bound. Yes. It actually has no meaning because yeah. in the sense, why I'm saying that? I'm, I'm not saying that you are doing mathematically wrong. What I'm saying is, when you separate that out, so you, you have A, B, C, and then you take A and B out of it, and then you are redefining everything in terms of A and B. It's, it's a bit, you know. Picture will be more clearer if you take, you calculated E prime, no capital E prime somewhere. Yes, yes, yes. So there's a global constant. Yes, yes. If you, if you talk about that term, I think it will be easier to understand. Also, in, uh, in this 2019 paper, I have used the same kind of picture. But here, so I can uh, tell you uh, one thing. Yeah. There is a confusion even amongst the theorists. What is this Bernoulli parameter stands for, right? Even for people like Becker and all, they think that if the Bernoulli parameter is greater than one yes. in relativity and it is, it is greater than zero, if you are talking about Newtonian equations, then uh, it is unbound state. Everything is like wind-like yes, yes, outflows, yes, yes. something like yes. that, right? And if it, it if it has to be accretion, it has to be less than that. Yeah. That is not a proper. Uh, I mean, with all my respect to Becker, uh, that is not a proper thing to to talk about. Okay. So all these uh, less than one, greater than one. It's, it's this. This is everything has to do with orbits. Okay. So you take a particle. If it is less than one, it will have a bound orbit. Greater than one, it will have an unbound order. But fluids, yeah, fluid they don't care about those things. Right? So that's why, right. if it's less than one, this also not clear. Okay, because so, just, I mean, it will just not be temperature is low. Just temperature is low. Nothing. Here, anglo momentum is there, same anglo momentum. And the, you, you, you see, the whole, just, your just whole the temperature, all this is. work would have been very good, appreciated by so many observers, if you have, if you have termed these things in terms of observables. So just nobody measures Bernoulli parameter. People yeah. measures luminosity. There is that. If you have so, converted that those into luminosity or temperature, at least temperature, uh, then I outer think boundary conditions. So, outer boundary conditions. Yes. So if outer boundary conditions by derivation we had for the temperature high at that time, so then we can easily calculate these things. I know that, but yeah. they will be interested more if you do that. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So units of derivation. So basically, that. Problem in theory. Okay, so uh, no questions. I, I can't any any allowed. We're already late by twenty minutes. So uh, let's thank all the speakers. Only two speakers in this session, but anyway, let's thank them and let's move on to the next session, which is now no accretion, everything unbound. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so good afternoon. In this session, we have three talks. First speaker is Dipanjan Mukherjee. And he's going to tell us about the role of relativistic jets in galaxy evolution. The topic. Top one. I can change size from that side. All right. Uh, <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Very glad to be here finally. I missed a couple of talks, wonderful talks in the morning, but thanks to Indigo. But finally, I'm here. So, I'll be talking about so there were some very interesting talks about you know, novel development of numerical techniques on DRM control, etc. My talk would be slightly uh, on a more general overview of how relativistic jet from supermassive black holes affect galaxy evolution. We'll have less of equations, more connecting of simulations, as well as connecting observations. So, of course, this has been done in, in collaboration with the largest of collaborators, both in theory as well as in observers. 
And the main focus of our work has been trying to make more realistic simulations, which can be directly compared to the observations of extra galactic sources, and try to constrain from the observations how much correct or how what are the uh, things lacking in our simulations and models. But before we go ahead, a brief overview of what is this uh, phenomena of, of, of feedback or you know, how it gets from supermassive black holes affect the galaxy? The very idea of feedback first was uh, developed by cosmologists who were trying to do large scale simulations. And then real, they realized that when you try to do cosmological simulations, you do a start to plot the stellar mass function, they do not match up with the observed points, so observed points here are the black, black dots here. And just due to winds from star formation driven winds, you overproduce the number of galaxies. So something was missing. So then people realized that by some form of injection of energy from by the central supermassive black hole is required to prevent star formation. How exactly that is being done was not really specified in the early models. This was sort of like a subgrid description. Something has to stop the massive galaxies from forming. So then uh, a movie of aging feedback in a nutshell. So this is a movie from the illustrious simulation. You can see the galaxy is nicely starting to form. And then suddenly at one point of time, as they will start to create, go into high, high intent ratio states, they will start having this last scale explosions, bombs. It's not started yet. You can see this, uh, uh, these are these nodes of the galaxies. Let's just wait for one minute. And what is interesting is if you look at the stellar mass function, it's starting to form here, for example. You can see it's starting to grow. And then you have this explosions everywhere. So if you follow the, over the cosmic time of the galaxy, there's a phase, sweet spot around redshift of two, when things start becoming uh, chaotic. Most stars are also formed, the aging also starts turning on. And then you have to stop the stars from forming further. So what was found was that there's a divide in the galaxy mass function for galaxies less than 10 power 11 solar masses and for 10.5 to 11 solar masses. Simple stellar feedback works. For large, higher mass, mass, uh, more massive galaxies, then you need an additional input of energy. So the standard picture now, and uh, the, a lot of terminology has been used, like quasi mode, radio mode, the community is moving away from those. The standard picture is you somehow have to initially stop the galaxies from overproducing a lot of stars. And the central supermassive black hole is a reservoir of energy. And that is a possible candidate of how you can uh, prevent them from forming stars. Now, once you have sort of made the galaxies uh, quench, or I'll not say quench, but come to a steady state, you have to maintain those galaxies in those state for the remaining time of the evolution. Otherwise, the halo surrounding the galaxies will just cool down. If you have short cooling time skills in the halo, your time, entire atmosphere collapses, and you have an overproduction of galaxies. So, we have something called establishment mode phase of the galaxy evolution. So you first establish this galaxy and then you have the maintenance mode. You keep the galaxies as they are. How the black holes affect these two is currently under debate. So it's currently understood that in the early phase of evolution, when the quasars turn on, they are, you know, kick out a lot of gas from the galaxies. They are, have outflows. So that's the traditionally had been called as quasar modes. Now in our works, we're also showing that the jets can also have an impact similar to the quasar mode. But once these jets turn into large scale structures, they deposit energy in the outskirts, you have the maintenance part, which prevents the gas from cooling down. What needs to be appreciated is all of this, the central superstar, starting from the central central supermassive black hole, the transport of energy has to have over a wide variety of spatial scales. For example, I just list briefly the list of scales involved on the Schwarzschild radius so of the accretion scale, where we saw some very interesting talks uh, in, the, in the previous two sessions. Uh, things are happening at, uh, at much uh, subparsic uh, scale, 10 power minus 4 parsec for 10 power 9 solar mass galaxies. Then you have the broadline regions, the narrow line regions, up for a few hundred parsec, and then all the way up to the galaxy clusters, going up to hundreds of kiloparsec or even megaparsec. So the transport of energy starting from the supermassive black hole at the center has to happen over such large scales. How is that possible? How much of the coupling is actually happening over what spatial scales is again an open question. <coughs> again, the type of mode of the, of, of the transport of energy is also in question. One is can be this non relativistic winds driven by the 
black hole. And again, we've had talks uh, uh, here. There are different kinds of winds that can be driven out. For example, we know the Quasar emits a lot of uh, photons. This is highly luminous systems. So we can have radiation pressure driven winds. We can also have accretion disk driven winds from the center. The main uh, uh, point about these are they are more numerous. They are really powerful. And they are wide angles, so they can you know, spread over a larger area and couple with the gas and drive things out. So some of these examples here, this is a nice example of a X-ray outflow or output detecting X-rays for the airport. The bad, the radiation pulse is one by R square. So beyond a certain spatial distance, you do not have enough momentum to keep on pushing the gas out. Also, if there are disk winds, they are also can get uncollimated beyond the certain zone. Then of course we have the jets. Relativistic jets, as has been traditionally known from long back, are these large scale structures detected in radio primarily. And so, and they are really extragalactic structures. So they can potentially deposit a lot of energy in the atmospheres of galaxies outside them. So the good thing about them is they are very powerful. They are large and extended. So that means they can have this, they can do a multi-scale transport that I was talking about in the first slide. The bad thing about them, they are thin collimated structures. So how can they couple to the wide scale distribution of gas has been debated. So some of the basic questions that we'd like to understand from the kind of work that we are doing are, do radio jets affect the host galaxies? Now, what I showed in the previous slide are these large scale evolved radio jets uh, going up to extragalactic scales. But before they go up, break out of the galaxy, they can they'll actually have to push through the gas in the galaxy itself. So before they become large scale structures, can the radio jets affect the host galaxy itself? So that's the one of the questions. So the primary question that I am interested in, one of the primary questions is this topic of jet ISM interaction. So the jets interacting with the ISM, depositing energy in the ISM, how efficient is that? How common is that? And how much of that is actually happening in the overall universe? So the common uh, argument against pursuing this has been, okay, radio jets are quite few. If you look at the gene statistics, more 10% of them are actually radio loud. But that has been a bias because of the sensitivities of the radio surveys. Recent LOFAR surveys, you can see this is the fraction of uh, radio loud AGM. For higher luminosity thresholds, and it's not very clear on this, but you can see on the left hand side. For these, for example, the number is actually 10%. But if you push the uh, sensitivities or reduce the th radio thresholds, it is 100%. All radio galaxies below a threshold have a, all galaxy agents below a threshold have a radio core. Of course, these are not very powerful. So are, can they have some impact? That is again not known. But the fact that they are numerous has now is now being established and will become more as SK turns on. Radio loud galaxies can be gas rich. Another uh, argument against person this has been that they are usually gas poor elliptical galaxies, but there have been in numerous examples of Really loud galaxies being gas rich. So they have gas, they have ionized outflows, molecular gas, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a good argument of pursuing this, understand, or trying to understand how much of these jets are interacting with the gas in the galaxy. Another open question that I'm interested in is duty cycle. Is this a one off event in the lifetime of the galaxy? Does it keep on recurring? And if this is recurring, is there a cumulative effect that adds up over the lifetime of the galaxy? And how is star formation did actually regulated? And I, you know, italicize the word actually, because if you just look at the cosmological models, just beyond a certain density threshold, you think stars are formed here. Yeah. If you're not that high density, stars are not formed. But the actual process of star formation is much more complicated. It is related to the magnetic fields, the local turbulence, the free fall time scales, et cetera, that is not taken into account in large scale simulations because of the lack of resolution. And of course, most importantly, in my opinion, is observational implications of this. With the advent of better types of uh, telescope facilities, we have a wide range of spatially resolved observations of the systems and spatially uh, you know, resolved simulations of the systems. And it is becoming more practical to try to overlap these things. So the kind of work that I'm trying to pursue is can be broken up into three different segments. One is spatial resolved simulations of jet ISM interaction really looking at the galaxy scale. The second is <coughs> talk to our observing friends and try to see whether our simulations are completely imaginary or is there some overlap between what they see in the, observ in, in the observations. Second is, a third is, trying to understand the physics of the jet themselves because, and, and this phase of work, 
you know, involves trying to understand the micro instabilities inside jets, non thermal emission inside jets, and all of this trying to, uh, uh, so this would be for jets that have broken out of the galaxy and become extragalactic in nature. So, three different kinds of topics, and I'll try to give an overview as best as possible in this time. So, why talk about this in a relativistic conference? Because this is the only relativistic slide I'll show today. We are solving uh, the special relativistic form of the equation. These are not GR, these are uh, fixed metric and Minkowski. But the flows are special relativistic. So we're actually launching fast relativistic jets in our simulation domain. And it, uh, we're doing this with the code called Pluto. The simulations we perform are actually quite you know, resource hungry. They are taking several tens of millions of CPU hours and keep on counting. So it is quite difficult to perform them and we are getting more and more constrained with non availability resources. And I already mentioned the kind of simulations. So I can show this slide just to like, tell you that now that we are not doing cosmological simulations, right, each simulation itself will take about 50 million CPU hours. We can do a, like a, it's like a zoom in simulation where you focus on a one particular galaxy and then try to understand the physics of that. So we can scan the parameter space. We can do several different uh, powers of the jet several different densities of the ambient uh, ISM, different structures of the ISM, whether it's a disk-like structure, spherical distribution, and orientation of et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to show that we can have a basic grid of parameter space over which we can study this. Area. So uh, this is the flavor of the simulation. Before I play the movies, just let you know. So these are 3D simulations. What I'm plotting here are density on these two slides. This is the temperature. And this is just a still panel of the velocity, VZ component of the velocity. So 3D simulations, I'm showing a mid-plane slice and all the physical scales here and kiloparsecs. The KTC has been cropped out, it seems. So I'll play the movie. If you just focus on the left-hand side panel, before it gets choppy because of zoom, you'll find that the jet is actually stuttering. And this is not just because it's of zoom. You can take my word for it that the jet goes and hits the cloud, it gets stuck for a while. If I had launched this jet just in a uniform medium, it would have just, just zoomed through. So the jets initially, in the few uh, mega year or so, gets confined in the central region, and of course then it breaks out. So in this confinement phase, the jets can interact over a large distribution of ISM, and as you can see, the jets are these thin narrow structures. Uh, the contours here are for beta 0.4c, so the jets here are thin narrow structures, but the effect of the jets is being uh, is being felt by the large scale kiloparsec scale in the region of the galaxy. So the jets can couple widely, can launch these cloudlets that are moving outwards and launching outflows. So they can do a lot of damage. So in the traditional form, this is what has been predicted in the quasar mode of the of, of feedback, where the luminous uh, or the radiation pressure driven winds will cut and connect with the gas surrounding them and then drive out winds. But if you do not have, if you are not resolving well enough, for example, the, at, if you just pause the movie at this stage, you will, if you are not resolving BLBI structures, you do not know whether there's a jet inside or a wind. There's a confusion. And for example, I just, as I said, different orientations or different parameters of the simulations affect the evolutions differently. For example, this is just a vertical jet. Here I'm inclining the jet in three to two different angles, and the evolution is very different. And all of these have different obs obs like observable implications. So some key takeaway messages from this kind of simulations. The outflows can have enhanced velocity dispersion in the central few kiloparsecs. Now, the central few kiloparsecs is actually small compared to the last few galaxy, but it's still substantial. It, it may account for at least 10 to 20 percent of the mass of the galaxy. So if you have a mechanism that affects about 10 to 20 percent of the mass of the galaxy, that is something to take care of. In the early phase of large-scale cosmological simulations, how people had predicted this would go is you turn on this outflow. They did not predict whether it was jets or winds, but some outflow from the black hole. It connects with the gas, kicks the gas out. So you expel gas. So the feedback was more ejected. As we are starting, starting to do more resolve simulations, we are find that, finding that that ejective mode of feedback is not true. It is very difficult to completely expel the ISM of the host galaxy. You do not stop star formation just by expelling the gas. 
And this is not just and the kind of simulations I'm doing, but also this is from Martin Bones 2015 paper, same code that has done the illustrious simulation that I showed earlier. At low resolution, they have lower gas fraction. Lower gas fraction means the amount of mass that is contained within the central region. This means there have been a lot of outflow, but as they have increased the resolutions, this is the number of uh, particles in a, in a kilobasic region. They actually start having inflows. Instead of driving things out, they are actually increasing the mass in the central region. So this is also done, this is also shown in the cosmological flows as well, but they cannot resolve it because of the lack of resolution. And it's very simple to understand why cosmological simulations have that. It's a simple ramp pressure argument. At the same energy, at lower resolution, you are not resolving the density structures. So the velocities are also low. As you start resolving the density structures, your velocities decrease. So there are several observational uh, you know, uh, correspondences between what I'm saying here and uh, uh, the special result observations that our uh, colleagues are carrying out. For example, this was one particular source, and I'm not sure if radio has been discussed in this conference part, but this is called a CSS source, compact steep spectrum. But the source is 100 parsec in size in observed in radio. When we observed this in Gemini, we found that there is an extended 300 parsec Fe2 ionized region, and Fe2 is a very important tracer of shocks. Jet is 100 parsec, the shock gas is 300 parsecs, and this is shock H2. Shock molecular gas, warm molecular gas that is disturbed by the shocks, that's two kiloparsec. So, although the jet is confined in the central region, the impact of the jet is felt across the central region of the, of the, of the galaxy. So, that is very interesting, and that's it's also we compared with the simulations. We found that if the jet is in, indeed confined by some clouds or some non homogeneous distribution in the center, if you then try to simulate the radio uh, morphology, you would actually find that the radio morphology would be small, but you will have a lot of diffuse emission, which unless you have a high dynamic range, if you have a, a lot more baselines and a lot more you know, filling of the baselines, you will miss out. So future facilities like MECAP or the low power uh, VLBI baselines may be able to recover this because MECAP is already doing uh, nice things about the diffuse emission outside. Another very interesting example that came out last year was this um, uh, unambiguous detection of a radio jet driven outflow in the central uh, central region of a galaxy, of this particular galaxy. Uh, this, this, the AGN, the luminous AGN is actually very, the luminosity of the AGN is very small. So it is not enough to drive this outflow that has been observed with ALMA of, of the molecular gas of the particular galaxy. And the location of the, of the, of the, of the, of the outflow is actually also shifted from the core. And that location of the outflow matches with the head of the jet. So this is one of the first unambiguous detection of a moderately powered jet that is driving large scale outflows, clearing 75% of the central gas reserve of the galaxy. So even low power jets have the power to you know, kick out from the central region temporarily. It will also rain back in to form a galactic fountain eventually. So these kind of simulations are, 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 are showing, and of course, this uh, study is we confirmed the simulation. So this kind of works are showing that we should look at jets in a new light where we also should focus on the central regions as they're interacting with the galaxy before they go and wait on the last bits. Now with this kind of uh, resolved simulations, it also becomes more, more interesting to try to predict some observables which can then allow our, our colleagues to compare with our simulation model. So this is, for, for example, the work that my, my student Minakshi over the last for her thesis, where she had been trying to uh, uh, predict the observable shock O3 emission. And you can see as the jet is evolving, the, the, this is the velocity dispersion, these are the, 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 the line kinematics. Uh, you can see the, the, you can, the, the shock region is extending as the thing is evolving. Also, we can find, we can start predicting changes in the rotation profile of the galaxy. Why? Because if you just look at the previous previous slide, let me display once again. This half of the jet presses onto this half, and this part of the jet presses here, so the central region starts to get warped. And this kind of warps have also been detected in some systems. For example, some reorientation of the central uh, gas distribution from the stellar field, which means that something is disturbing the gas. And very interestingly, again, uh, uh, one of our colleagues contacted us and uh, we did a more uh, thorough comparison with this particular galaxy called Tika. This is the handle of the Tika. That's why it's called Tika. This is ionized gas. But in the central region of the Tika, they have uh, CO gas emission. 
And that very nicely matched with our uh, uh, model. So these are the observations. This is the simulations, model prediction of simulations. So this is kind of thing. So there are also other things that we are trying to pursue. For example, a jet going. So this was uh, uh, gas within the host galaxy itself. Now this is jet going and hitting a parcel of gas in the outside, in the extragalactic region. There are several examples of this. This particular work was motivated by uh, uh, by observation by recent JWST observations by number of and colleagues in 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 the US. By the contact is again, and then again, we could try to see that the velocity dispersion that we are getting are similar if we put in more realistic parameters of the jet power, etc. Et so, coming back to the question of star formation, just quickly to run through what my other PhD student, Ashish Mandel, has been trying to do. So, in large scale simulations, the standard argument of seeding stars has been if your density is greater than a threshold, you form stars locally at the region without caring anything about the microphysics of the region. But what we are trying to understand is if you put in more inputs from the turbulence, and this has been this is routinely done in the turbulence community where uh, people study the impact of stars driven turbulence and that's an you know, impact on star formation rate. So I'm going to devise a subgrid model to understand the impact of star formation rate. And what we found was indeed in the initial phase, there is a decrease in star formation rate. I have not shown that here, it seems. But what we find is that there's an increase in dispersion in the initial phase that the jet is strongly injecting, interacting with the disk and injecting turbulence. And that also increases the virial parameter. Virial parameter is the ratio of the kinetic energy to gravitational potential energy. And if you have a slight increase of this alpha virial, the velocity dispersion and temperature, you can strongly reduce the star formation. So this is just a plot from one of my reviews in 21. You start from here, just modest increase in this in this quantities here, you'll end up here, which is orders of magnitude. So it's not difficult to reduce star formation rate just by turbulence. How exactly this pro this proceeds is something that is still unknown. Again, with Ankush, we've been trying to do that with uh, with Pluto. We have now a self gravity module in Pluto, and we've been trying to do small scale sim simulations of an Aegean wind. Uh, effective wind uh, driven by Asian, then going and hitting a cloud and seeing how cell gravity affects this kind of work. So I'll, I'll just skip over this. I'm going to the last part of the talk. So these were trying to understand the impact of the Asian jets on the multi-phase gas, star formation rate properties, etc. In the last remaining few minutes, I'll try to uh, uh, in, like, touch upon another aspect of this work, which we have uh, working on in collaboration with the Pluto group. Marvel has been leading this effort, uh, uh, then I had joined in. So what we have now in Pluto is a hybrid um, uh, method of, um, of evolving the fluid, as well as non-thermal electrons. Now, why do we need, why do we care about the non-thermal electrons? We care mostly for this term. So this is a single emissivity. In standard <laughs> prescriptions, this is just a power law with a cooling part. In more uh, robust numerical systems, this distribution of the non-thermal electrons will actually be guided by the shocks as well as the cooling. So it's uh, a very messy affair. Now in this Pluto, we have a hybrid system. So yeah, and my zoom has collapsed. Wi-Fi was there. Good. Thank you. 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 Yeah, yeah. So many people are presenting through the room. Why do you want to do it directly to the left hand? Don't the room. Don't really start a problem, right? Competitivity is something to the right hand. Okay, we're back. So, what we mainly model is how these electrons are accelerated at shocks, how they're cooling down due to the, the local magnetic fields and other, other mechanisms. Okay, so this is again a movie of just now, just a movie of a simple jet on the on the left hand side. 
And these are the particles over plotted <coughs> under the jet. What I'm plotting in color is the maximum Lorentz. Uh, so particles have a distribution in, in the gamma of the, of the electrons. So this is the gamma max of the electron distribution. So you can see in the central part of the jet, the particles are accelerated due to uh, the recollimation shocks and also the head shock. As they accelerate and then coming down, they're cooling down. That's why they lose energy. And then we have more darker colors here. We can also follow the trajectories of the particles. For example, this particular one is falling into a kelvin helmholtz loop. It loops back, comes back into the flow, and then eventually gets kicked out. So as you can understand, the standard picture has been the particles go travel along the jet beam, go to the hotspot, get accelerated, and then come down and cool back down. But if you have complex processes inside, turbulence, for example, in the jet cocoon, you have these are the volume rendering of the shocks um, in this particular jet. As the particles will stream down, they'll pass through the shocks and get re-accelerated. So the actual system is quite messy. And of course, now we can, with this, we can predict the synchrotron emission at different frequencies. For example, this is at uh, 10 gigahertz, this is at K-band, and this is at 1 keV. so this is X-rays. You can see as you are going to higher and higher frequencies, you are filtering out the shocked regions, just the shocks. And the shocks are thin structures. So these are some, these are the predictive powers, this kind of simulations that can give us. And we can also make more realistic emission maps, the X-ray knots that you can see in some of the jets. So these are all very com compact jets. But these can also be named extrapolated. So these are where you can, uh, in in uh, collaboration with different uh, observers as well, trying to understand how the high frequency part of these emissions correspond to the synchrotron. We can also now have a budget of the distribution of this uh, cosmic ray electrons, as we call them, non-thermal cosmic ray electrons, in the, uh, in, in the in the in the in the cocoon of the jets. What is the you know fraction of the non-thermal population of electrons at a given location? We assume 10% always when we come, you know, do the standard modeling. It is not always the case. And as you can see, for the standard simulation, this is a non. Uh, I don't know what happened there. This is, okay. uh, this is a non. Uh, uh, this is a st steady jet without any instabilities. The fraction, so uh, the particle energy is red. The fraction is actually 10%. If you have instabilities inside your jet, instabilities will start to produce shocks. The shocks will reaccelerate the particles, you will instab instabilities also slow down the evolution of the jet. So in a given jet cocoon, you're packing in more and more particles and the energy density is actually increasing. So for this, for example, they are actually starting to rise up. So the evolution of the non-thermal population of electrons strongly depend on the nature of the instability on one particle instability, and you'll hear more about this in the, in the next talk. So this is a kink, kink mode where the jet evolves you know, steady for a while and then they have toroidal magnetic fields. The kink instability takes over and jet starts to wiggle around. And the, here the jet has started to bend. This is the volume rendering, you can see the bend of the jet. And this is more clearly seen in the U-band, for example, image. You can see the nice bend of the jet and the universe flow. And I'll maybe just skip this slide. This is something my student Minashi has been doing, trying to understand the evolution of jets in uh, external random magnetic field. And uh, end with this summary slide, just to summary, summarize the main points of what we are trying to understand here. Within the potential of the galaxy, the jets can strongly interact with the gas of the galaxy. And this will give rise to you know, more dumping of, the, of energy by the jets before they will go to large scale structures. So this has a potential for feedback and then eventually star formation rate that is et etc. Hybrid modeling of this non-thermal particles give us a new window of opportunity to understand from the theoretical side how shock acceleration is affecting the non-thermal uh, uh, properties of the jets. And the MHD instability, I did not talk much about it, as I just showed in the King instabilities, can strongly affect the dynamics and the spectrum of these particles due to re-acceleration and boom. I'll end it. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Uh, very nice talk. By the way. So, in the last part, the part is do the feedback into the collection? Yeah. It is a registry of machine models. Uh, there can be registry, we have not put the registry of okay. The second question is more like a general question on jet physics. So, in GRMHD, the Collimating the jet is very difficult, I guess. So how to get around it? The king is stability triggers and the jet doesn't even go more than a few thousand gravitational units. Yeah. So uh, these are like two kiloparts. 
So if you do the look at the linear analysis of the king phone, uh, they are they go as one by gamma to the power four. So if you're able to launch faster jets, stronger Planck's Mach processes, then the kink kink mode can be suppressed. But there's other ways of you know having collimation, for example, collimation shocks. How we produce the physics of recollimation shock, that is again as a different debate, maybe we can discuss together. But recollimation shocks and the you know faster flows help in collimating the chip. We of course see from the observation from even M87, we have these wide scale observations of two parsecs and one in the last case. In our jets, for example, at least we are launching from scales of a few tens of parsecs and going to last scales. They remain collimated, bore by the momentum driven collimation because we are launching them with some opening angle. But as soon as we launch this, there is recollimation. Eventually, beyond a certain distance, the Kelvin Helmholtz mode actually take over before the things. And that starts to you know, expand the jet beam and they lose collimation. Uh, very nice talk, the merchant. I, I have a, a, a question about you talked about inclined jets and all that. Uh, have you guys talked about that? This is the key, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, especially, uh, you know, to explain things like X type radio sources and all that. And these days, it's also getting very interesting in the high energy neutrinos because this two colliding. So, two ways to answer this. Yeah. One is, of course, I'll refer to Bhagat because he has modeled X type yeah, sources. Okay, excellent. And the other thing is, of course, there have been recent efforts as well to the, the multi phase stuff that I showed. It does not take into account any of the jet motions or the inbuilt diffusion. But recent groups, for example, the Oxford groups, the Talbot Dow, they have actually uh, modeled the subject position of an alpha disk that takes care of the angular momentum. I have a new PhD student who's actually going to work on that. Yeah. So, is it possible to kind of bring in a kind of a binary black hole scenario into oh, that's that's, the, that's, the pro, that's his project. Okay. Uh, yes, we, we, can, we can We can do it. Starts with a precision jet, goes to binary black hole. This is both hidden in with gravitational waves. Exactly. I will. I will. I will. I will. I'll talk about this. <laughs> okay. Uh, very nice. I mean, I could not attend your talk uh, because I have to go around and around. But anyway, the uh, one thing about I'm what more interested about this this particle uh, acceleration stuff that we have with Bhargav. Uh, so, it, generally speaking, these particles are they, they has to follow uh, Lorentz uh, force, right? They'll follow the streamline velocity streamline. They just have velocity. In, 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 in truth, they will follow the Lorentz force, but uh, they but they are they're they're generating a, 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 in in our stuff. These are hydro. These are high. No, these are MHT. Yes, yes. But yes. the particles are passive the scalars that are attached to the streamlines. So these are like tracer particles. These are like tracer particles. Oh, tracers. Okay. Tracers. Okay. okay. But now. they don't interact with the magnet. For now. Okay. 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 So I mean, so say, there, there is a when you say that you, if you lose the particles, uh, they, say, they, right? they get out of the jet beam. That's what I meant. But what we are not doing is the we are dumping some energy in the particles at the site of shocks. The particles, the fluid does not know that. Mm -hmm. In the future iterations, we are actually planning to also take away energy from the fluid in both systems. Very, very nice talk. Uh, I think my first question was part will be partially answered by uh, about what happens if you introduce protons instead of just electrons in the system. Because Actually, that's I, when we do, you that's another project of another yeah, student exactly. of mine. So that's a different uh, thing. I wanted to, a curious thing I wanted to know is that in supernova remnants, for example, particle acceleration at shocks have shown uh, magnetic field amplifications. Correct. Do you see such kind of things here also? Well, magnetic fields will be naturally amplified at the shocks because of the impression. We will find see those features yes, yes, very yes, clearly yes. here also. Okay. I'll refer you to my, uh, the one that I did not talk about, Minakshi 21. Okay. Where we clearly show the negative okay. Right. Actually, there is Thanks. another Thanks. another module which is basically he's talking about Lagrangian. I will also talk about Lagrangian. There's another module called the MHT P, mm -hmm. where P essentially P the particles will essentially experience the Lorentz force. Right. Now, in this case, the particles can crisscross the shock yeah. and thereby generate uh, magnetic fields yeah. by amplifying the field on the down But that right. happens on a much subway scale compared yeah. to Lasker simulation. So we cannot do that in situ. Okay. Very insightful, Dr. Pansun. I had a very quick question regarding the inflows you previously yeah. mentioned about. Uh, so what are the physical conditions under which uh, that inflows happen instead of outflows? And what would be the physical implications on uh, star production? Well, uh, inflow will happen mainly because of gravity. So if you have gravity and, and there's nothing to stop the gas from falling in, and also cooling from the outer atmosphere. So if you 
if you have the then you know azathamol density structures have slight perturbation as you start to have cooling the densities were uh, you know it will form the denser and denser clump and start forming extreme falling in the central regions inflows in the central part of the black hole that is again what we had in the talks in the, in the previous and uh, previous cycles these guys didn't how you launch the jets again i would again refer to the previous stuff so the one was nine one for pain mechanism so you would have uh, the material forming efficient disk and then launching the uh, so the inflows and outflows are related at the black hole scale that is some, not something that we are explicitly doing in this because there's too much of a scale separation okay so let us try uh maybe after the okay so let us move on let's thanks the bunch of answers so our next speaker is Vargo, and Vargo is going to talk on decoding the role of instabilities in setting dynamics of MDM jets and its subsequent feedback on cluster scales. Perfect. <clears throat> so, good evening, everyone. And uh, I would like to thank uh, for giving this opportunity to present some of the recent work that we have been doing um, with the help of the collaborators over here, the Banjan being one of them, and Indu as well. And uh, I will essentially focus with the time constraint that I have on understanding the. I'm gone. I will just just go ahead. Now what this is. Okay, so I'll start again. And uh, so essentially, uh, in this presentation, I will focus mainly on the work that have been done by my PhD students, Sriyashriti and Gaurav, and also an MS student who has basically started doing uh, work on understanding the impact of instabilities on uh, AGN jet dynamics. And I will also focus essentially how these jets, when they enter into large dynamical scales of the cluster scales, how they actually play a crucial role um, in, in, in driving effects. Uh, at cluster level. So the uh, so the question over here is that we have been hearing the last talk by the Banj and Mary explain what are these relativistic jets, but why it is so important to study relativistic jets? It is important from the perspective of the complexity that they actually they provide over here. 
because it is essentially an interplay of multiple mechanisms that are acting in tandem uh, to basically drive the non-thermal emission in these relativistic jets. The three main mechanisms, essentially, when you talk about relativistic jets, uh, you can basically see radio emission uh, coming at large parsec scales or so mega parsec scales. But if you basically see the magnetic fields and do the back of the envelope calculation, you would notice that there should not be any synchrotron emission unless there is some sort of in situ particle acceleration that is happening within these sets. And in principle, there are three main mechanisms that actually work in tandem uh, to kind of govern the particle acceleration mechanisms within these fields. The first one is essentially the more common one that is shocks. The shocks tend to accelerate particle using the Fermi first order process. And they are quite common throughout the jet and also on the radio lobe, which are these dark uh, uh, or the bright features that you see at the end of the jet. You, at, at regions where you have these radio lobes, you also have turbulent flows. And therefore, turbulence can also play an effective role in accelerating particle in conjunction with shocks to produce or sustain particle acceleration over there. And in regions pretty close to the black hole, where you have strong magnetic fields, magnetic reconnections plays an important role uh, in, in accelerating particles and thereby uh, generating very, very high energetic particles to begin with that can particularly act as seed particles as, you, as they go along. In addition to that, when you talk about the dynamics of the jet, the dynamics of the jet is not straightforward and simple. It also is marred by a lot of instabilities which is extremely common in uh, magnetic flows or MHD flows when you have a toroidal kind of component of the magnetic fields. So the main focus is to understand that how these instabilities kind of or how these different mechanisms couple with each other throughout the jet and it not only affects the properties of the jet but also the ambient medium surrounding it. And the holy grail as we all see from simulations perspective is that how do we basically bridge whatever simulations that we are doing with observations and can we make any sense of, of these simulations by directly comparing with observations. So just to give you a glimpse as there are some students here that there are the major instability, one of the main instability of the jet because the jets are essentially moving faster than the ambient is just the Kelvin Helmholtz instability but that is also a hydro instability. But there are important current driven instabilities which are very, very particular of magnet, uh, magnetically driven flows. And there, those can be categorized into, let's say, a sausage mode instability with an M equal to zero, where you essentially have a toroidal component of the magnetic field and it squeezes at regular intervals and it basically produces uh, a more like a, uh, a density compression uh, at some region in the shock and you essentially see uh, at some region of the jet and you see concentration of. Uh, of, of plasma over there and you essentially see sausage kind of instabilities. And of course, this sausage instability is controlled by the strength of the poloidal or the BZ component of the magnetic field. If it is much higher than the sausage instability stabilizes. But the more important uh, instability, which is actually far more common in, in flows, in jets pretty close to the black hole, where you are magnetically dominated and you have toroidal component of the magnetic field is the kink mode. And the kink mode, again is producing a kink like structure and it is governed by not only the pitch parameter but also on how the b5 is compared or the strength of the b5 compared to, to bz. So with this kind of instabilities, the question is that these are theoretical instabilities but do we really see them or do we really observe them in jets? And the answer is yes. I mean the standard picture of what which we, we have been studies, studying since the steady flows of jets and so on, this has now kind of been changed uh, with, the, with the high resolution imaging that we can do of the jet very, very close to the black hole. Here is a particular example, which has been uh, uh, over here. This is an M87 jet, which has been taken by Craig Walker. And you can clearly see that this jet is not the standard jet that you can think of. It is pretty hollow to begin with, and it has bright and filamentary structures. And that is not only one particular case, a very recent study uh, with Radio Astron has shown for 3C279, a beautiful helical kind of feature, which is uh, kind of visible uh, in such kind of, in such kind of jets. But if you look at 
uh, different other telescopes, which cannot resolve. You just see these two blobs, or you can see this SJ feature, which can relate to maybe a processing jet or some feature which is basically producing the helical feature. Another important aspect that I wanted to highlight upon is that you can see periodic brightening of this helical structure. And this periodic brightening of this helical structure is mainly attributed to the fact that there is some sort of line of sight uh, motion of the blob towards you, which kind of enhances the, uh, uh, the emission just because of the Doppler effect. Now, such kind of kink instabilities or such kind of instabilities of the helical flow structures have been also used or have been also discussed in the literature to explain long term quasi periodic oscillations of the order of uh, uh, four days or so on, so on, uh, and so on. And in this particular case of uh, uh, BL lax. And in here, the idea is that uh, such kind of kink instabilities, when they are produced, they produced a kind of emission which are periodic in nature and sort of flaring activity again by the same logic that certain a line of sight component of the flow is towards you and you enhance. So, so the main question that we want to address is that how such kink instabilities which are extremely common uh, in, in such of uh, in such AGN jets or jets can impose um, uh, some constraints on the non-thermal emission that we actually observe uh, in, in these sources. Right. So, uh, uh, Dipanjan has already uh, gone through this, but I'll just give a brief uh, reminder. So, we essentially use uh, the Pluto code, which essentially solves the set of RMAC equations, special relativistic MAC equations. Of course, uh, these are ideal MAC equations. However, we also have resistive effects. And these are the standard uh, uh, approach what people do. And I think uh, the HD part Sudeep mentioned about this. But this is essentially the, the crux of the, uh, the, the particle module which we have developed. Because if you want to really understand the origin of non-thermal emission, which mainly comes from the singleton process, you need to really know how these particles are getting accelerated and cooled and so on and so forth. So there are two flavors of particles that have been incorporated. So this is essentially how the fluid uh, functions. So this is just the, the block diagram for the fluid. If you just take this, this is a pure Pluto, which has been available uh, in public. And this is what we have done. We have kind of coupled the Eulerian framework with the Lagrangian framework. And they are kind of coupled in a manner that uh, there is no feedback as such uh, for the Lagrangian macroparticles. But there is a feedback associated with MHD pick, which is another flavor where the particles are no longer moving along the streamlines but they are actually experiencing the electric and the magnetic fields. And the Lagrangian particles can be used as subgrid particles to understand how these spectra of these particles evolve uh, over a period of time as they move in different, different positions locally based on the magnetic field strengths and the shock conditions. So now with this kind of background, let us basically address the first problem where we want to understand how such a kink instability which is basically produced inherent inside a jet at let's say parsec scales, how does that have an impact on the, let's say the light curve or the emission uh, coming from, uh, from such jets. So what we do is we basically uh, take a very small portion, a toy model of, of, of this jet, it's a, it's a plasma column, and we perturb this plasma column with an M equal to one perturbation, thereby producing a beautiful kink-like structure and we basically inject particles. These are particle distribution that you can see here. Inject particles and try to see how we can basically model the synthetic emission coming from these particles. So this is this is a uh, this is the MHD uh, calculation. This is the jet uh, density. You can see an helical magnetic field. How this helical magnetic field transforms a cylindrical jet-like structure into a beautiful, pink, unstable uh, un jet. And you can essentially see. Uh, uh, all the features, you can see strong sh uh, shocks associated with it and all the helical features associated with it. And in order to incorporate the physics pretty close to the black hole, we say that the particles that are losing energy has components from the adiabatic loss, the synchrotron loss, and also an external Compton associated with it. Because essentially when you're close to the black hole, you also have an external component associated with it. So we uh, we incorporated a simplified uh, a model uh, to do this. And this is what our standard um, initial condition is all about, where we have a gamma 
uh, five jet. So it's essentially representing a blazer jet. And we are essentially trying to see how the emission would be at a particular small I angle. Quick question. So your uh, particles that you're injecting are tracer particles. They, they are just inherent in the jet. Okay. So it's a periodic boundary. It's fine. It's okay. What I'm asking is now when you are estimating the uh, synchrotron loss, you don't have magnetic field. We do have magnetic fields in this is MHD. This is MHD. Oh, so this is different from these. Hmm. Okay, okay. This is, these are MHD calculations. I have MHD. In the later half, they were all MHD. Okay. <laughs> so these are all MHD calculations and what we basically assume is certain aspects that we take about three lakh particles and so on and initial power loss, some initial distribution of spectra and the EC emission we say it's coming mainly coming from a 5000 Kelvin kind of uh, 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 temperature and uh, has some sort of parameters to govern, uh, govern these kind of flows. So what we see is that we can essentially now when we have this things we can essentially do all the line of sight integration and try to make a mock light curve where we have a normalized flux on the y axis and the time uh, basically after the instability sets in on the x axis. And you can clearly see uh, uh, signatures of variability associated with the flow when essentially you have strong bouts of uh, instabilities associated with it. So you have the kink in generated and this kink instabilities produce shocks and the shocks are essentially producing high instabilities uh, or are flaring, uh, in, in especially in X-ray. So this is X-ray. Uh, right. So essentially you see uh, a strong X-ray emission over here. And this is mainly if you look at the spectrum, this, this is the initial spectrum, very, very. So these are different, different curves, uh, lines represent a different spectrum. And you can see whenever there is a flare, you have a much flatter spectrum in the synchrotron part, which kind of indicates that you have strong X-ray emission coming because of the shocks that are generated or because of the flow which is undergone this thing in severities and generating such kind of localized shocks which gives rise to this flatter spectrum. And then again, it comes down and cools down as the particles cools down and the instability dissipates uh, this energy. So such kind of flaring activity are, 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 are quite common uh, when you have such pink flows. In addition to that, we have also done a correlation measurements and we can see that uh, definitely as expected, the X-ray starts to peak first because that is where you have an immediate shock due to the X-ray at that point your X-ray starts to peak, then comes the optical and then the radio. And they are kind of correlated, but there is some delay and which can be very well easily explained by the synchrotron nature of, of, of this kind of, uh, of this kind of emission associated with a single kind of populations uh, uh, from such kind of flows. So, so what, what basic takeaway is that such kind of kink instabilities play a crucial role in understanding how, uh, how the, the jets are getting unstable and variable, especially the flaring part uh, aspect of that. Now, such kind of uh, peculiar morphologies of the jet does not kind of restrict themselves to just very small region. Even at large scales, they actually have highly peculiar uh, flow structures. And with the advent of Meerkat, I think people are kind of getting more and more such evidences of how the jets are behaving very notoriously. Uh, at very, very large scale. So here is one example. This is called the cosmic dance, um, uh, where you can essentially see two jets kind of behaving, bending and behaving uh, in one particular cluster here. And there is also another aspect which is of interest to us is this in this cluster, there is this particular uh, jet over here, which is showing very, very uh, interesting features of uh, kind of variable emission. So I've zoomed in over here. And this kind of variable emissions are kind of described as rib, tail, and thetters. And uh, this has been described as uh, kind of, an, we, they really do not know what is the origin of this thing. And the possible origin can be thought about is either it's a pulse jet or a processing jet, a single jet, or it could be possibly a twin jet where there is a twin tail source and you are essentially looking at the jet on this angle. So you are essentially seeing two jets interacting and so on. Or it could rather be just a simple kink jets. And so with this 
focus in mind we try to see if we can really explain this and break the dichotomy or if such features can be explained by pure king gems the most simplest of the solution so what we did was we started with a uh, uh, this is a work done by uh, my uh, work in progress by the MS student where we again uh, do the same simulations we inject the jet like a nozzle flow with some density contrast in a full 3d simulations with toroidal magnetic fields and we focus on the fact that this is a single jet no pulsation no precession but we uh, have an inherent rotation in the jet and we try to see what sort of and inject particles and so on do the same business and we try to see what sort of radio emission such a jet can produce uh, particularly at 1.2 gigahertz which is essentially what meerkat sees so here is a little movie of the synchrotron emission from this particular jet as you can clearly see the jet has undergone uh, this is the intensity the synchrotron intensity as you can see normalized and you can clearly see that when you have a rotation induced in these jets you tend to produce these beautiful kink-like structures. And in addition to that, when the kink goes into the non-linear stage, it produces a very jellyfish-like uh, feature over here. So we went into details of, uh, of these kind of features. And as you can clearly see this, that if you zoomed into the region where the jet has some kink feature, you can clearly see the formation of these ribs, uh, rib feature because of the kink instability. And if you look at the non-linear part where the kink has basically broken and become non-linear, you can very well see there is a signature of tethers. So how did we prove this? What we did is we then made a, quantitative, a qualitative comparison with what observers have said here. So this is essentially what you can see on the left is a spectral index map of the riptail uh, mistake. And this is essentially the intensity curve which is following particularly a Gaussian. So what you do is to do a transverse cut of intensities on this direction and try to basically see how the intensity is bearing. And this is the spectral index and this is the intensity, it's particularly Gaussian. So we went into our simulated or synthetic emission map and we did the same analysis and we can clearly nicely see a Gaussian kind of feature associated with this. And this is mainly because of the fact that you essentially have this kind of S or rib like feature just because of the rotation that is basically produced in inherent of the jet. And you can clearly see such kind of Gaussian signatures associated with it. So this is called the rib feature. We went ahead and looked are you, into are you giving the rotation also on the magnetic fields. So, yeah, basically at the, at the jet. So everything is uh, rotating. And we then looked into the rib features and the rib features also, or the theta features, where you can see from the observations they had made a cut uh, in their emission maps, and they could see multiple Gaussian kind of features. So this is the blue curve, is basically their emission, uh, their intensity curve. And the similar feature where you have mixture of multiple Gaussian is also seen in our case where you can clearly see the formation of such tethers, which are nothing but does the nonlinear uh, evolution of, of, of the kink mode. So this kind of uh, kind of showcases how such hybrid uh, simulations can give rise to qualitative understanding of observations and can explain uh, what are the different aspects in this. And not only that, we went ahead and looked into polarization as what um, uh, Dipanjan also showed. And it is very nice to see that whenever there is a helical kind of, uh, whenever there's a rib feature, you essentially have a helical magnetic field, which kind of indicates that this is typically kink unstable. But when it goes into the nonlinear phase, uh, the, these are magnetic field vectors, by the way, the magnetic field vectors get stochastic because essentially it's highly turbulent and no longer kind of sustains the uh, the geometry of the flow. So this is kind of showing the case where the jet is kind of transforming from a magnetically dominated into a kinetically dominated flow, where initially, well, at the bottom, you have strong helical field, whereas at the top, you essentially have some random magnetic fields because of dissipation introduced by the kink, uh, kink instabilities. And finally, in the last part that I want to focus is that how such jets, when they actually penetrate or when they move in these cluster mediums, how do they basically impact the cluster on a much larger scale? So what are the observations, signatures that we essentially see? And this is a work done by my uh, uh, student, Gaurav. And this is essentially focusing on understanding the impact of jets at cluster scales. And this is one particular example. This is a cluster RBS 797. And this is a Chandra X-ray map, where you can clearly see 
that there is a beautiful uh, cavity like feature surrounded by bright x ray emission. And this cavity is only oriented in this direction, but there is also some cavity along this direction. And when you overlay this x ray map with the radio map, what you can clearly see that the, along this cavity lies some radio electrons or some radio emission, which is extended along this cavity, but also driving this little cavity is this beautiful jet that is essentially coming out from, uh, from uh, inside of this galaxy. And please note that such kind of uh, jet has completely oriented its direction. So initial jet would have been in this direction. The oriented jet is uh, almost 90 degree uh, to, to such kind of flows. So the question is that can we, from simulations, try to understand if such reorientation of jets can play an important role in producing such X-shaped uh, features and, and, and there are other things. So this is the, uh, uh, the simulation movie. You can essentially see the density. On the left-hand side, what we have done is we have generated an X-shaped radio galaxy from a particular model called the backflow. Where you, what you can see is that the jet is essentially going in a highly traction medium, and there is a backflow associated with it, and this backflow basically generates uh, due to pressure gradient and X kind of like morphology, which you can clearly see here. But the wings are much much more broader. This is called the lobe. These are called the wings. They are much much more broader. Whereas on the right hand side, what we have done is we have essentially used the same initial condition and same initial jet, but after about seventy odd mega years. We swapped or we flipped the jet by about of 90 degrees. And now you can clearly see that this is now the lobe, which is the active jet. And these are the wings associated with this, which are far more collimated than what you basically see in a backflow structure. And this is indicative of certain very, very important observational aspects in such X-shaped radio galaxies. And indeed, we would like to understand that whether such, whether there is any way to kind of distinguish between uh, such kind of uh, formation mechanisms uh, in, in this uh, in this in this in this in this uh, simulations another another aspect or another case that we focused on where we essentially injected the jet along the uh, uh, major axis and then we flipped along the minor axis so this is this is slightly different than what people do they first throw the jet along the minor axis and then they flip along the major axis but here we did the opposite and what was interesting is that we can clearly see uh, a formation of a very beautiful being like structure and a short jet, narrow jet like feature, uh, which is moving through a very dense medium associated with this. And this is a density structure or 3D. This is 2D density and 3D volume. And lo and behold, there are also indications of such uh, kind of jets where you have a much, much more broader <laughs> extended bin and uh, a, a jet associated with, uh, with these things, uh, which has been observed. So this kind of indicates that the jet reorientations have an interesting uh, aspect uh, to explain such kind of weird morphologies that you see at, at much, much more larger scales. Uh, this is a radio galaxy A3670, which I've, which I've shown, uh, showed here, which kind of clearly shows uh, the orientation of this. And then what we did is when we took these simulations and then we produced thermal X-ray maps, try to understand that how the thermal X-ray maps uh, uh, would look like when these uh, simulations essentially go on. And here, from the last simulation, we generated this synthetic thermal X-ray map, and we took an ellipse, and we tried to see what sort of intensity profiles uh, you see here. And you can clearly see that there are beautiful cavities being generated in these intensity profiles if you move along this elliptical feature. And these uh, cavities are marked as C1, C2, C3, and C4, which is essentially indicative of the fact that the jets are essentially opening up uh, uh, an area and the strong shocks, which are essentially getting enhanced in, in X-ray emission, uh, uh, and that you basically see as cavities and bright uh, features in this. Similarly, we also did it when we swapped it. Now, this is along the minor axis first, and then the major axis, again, in these kind of cases, we do see formation of four cavities symmetric uh, because of the uh, orientation, which is absolutely absent when we do a backflow uh, modeling, where we only see the formation of two cavities at uh, in X-rays at larger scales than uh, than uh, than four cavities that you see in reoriented jet points. So I will I'll stop and summarize here that it is extremely important and imperative to connect microphysical processes to large scale jet flows 
and this is important from the perspective of comparing simulations directly with observations and therefore hybrid framework or an alternative hybrid framework including feedback and so on is, is very very crucial we saw how kinks are important at all scales even at parsec scales kinks tend to generate uh, shocks which are essentially responsible for flaring even in x rays and you can see uh, flattening of spectra in um, in x rays due to such kind of kinks and even at kiloparsec scales they can be very crucial because they can generate rips and thatters, uh, 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 which you basically see in such kind of flows. And finally, when you talk about jet interaction with clusters, except due to reorientations have a very crucial role to play. And uh, you can basically uh, try, uh, see that these, these kind of cavities are generated because of the reoriented jet flows. And that is what uh, I wanted to highlight upon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, person, a lot of persons. Okay, so we'll take few. What is the time period for the, the kink and uh, the solar oscillations? Oh, the kink, oh, so that is basically given by the uh, growth, the high growth. So essentially, if you talk about the kink mode, uh, in these kind of simulations, the last uh, KPC kind of simulation, are you talking about the uh, plasma column kind of simulations? Yes, if you consider uh, mm -hmm. the agent jet, because in observations we see the oscillation is typically like seven months. Mm -hmm. That is a, that is exactly what we see. The time periods are of the order. So this is so this 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 year uh, I'm talking the flare times are of the order of I think few uh, less than a month or so less than a month a few twenty days or so I think I, if I remember the number. Okay. So at the beginning we showed an edge brighton M87 jet. Yeah. So where does the explanation lie to that? Right. So basically, the idea over here is, I mean, Indu uh, must have shown some GNMG simulations. Now, it, what has been clearly coming out is that this GNMG MAD, so the magnetically arrested disk kind of cal uh, calculations, clearly shows a signature of very fast Blanford snipe kind of jet, which is very less dense. Of course, this is not to be believed much because there are all the floor density associated with it going not over there, but the <laughs> edge is getting brightened because of the, the turbulent flow that is associated with the uh, with this thing so these are like 87 jet is not age bright no this is it, it is, is, yeah, it is, it is, it is. there was 87 image yes that is image there is not image age brightened no it, it, is. it doesn't have a proper hot spot it is sort of you know margin no no the core, no, no, no. Near, near the core. The core, it's not edge right edge means the outside it's on 20 swatch of edge you see the filament it's essentially filament you know the that is fine. That is near the core. It is brightened, so it is almost like an F R one type J. Mm -hmm. Show that the yeah. 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 So this is basically this is kind of feature that is essentially coming out. So it's hollow, and this is mainly because of the, uh, the you you tend to have basically a turbulent B five dominated beams or jets or what you can say flows. which kind of like a tower uh, tower jet basically driving around the Blanford snag jet and then governed by the Blanford pain kind of solutions. So these kind of features are brighter because you have turbulent flows over there, which are essentially getting uh, launched uh, from the equation disks. And that is mainly the reason, whereas this guy is not showing any emission associated with this. All right, thanks. So, so very quickly, the synthetic light curves and everything that you showed, the parameters you took, it seems that the power law index is six mm -hmm. and the uh, gamma yes. max is yeah, right. so these are Those seem very high. Is there a reason for that? So these are essentially just initial conditions, the one. And so what happens is that these particles are injected with these, and then these particles move in the column. And at localized region, they will get shocked. So if minus six is a particle spectrum, and so they will get to minus two, and then it becomes flat. Something like that. And then again, it will cool because of the synchrotron. So next, after it crosses the shock, it will get flatter. And then it will go again in the flow, cool down. And again, maybe get another shock. But that time, it may be weaker. So it is all kind of, uh, I mean, this is just an initial condition to begin with. No. It all evolves. And the fact that you have, uh, I mean, fact that it starts from the instabilities because that these shock steepening time is there. The instability growth time is there. And once the instability grows, you have Steepening of the stocks, the stocks become strong and it, it flattens and it flares.
very simple place. So you have this, you introduce the rotation, right? And yeah. then you have that curve, like S-like, uh, snake-like uh, stuff. Now my question is that uh, this magnetic fields is there, right? So magnetic field will remove the uh, rotation itself, okay? So what, I mean, where is the feature that the magnetic field is? So basically what we see that it is rotating, right? So yeah. Have, yeah. So it's doing like this, right? Yeah. The magnetic field should remove the rotation, uh, no, so basically, it's a complex interplay. I mean to say, there has been discussion whether there is a, indeed. I mean to say, you uh, essentially have a transfer of angular momentum from the magnetic field to the flow and vice versa. Yeah, right, yes. So that kind of is happening over here. It is clear. I mean, I mean this will. I mean the strength of the magnetic field and rotation will control where this kind of goes into this phase, the nonlinear phase. So if you have very very weak magnetic fields, then it will take longer time for it to basically go to longer. Uh, okay. the same so, so it's basically like the, you so can weaker, control this. So, so you can conclude that the weaker it is, the more it will show that. Yes, exactly. So you can control this. I mean to say, uh, where is this going to happen? Where it will go to non-linear phase and so on. So we have done simulation multiple uh, magnetic fields, but this is the one which you like. So we show this. Quick one. It's really quick. So yeah. on this slide, uh, yeah. no, 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 yes. I'll get. I'll get. <laughs> What's the typical beta here? Sorry, the magnetic beta parameter. So this is uh, alphanic mag number of one, I think. Alphanic mag number of one to begin with the injection alphanic mag number. But of course, the magnetic field will decay as you go on. So basically, the mag number will change. So injection alphanic mag number is one. Okay. Last question. Uh, one question, right? Yes. Yeah. Only one Not question. Five questions. <laughs> so this is about uh, you said. Uh, the sudden flip case and we also did a gradual flip case where we see some features but the point here is that we really do not under, know exactly the time scales in which it will do it oh that can be done very yeah easy. so very easily so whenever we see that we tried with let's say a flip gradual flip of let's say 10 mega years or so so it will take 10 mega years to flip in this direction but we do not see very very drastic effect as far as the uh, emission the large scale emission is concerned because overall, it kind of loses the fact that there is over there. In addition to that, I must also say that we have, uh, and I have not shown here, this with this student, we have kind of simulated, uh, as you were talking about processing jet, we have simulated an S-shaped kind of feature from the radio emission. So the UGMRT data, we have simulated it, and we have shown that how the standard kinetic models which you fit to get the binary T parameter, the distance between the binary, the mark, and so on, how that kind of has to be altered because that is purely kinematic. When you do simulations, you are essentially interacting with, with the ambient medium. And that has a to be altered if you just do dynamatic, uh, kinematic phase. I'm not sure that. Okay. I think I discovered. I did not ask. This is probably the last one. It's fine. Uh, Stalin will not be given any question. <laughs> Why? No, no, no. Stalin is spending most of the time outside. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, coming back to let's say the smaller scale, like in uh, galactic black holes, so there's occasionally they also so uh, instead of persistent jet uh, bullet kind of injection. So you didn't talk about anything like that. I mean, how to do handle this situation? Yeah. So basically, bullet kind of situation is uh, is something which you can do just by changing the uh, input conditions. In our case. But indeed, such bullet kind of situation can happen uh, when you have uh, kind of also inherent variation in the accretion flows. And this basically happens when you have mad kind of flows and then you basically throw away the magnetic flux and then the mad dissipates into same and then it goes away and so on. So this is one, one phase of which we see that you have some kind of boosting kind of feature. But uh, we haven't done that. Uh, Actually, my Concern is even in most of the cases what you were talking about, the gravity is not getting enough importance. No, no, gravity is not getting important. <laughs> so we are get... far away from the black hole in that case. So in that case, the gravity will be an important. Yes, yeah, but we are far away from the uh, from from that that zone.
न्यूमेरिकल सिमुलेशन Hello everyone. I can see everybody is tired. So uh, I'm Rajkishor Bhutti, and I'm uh, going to be talking about the matter formulations of relatives, relatively, relatively driven jets. So this work is uh, done with collaborators from here, Aries and uh, University of Illinois. So. Yeah, so talking about jets, we have a very good introduction. So these are uh, like what we do with objects which are seen in multiple scenarios, including our reverse aging and uh, microgazers. And the occurrence of these jets seem to be uh, very well correlated whenever there is active change. And now, in case of black holes, we do not have any hard surfaces. So these jets should come out from the equating matter itself. And we have like very good observation conclude that uh, they originate from within 100 social region, region on the equation base. Now, uh, despite multiple theoretical and simulation studies, yeah. these questions still remain open questions, jet launching, jet acceleration, and plasma content of jets. And in uh, talking about simulation, mostly these questions, uh, like most of the attempts have been addressed through magnetic jet launching work models. But uh, I particularly highlight these two uh, cases here, which uh, are not uh, the magnetic jet launching model, are actually not uh, explaining the observation of these two uh, sources. So, first one is the SS43 period, which is a micro laser. Now, the medium content of this SS433 is observed to be higher, which we expect, but to be uh, uh, what what is being suggested by the blank genetic mechanism. And there is GRS112468, which has higher jet power, but it has a low black hole spin. So there should be an additional mechanism which can also drive the jet. So we can look for, for other models. We yeah, so we are looking into the jet models from the uh, aspects of radiation hydrodynamics. So as I said, jets originate from a region very close to the black hole. So they will be influenced by the radiation field of this. And that this interaction of plasma, charged plasma with the radiation field will be governed by the, uh, the equations of radiation and hydrodynamics. And it, it is a well-established subject. And multiple steady state or analytical investigation has been done by following equations of radiation hydrodynamics. So I'll uh, just give a brief overview of the progress made in this field. So first, it is studied the dynamics of plasma over an extended alpha disk. And he obtained a limit on the terminal speed of uh, these relatively driven outflows, which was termed as uh, magic speed, and which is approximately 0.45 times the speed of light. And later on, Sikora and Wilson studied the acceleration and collimation in case of thick disk. And uh, for electron positron plasma, they were able to obtain the Lorentz sector around 3. And uh, later on, uh, to study the winds, Fukue studied uh, this problem in the full logistic uh, framework. And he found out the whatever the magic speed was quoted, Fukue found out the speed is less than that uh, value. But uh, this study was important uh, uh, not only because of the speed he was getting, this also addressed one more question regarding the collimation of these flows. So 
the winds gain angular momentum from the radiation field and they, the collimation was very poor. So later on to investigate what kind of this geometry will collimate the jet, uh, these type of outflow, outflows, Fukue took a, um, this which has a kind of a corona type of structure. So which resulted in a very good uh, degree of collimation and uh, he found out uh, the radiatively driven outflows can be well collimated and have well to six speeds. So now what kind of this geometry, uh, like uh, what kind of parameter, equation two parameter can give us uh, this type of geometry. And we already saw in previous talks that effective type disk models for a certain range of flow parameter can result in a outer subcapillary this uh, subcapillary flow and inner push of disk, which is kind of a torus type of structure. And uh, yeah, so, and also numerical simulation uh, have all these advective disk model have shown that uh, because of the large thermal gradient present in the post of disk, it automatically drives, drives some outflow. So we have a situation in case of advective disk, we have some thermally driven outflow. We have a, a kind of a corona type of structure and we want to investigate what would be the interaction of the radiation field with this, uh, these, uh, the outflow in this geometry. So from the steady state uh, perspective, from the steady state solution, it, uh, this has been investigated by Chattopadhyay and Chattopadhyay. And they found out that outflowing jet uh, can achieve the velocity in range 0.2 C to 3 C. And they considered the radiation field only from the push of this. And in the relativistic uh, hydrodynamic uh, regime, the pair plasma jets uh, obtain the Lorentz vector greater than two. Later on, when the radiation field of the septic and this was also included in the study. So it was shown that the Lorentz factor can be achieved up to greater than 10. So a noteworthy point what I'm trying to highlight here is that the radiation can also effectively accelerate the jets to relativistic speeds. But the point is, these are all the steady state investigations. So we want to follow this from the numerical simulation perspective. So first we started with 1D estimates, just to check like in the time dependent uh, uh, framework how this evolves. So we took uh, this uh, this adjective type disk. So we have a subcapillary and disk and post of disk and we have a jet. So we are not addressing here the launching of jet. How it is generated, we are not concerned about it at the moment. We, are, we just want to see how the radiation field accelerates the jet, whether it is sufficient enough to accelerate jets to realistic speed. And this is our framework. So where we have modified the metric. So the gravity is from the metric itself. We are not doing full GR, but we are uh, just taking the uh, uh, we are taking curvature through GTT term. So this uh, makes our life a little bit simpler because the rest of the uh, part of the metric is essentially flat. And uh, the radiation term enter here in the momentum equation and the energy equation. And uh, these consist of radiation force, radiation energy density, and radiation pressure. Now, if you pay attention here, the radiation uh, energy density and radiation pressure appear with a, uh, like they couple with a minus speed. So, basically, what they will try to do, they will try to bring down the speed. So, this serves as a radiation drag term. So, I'll come back to this radiation drag term later on to show its importance. So we uh, first simulated a 1D case. So we took uh, this luminosity, inner part of the post of this luminosity was somewhere around 0.25 electric ton. And outer part has 0 0.04 electric ton. And these are our injection parameter. And uh, here you can see the jets are actually approaching C. And the the, the distribution of the large uh, vector, it is going up to somewhere around 20. So indeed we have relativistic jets and also we are launching with the subsonic boundary condition. So initially jet is at the base it is subsonic as it goes through the radiation field it acquires uh, it attains the it is being accelerated becomes transonic at some point and ultimately it is subsonic. But the question is this is still 1D but in uh, real scenario jet will have some transverse structure as well. So how does it uh, appear in 2D? So first we investigated what happens if we remove the radiation field. We only study thermally driven transonic jets in 2D because 
uh, like simplest, we have one D type inflow and outflow solution. There, like in one in one D as well, we see one D type uh, solution also have some uh, like outflow velocity. So we launched uh, Jet with these in injection parameters. We just remove the radiation field. So you can see that the Jet has significant thermal energy to overcome that gravitational barrier. It gets accelerated. But the problem with that is that that is not stable. It, um, because of this mixing there, which keeps on going towards the jet axis, ultimately destabilizes the jet. And uh, the final structure what we get, we can not actually call it a jet. Now, to go in 2D, so we have now in, uh, uh, to, to, in multi dimension sim uh, simulation, the radiation field has now 10 uh, components, so which are radiation energy density, three components of the radiation uh, force and six components of radiation pressure. Now the distribution of these radiation field uh, specifically depends on the uh, geometry of the disk which we are taking. So for our case, you can see uh, this, uh, the, uh, along the Z direction, here uh, FZ which will accelerate the jet and PJZ which, which will try to bring down the velocity. So FZ is greater than PZZ, while in R and theta direction, the drag term turn out to be stronger. So we expect that in R and theta direction, it should not allow the velocity to go very high in comparison to what we expect in the Z direction. So first thing first, we only took uh, the radiative moments which were dynamically important in only one, one uh, in one day studies because we know what we expect in these type of simulation. So we lost the jets. Now we turn on the radiation field, but only the uh, moments which were uh, in, uh, which were dynamically important in one day. So basically, E, FZ, and PZZ. So in that case, you can see before the jet expands in the lateral direction, it is being accelerated in the jet uh, in the uh, along the jet direction. So it has a well polymetric structure, and as it uh, goes through the ambient medium. So it starts to form some of the structure and the internal shocks and the rarefaction in the later stages. Now to check the consistency of these 2D uh, simulation, we again verified with the, with the 1D estimates. So for the initial phase, when jet is kind of not being influenced much because of the interaction with the engine media. So the velocity loss factor and Mach number actually match. But uh, some in, for intermediate phase, it overshoots the velocity. This is expected because in 1D versus 2D, there is a uh, in 2D, we have an additional di uh, direction where the jet can thermally expand at a higher rate. So the thermal expansion can give additional boost in multidimensional simulation. In 1D, we are not allowing it to expand in the transfer direction. And finally, when we have the, uh, like uh, along the jet head, when we have formation of lot of structures and the terminal speed turn out to be actually lower than the 1D estimate. And now, to check, apart from the acceleration, to check how the radiation can help in achieving the stability against that the growth of mixing layer. So we just uh, performed one set of simulation with only 10% of the radiation field. So that turned out to be enough to stop that the growth of that mixing layer because now we have now, uh, because the jet is being now accelerated at faster rate. So before these structure can, mix and come towards the jet uh, axis, it is, they are being transported away. So yeah, it, in addition to acceleration, it is also providing stability. Now we include all the radiative moments in our calculation. And you can see this is uh, the, stru uh, the structure formed by the jet the, uh, in the ambient medium as well as the internal structure are kind of different. And also to explain the formation of these alternative high and low density uh, region, we plotted the pressure control. So this is basically here we want to show the inertial confinement of the jet. So when we injected the jet with high density and high pressure into the uh, relatively lower density and low pressure ambient media, the jet like quickly extends. So the internal pressure in the jet beam goes down. So there is a situation where the pressure in the ambient media is higher, higher than the jet beam. So now it 
compresses the beam. So due to the compression, we have now again the high density and high pressure region. So again, that will thermally expand the jet. So alternatively, we have these compression and the refection, uh, compression zone, which are the internal shock and the refection fans. And uh, now the question is whether the inertial confinement is the main collimating agent here or something else is playing a major role. So now, <laughs> as I said, the radiation pressure, what it is doing, it is not allowing the tra transverse velocity to go to the higher values because of the radiation drag. So now to verify this, what we did, we performed two set of simulation, kept everything same. Just turned off the we just turned off the radiation pressure in one uh, one case. So now the case where we turned off the radiation pressure. So now in the R direction, it does not have significant drag. So what happens? The uh, this VR keeps on increasing, and it loses its collimation. So basically, VR and VZ are kind of increasing at the same rate. So we cannot uh, like call this structure as a jet because it has very poor collimation. So which confirms that the radiation pressure is the main collimating agent here. And in addition to that, uh, so this was the effect of the radiation drag on the R direction. So which is basically, actually, which is our main collimating agent. And now in the theta direction, so in the theta direction, there is also a radiation drag. So that helps against the, uh, against the centrifugal forces. So now if, if jet starts with some rotational velocity, because of the centrifugal force, the jet material will be pushed away from the axis. So now that uh, you check that we performed the simulation, we gave 10% of C as a rotational velocity d theta, but uh, the radiation field like, quickly removes the angular momentum from the jet beam. So you can see the distribution of v theta shows along the jet beam, like this structure is, does not have very uh, high value of V theta. So basically, even if we start, uh, even if the jets start with a rotating boundary condition, so even if the jets have some initial rotational velocity, it will be quickly removed by the radiation field. So, yeah, so now to conclude that, so we have simulated jets that are driven by the radiation field of the ignition disk. And we have shown that the relativistic uh, Lorentz factor around 10, can be achieved easily and uh, the radiation field also helps in collimation and also it removes the environment from the jet beam and now for the future work it would be interesting to see uh, these type relatively driven jets in uh, merger scenarios or tidal disruption events or in, in like GRB type of scenario where we have very high aggression rate so there the radiation driving will have like significantly higher uh, it will have significantly higher acceleration in comparison to what we are uh, doing here. So, thank you. Thank you, Raj, for being in time. We have some time for questions. Okay. Yeah, I have two very quick questions. Yes. One is, uh, it seems to be, uh, maybe I'm missing something. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a full uh, radiation uh, image. Uh, no, it is radiation yeah. hydrodynamics. Uh, okay. Radiation hydrodynamics okay. based on the moment formulation. And uh, sorry, I forgot to mention, we are, working the optically thin uh, regime. Okay. The jet is optically thin and uh, the uh, the radiation field is static. So when the jet is interacting with the radiation field, the radiation field is not changing. The jet is gaining momentum. Okay. So you don't so have the closure. So we, we don't need the closure relation because okay. we have like the radiation field is already defined by the, this geometry and the radiative processes. We actually don't need the closure relation because we have everything. And then one, another very quick question is, yes. uh, this is a relativistic flows. Yes. Do you, uh, uh, for take, taking into account the radiation and matter interaction, Yes. do you go to the rest frame in the source frame? So yeah, so like, uh, for example, uh, this is calculated, uh, the radiative moments, if you see these uh, terms are, uh, these are in the form of being. Okay. So ultimately, when we solve our equation in the oil radiant frame, so these transformations are being taken care of. Okay. I have a comment here. I mean, one potential application. Uh, I don't know whether you can do this, but can you basically include effects of radiation force from lines? Uh, because this would be having a very, very important aspect when you talk about jets from very high redshift calf. Where there the lines, uh, line driven winch 
people have been talking about I mean, there are simulations by Daniel Kroger and so all these things. So, but if they do not take into account such kind of detailed calculations. So, the thing about taking the line driven type of wind, they start like very uh, far from the black hole. So here we have like, uh, and these are effective when the uh, line, uh, line driving mechanisms, they generally operate around 4,000 4, to 5,000 Kelvin. So basically for cold flow. What we are doing here, we are launching from very close to the black hole horizon. So that line driving mechanism will not be... So we don't have this uh, electronic structure, structure around structure. the So we have there. So once it is very cold, and some of the protons are even able to capture some of the electrons, then it will be effective. Yeah. So maybe, I mean, what, what he says is fine. Yeah. So if it can do a very long uh, uh, simulation, mm -hmm. but initially the continuum, uh, you know, uh, radiation is affecting. Yes. And later yes. on, we get the in the beginning, we showed relatively inefficient uh, this uh, the thermal jets where it was making and so, it was spreading and then yeah, so this thing, right? Yeah. So yeah. what happened to this yeah. metal finally? Because some metal escaped yeah. infinity or everything falls back. Oh uh, no, like uh, when I followed it, like it uh, kept on uh, the mixing layer kept on disrupting. So ultimately it was all filled up with this turbulent. So actually it like uh there's no transonic. Before it, uh, this head went off, uh, went out of this uh, yeah. computational domain. It got disrupted uh, in the yes. radial direction itself. Yeah. So, like the whatever uh, we injected, what we expected was that uh, was actually transonic in one D. Did not turn out to be transonic in two D. Okay. So, if there are no more questions, that thanks all the speed of the session. One announcement. Yes. Announcement, please. Two announcement. Probably three. Probably three. So you announce. I think he's a better person. <laughs> <laughs> so you announce them. I don't know what the other two. Then I will. Okay. Later on, decide. No, he respect. Yeah. So much. Okay. <laughs> so uh, tomorrow there will be a uh, director's dinner. So we will be ending up early. So around four thirty, we are supposed to end. And then we will get some time and we'll go to Bhutan. There is in country, we are going to have our drink and then we'll come back. So um, so that's for everyone. So that was one minute. Rest of the two you give. Right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so the so idea what are those two? <laughs> so in, if any one of you want to visit the telescope, uh, one is a telescope, if you are interested, you can contact any of us, Sanjeev Priyesh or me. So after if everybody he, wants <laughs> If everybody wants, if if also they are not okay, fine. So wait, like, allow, okay. you the leopards. <laughs> question is, are you delaying the session no, or no, not? No, I'm not delaying the session. It's the choice, like someone uh, would like to take this. So after tea, you can contact. And another, uh, we have the star meeting second year in our science center. So today. Today. Yeah. Then yeah. what time? It's going on, I guess. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.